Chapter One of the Junior Classics, Volume Eight: Animal and Nature Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Thompson. The Junior Classics, Volume Eight: Animal and Nature Stories, edited by William Patton. Chapter One. Little Cyclone, The Story of a Grizzly Cub by W. T. Hornaday Little Cyclone is a grizzly cub from Alaska who earned his name by the vigor of his resistance to ill treatment. When his mother was fired at on a timbered hillside facing Chilkat River, he and his brother ran away as fast as their stumpy little legs could carry them. When they crept where they had last seen her, they thought her asleep, and cuddling up close against her yet warm body, they slept peacefully until morning. Before the early morning sun had reached their side of the mountains, the two orphans were awakened by the rough grasp of human hands. Valiantly they bit and scratched and bawled aloud with rage. One of them made a fight so fierce and terrible that his nervous captor let him go and that one is still on the Chilkoot. Although the other cub fought just as desperately, his captor seized him by the hind leg, dragged him backwards, occasionally swung him around his head, and kept him generally engaged until ropes were procured for binding him. When finally established with collar, chain, and post in the rear of the saloon in Porcupine City, two-legged animals less intelligent than himself frequently and violently prodded the little grizzly with a long pole to see him fight. Barely in time to save him from insanity, little Cyclone was rescued by the friendly hands of the Zoological Society's field agent, placed in a comfortable box, freed from all annoyance, and shipped to New York. He was at that time as droll and roguish looking a grizzly cub as ever stepped, in a grizzly grey full moon of fluffy hair, Two big black eyes sparkled like jet beads behind a pudgy little nose, absurdly short for a bear. Excepting for his high shoulders, he was little more than a big bale of grey fur set up on four posts of the same material. But his claws were formidable, and he had the true grizzly spirit. The bear's nursery in the New York Zoological Park is a big yard with a shade tree, a tree to climb, a swimming pool, three sleeping dens, and a rock cliff. It never contains fewer than six cubs, and sometimes eight. Naturally, it is a good test of courage and temper to turn a new bear into that roistering crowd. Usually a newcomer is badly scared during his first day in the nursery, and very timid during the next. But grizzlies are different. They are born full of courage and devoid of all sense of fear. When little Cyclone's travelling box was opened and he found himself free in the nursery, he stalked deliberately to the centre of the stage, halted, and calmly looked about him. His air and manner said as plainly as English, I am a grizzly from Alaska, and I've come to stay. If any of you fellows think there is anything coming to you from me, come and take it. Little Sar, a very saucy but good-natured European brown bear cub, walked up, and aimed a sample blow at Cyclone's left ear. Quick as a flash, out shot Cyclone's right paw, as only a grizzly can strike, and caught the would-be hazer on the side of the head. Amazed and confounded, Star fell in wild haste. Next in order, a black bear cub, twice the size of Cyclone, made a pass at the newcomer, and he too received so fierce a countercharge that he ignominiously quitted the field and scrambled to the top of the cliff. Cyclone conscientiously met every attack, real or feigned, that was made upon him. In less than an hour, it was understood by every bear in the nursery that the queer-looking grey fellow, with a broad head and short nose, could strike quick and hard, and that he could fight any other bear on three seconds' notice. From that time on, Cyclone's position has been assured. He is treated with the respect that a good forearm inspires, but being really a fine-spirited, dignified little grizzly, he 
attacks no one and never has had a fight. End of chapter one. Chapter two of the Junior Classics, Volume eight Animal and Nature Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Junior Classics, Volume 8, Animal and Nature Stories, edited by William Patton. Chapter 2, Some True Stories of Tigers, Wolves, Foxes, and Bears, by W. H. G. Kingston. On one of her voyages from China, the pit, East Indiaman had on board, among her passengers, a young tiger. He appeared to be as harmless and playful as a kitten, and allowed the utmost familiarity from everyone. He was especially fond of creeping into the sailor's hammocks, and while he lay stretched on the deck, he would suffer two or three of them to place their heads on his back, as upon a pillow. Now and then, however, he would at dinner-time run off with pieces of their meat, and though sometimes severely punished for the theft, he bore the chastisement he received with the patience of a dog. His chief companion was a terrier, with whom he would play all sorts of tricks, tumbling and rolling over the animal in the most amusing manner without hurting it. He would also frequently run out on the bowsprit and climb about the rigging with the agility of a cat. On his arrival in England he was sent to the menagerie at the tower. While there, another terrier was introduced into his den. Possibly he may have mistaken it for his old friend, for he immediately became attached to the dog and appeared uneasy whenever it was taken away. Now and then the dangerous experiment was tried of allowing the terrier to remain while the tiger was fed. Presuming on their friendship, the dog occasionally ventured to approach him, but the tiger showed his true nature on such occasions by snarling in a way which made the little animal quickly retreat. He had been in England two years when one of the seamen of the pit came to the tower. The animal at once recognized his old friend and appeared so delighted that the sailor begged to be allowed to go into the den. The tiger, on this, rubbed himself against him, licked his hands and fawned on him, as a cat would have done. The sailor remained in the den for a couple of hours or more, during which time the tiger kept so close to him that it was evident he would have some difficulty in getting out again without the animal making his escape at the same time. The den consisted of two compartments. At last the keeper contrived to entice the tiger to the inner one when he closed the slide and the seaman was liberated. Even a wolf, savage as that animal is, may, if caught young and treated kindly, become tame. A story is told of a wolf which showed a considerable amount of affection for its master. He had brought it up from a puppy, and it became as tame as the best-trained dog, obeying him in everything. Having frequently to leave home, and not being able to take the wolf with him, he sent it to a menagerie where he knew it would be carefully looked after. At first the wolf was very unhappy, and evidently pined for its absent master. At length, resigning itself to its fate, it made friends with its keepers, and recovered its spirits. Fully eighteen months had passed by when its old master, returning home, paid a visit to the menagerie. Immediately he spoke, the wolf recognized his voice, and made strenuous efforts to get free. On being set at liberty, it sprang forward and leaped up and caressed him like a dog. Its master, however, left it with its keepers, and three years passed away before he paid another visit to the menagerie. Notwithstanding this lapse of time, the wolf again recognized him and exhibited the same marks of affection. On its master again going away, the wolf became gloomy and desponding, and refused its food, so that fears were entertained for its life. It recovered its health, however, and though it suffered its keepers to approach, exhibited the savage disposition of its tribe towards all strangers. 
The history of this wolf shows you that the fiercest tempers may be calmed by gentleness. Errant thieves, as foxes are, with regard to their domestic virtues, they eminently shine. Both parents take the greatest interest in rearing and educating their offspring. They provide in their burrow a comfortable nest lined with feathers for their newborn cubs. Should either parent perceive in the neighborhood of their abode the slightest sign of human approach, they immediately carry their young to a spot of greater safety, sometimes many miles away. They usually set off in the twilight of a fine evening. The papa fox, having taken a survey all round, marches first, the young ones march singly, and mamma brings up the rear. On reaching a wall or bank, papa always mounts first, and looks carefully around, rearing himself on his haunches to command a wider view. He then utters a short cry, which the young ones, understanding as, come along, instantly obey. All being safely over, Mama follows, pausing in her turn on the top of the fence when she makes a careful survey, especially rearward. She then gives a responsive cry, answering to, All right, and follows the track of the others. Thus the party proceed on their march, repeating the same precautions at each fresh barrier. When peril approaches, the wary old fox instructs his young ones to escape with turns and doublings on their path while he himself will stand still on some brow or knoll where he can both see and be seen. Having thus drawn attention to himself, he will take to flight in a different direction. Occasionally, while the young family are disporting themselves near their home, if peril approach, the parents utter a quick, peculiar cry, commanding the young ones to hurry to earth, knowing that, in case of pursuit, they have neither strength nor speed to secure their escape. They themselves will then take to flight and seek some distant place of security. The instruction they afford their young is varied. Sometimes the parents toss bones into the air for the young foxes to catch. If the little one fails to seize it before it falls to the ground, the parent will snap at him in reproof. If he catches it cleverly, Papa growls his approval and tosses it up again. This sport continues for a considerable time. As I have said, no other animal so carefully educate their young in the way they should go as does the fox. He is a good husband, an excellent father, capable of friendship, and a very intelligent member of society. But all the while it must be confessed, an incorrigible rogue and thief. A gentleman was lying one summer's day under the shelter of some shrubs on the banks of the Tweed, when his attention was attracted by the cries of wildfowl, accompanied by a great deal of fluttering and splashing. On looking around, he perceived a large brood of ducks which had been disturbed by the drifting of a fir branch among them. After circling in the air for a little time, they again settled down on their feeding ground. Two or three minutes elapsed when the same event again occurred. A branch drifted down with the stream into the midst of the ducks and startled them from their repast. Once more they rose upon the wing, clamoring loudly, but when the harmless bow had drifted by, settled themselves down upon the water as before. This occurred so frequently that at last they scarcely troubled themselves to flutter out of the way even when about to be touched by the drifting bow. The gentleman, meantime, marking the regular intervals at which the fir branches succeeded each other in the same track, looked for a cause, and perceived at length, higher up the bank of the stream, a fox, which, having evidently set them adrift, was eagerly watching their progress and the effect they produced. Satisfied with the result, Cunning Renyard at last selected a larger branch of spruce fir than usual, and couching himself down on it, set it adrift as he had done the others. The birds, now well trained to indifference, scarcely moved till he was in the midst of them. When making rapid snaps right and left, he secured two fine young ducks as his prey, and floated forward triumphantly on his raft, 
while the surviving fowls, clamoring in terror, took to flight and returned no more to the spot. A laborer, going to his work one morning, caught sight of a fox stretched out at full length under a bush. Believing it to be dead, the man drew it out by the tail and swung it about to assure himself of the fact. Perceiving no symptoms of life, he then threw it over his shoulder, intending to make a cap of the skin and ornament his cottage wall with a brush. While the fox hung over one shoulder, his mattock balanced it on the other side. The point of the instrument, as he walked along, every now and then struck against the ribs of the fox, which, not so dead as the man supposed, objected to this proceeding, though he did not mind being carried along with his head downward. Losing patience, he gave a sharp snap at that portion of the laborer's body near which his head hung. The man, startled by this sudden attack, threw fox and mattock to the ground. When turning around, he espied the live animal making off at full speed. I have still another story to tell about cunning Runyard. Daylight had just broke when a well-known naturalist, gun in hand, wandering in search of specimens, observed a large fox making his way along the skirts of a plantation. Reynard looked cautiously over the turf wall into the neighboring field, longing evidently to get hold of some of the hares feeding in it, well aware that he had little chance of catching one by dint of running. After examining the different gaps in the wall, he fixed on one which seemed to be the most frequented, and laid himself down close to it, in the attitude of a cat watching a mouse hole. He next scraped a small hollow in the ground to form a kind of screen. Now and then he stopped to listen, or take a cautious peep into the field. This done, he again laid himself down and remained motionless, except when occasionally his eagerness induced him to reconnoiter the feeding hares. One by one, as the sun rose, they made their way from the field to the plantation. Several passed, but he moved not, except to crouch still closer to the ground. At length, two came directly towards him. The involuntary motion of his ears, though he did not venture to look up, showed that he was aware of their approach. Like lightning, as they were leaping through the gap, Renyard was upon them, and catching one killed her immediately. He was decamping with his booty when a rifle ball put an end to his career. I must tell you one more story about a fox, and a very interesting little animal it was, though not less cunning than its relatives in warmer regions. Mr. Hayes, the Arctic explorer, had a beautiful little snow-white fox, which was his companion in his cabin when his vessel was frozen up during the winter. She had been caught in a trap, but soon became tame, and used to sit in his lap during meals with her delicate paws on the cloth. A plate and fork were provided for her, though she was unable to handle the fork herself, and little bits of raw venison which she preferred to seasoned food. When she took the morsels into her mouth, her eyes sparkled with delight. She used to wipe her lips and look up at her master with a coquetry perfectly irresistible. Sometimes she exhibited much impatience but a gentle rebuke with a fork on the tip of the nose was sufficient to restore her patience. When sufficiently tame, she was allowed to run loose in the cabin, but she got into the habit of bounding over the shelves without much regard for the valuable and perishable articles lying on them. She soon also found out the bull's-eye overhead through the cracks around which she could sniff the cool air. Close beneath it she accordingly took up her abode, and thence she used to crawl down when dinner was on the table, getting into her master's lap, and looking up longingly and lovingly into his face, sometimes putting out her little tongue with impatience, and barking if the beginning of the repast was too long delayed. To prevent her climbing she was secured by a slight chain. This she soon managed to break and once having performed the operation, she did not fail to attempt it again. To do this, she would first draw herself back as far as she could get, and then suddenly dart forward in the hope of snapping it by the jerk, and though she was thus sent reeling onto the floor, she would again pick herself up, panting as if her little heart would break, 
shake out her disarranged coat and try once more. When observed, however, she would sit quietly down, cock her head cunningly on one side, follow the chain with her eye along its whole length to its fastening on the floor, walk leisurely to that point, hesitating a moment, and then make another plunge. All this time she would eye her master sharply, and if he moved, she would fall down on the floor at once and pretend to be asleep. She was a very neat and cleanly animal, everlastingly brushing her clothes and bathing regularly in a bath of snow provided for her in the cabin. This last operation was her great delight. She would throw up the white flakes with her diminutive nose, rolling about and burying herself in them, wipe her face with her soft paws, and then mount to the side of the tub, looking round her knowingly and barking the prettiest bark that ever was heard. This was her way of enforcing admiration, and being now satisfied with her performance, she would give a goodly number of shakes to her sparkling coat, then, happy and refreshed, crawl into her airy bed in the bull's-eye and go to sleep. The Indian believes the bear to be possessed not only of a wonderful amount of sagacity, but of feelings akin to those of human beings. Though most species are savage when irritated, some of them occasionally exhibit good humor and kindness. The story is told of a man in Russia who, on an expedition in search of honey, climbed into a high tree. The trunk was hollow, and he discovered a large cone within. He was descending to obtain it when he stuck fast. Unable to extricate himself and too far from home to make his voice heard, he remained in that uncomfortable position for two days, sustaining his life by eating the honey. He had become silent from despair. When looking up, what was his horror to see a huge bear above him, tempted by the same object which had led him into his dangerous predicament, and about to descend into the interior of the tree. Bears, very wisely, when getting into hollows of rocks or trees, go tail-end first, that they may be in a position to move out again when necessary. No sooner, in spite of his dismay, did the tail of the bear reach him than the man caught hold of it. The animal, astonished at finding some big creature below him when he only expected to meet with a family of bees, against whose stings his thick hide was impervious, quickly scrambled out again, dragging up the man, who probably shouted right lustily. Be that as it may, the bear waddled off at a quick rate, and the honey-seeker made his way homeward to relate his adventure and relieve the anxiety of his family. The brown bear, which lives in Siberia, may be considered among the most good-natured of his tribe. Mr. Atkinson, who traveled in that country, tells us that some peasants, a father and mother, had one day lost two of their children between four and six years of age. It was soon evident that their young ones had wandered away to a distance from their home, and as soon as this discovery was made they set off in search of them. Having proceeded some way through the wilds, they caught sight in the distance of a large animal, which, as they got nearer, they discovered to be a brown bear, and what was their horror to see within its clutches their lost young ones. Their sensations of dismay were exchanged for astonishment when they saw the children running about, laughing round the bear, sometimes taking it by the paws and sometimes pulling it by the tail. The monster, evidently amused with their behavior, treated them in the most affectionate manner. One of the children now produced some fruit with which it fed its shaggy playfellow, while the other climbed up on its back and sat there fearlessly urging its strange steed to move on. The parents gave way to cries of terror at seeing the apparent danger to which their offspring were exposed. The little boy, however, Having slipped off the bear's back, the animal, hearing the sound of other voices, left the children and retreated quietly into the forest. End of chapter 2 Recording by Arnold Banner, Thurmond, North Carolina Chapter 3 of the Junior Classics 
Volume 8 Animal and Nature Stories This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Junior Classics, Volume 8 Animal and Nature Stories by William Patton Chapter 3 Some Animal Friends in Africa by Bayard Taylor Years ago I spent a winter in Africa. I had intended to go up the Nile only as far as Nubia, visiting the great temples and tombs of Thebes on the way. But when I had done all this, and passed beyond the cataracts at the southern boundary of Egypt, I found the journey so agreeable, so full of interest, and attended with so much less danger than I had supposed, that I determined to go on for a month or two longer, and penetrate as far as possible into the interior. Everything was favorable to my plan. When I reached Khartoum, the Austrian consul invited me to his house, and there I spent three or four weeks in that strange town, making acquaintance with the Egyptian officers, the chiefs of desert tribes, and the former kings of the different countries of Ethiopia. When I left my boat on arriving, and walked through the narrow streets of Khartoum, between mud walls, very few of which were even whitewashed, I thought it a miserable place, and began to look out for some garden where I might pitch my tent, rather than live in one of those dirty-looking habitations. The wall around the consul's house was of mud like the others, but when I entered I found clean, handsome rooms which furnished delightful shade and coolness during the heat of the day. The roof was of palm logs, covered with mud, which the sun baked into a hard mass, so that the house was, in reality, as good as a brick dwelling. It was a great deal more comfortable than it appeared from the outside. There were other features of the place, however, which would be difficult to find anywhere except in Central Africa. After I had taken possession of my room and eaten breakfast with my host, I went out to look at the garden. On each side of the steps leading down from the door sat two apes, who barked and snapped at me. The next thing I saw was a leopard tied to the trunk of an orange tree. I did not dare to go within the reach of his rope, although I afterward became well acquainted with him. A little farther there was a pen of gazelles and an antelope with immense horns. Then two fierce, bristling hyenas, and at last, under a shed, beside the stable, a full-grown lioness, sleeping in the shade. I was greatly surprised when the consul went up to her, lifted up her head, opened her jaws so as to show the shining white tusks, and finally sat down upon her back. She accepted these familiarities so good-naturedly that I made bold to pat her head also. In a day or two we were great friends. She would spring about with delight whenever she saw me, and would purr like a cat whenever I sat upon her back. I spent an hour or two every day among the animals, and found them all easy to tame except the hyenas, which would gladly have bitten me if I had allowed them a chance. The leopard one day bit me slightly on the hand, but I punished him by pouring several buckets of water over him, and he was always very amiable after that. The beautiful little gazelles would cluster around me, thrusting up their noses into my hand and saying, Wow! Wow! as plainly as I write it. But none of these animals attracted me as much as the big lioness. She was always good-natured, though occasionally so lazy that she would not even open her eyes 
when I sat down on her shoulder. She would sometimes catch my foot in her paws as a kitten catches a ball, and try to make a plaything of it, yet always without thrusting out her claws. Once she opened her mouth and gently took one of my legs in her jaws for a moment, and the very next instant she put out her tongue and licked my hand. There seemed to be almost as much of the dog as of the cat in her nature. We all know, however, that there are differences of character among animals as there are among men, and my favorite probably belonged to a virtuous and respectable family of lions. The day after my arrival I went with the consul to visit the Pasha, who lived in a large mud palace on the bank of the Blue Nile. He received us very pleasantly and invited us to take seats in the shady courtyard. Here there was a huge panther tied to one of the pillars, while a little lion, about eight months old, ran about perfectly loose. The pasha called the latter, which came springing and frisking towards him. Now, said he, we will have some fun. He then made the lion lie down behind one of the pillars, and called to one of the black boys to go across the courtyard on some errand. The lion lay quite still until the boy came opposite to the pillar, when he sprang out after him. The boy ran, terribly frightened, but the lion reached him in five or six leaps, sprang upon his back, and threw him down, and then went back to the pillar as if quite satisfied with his exploit. Although the boy was not hurt in the least, it seemed to me like a cruel piece of fun. The Pasha, nevertheless, laughed very heartily and told us that he had himself trained the lion to frighten the boys. Presently the little lion went away, and when we came to look for him, we found him lying on one of the tables in the kitchen of the palace, apparently very interested in watching the cook. The latter told us that the animal sometimes took small pieces of meat, but seemed to know that it was not permitted, for he would run away afterwards in great haste. What I saw of lions during my residence in Khartoum satisfied me that they are not very difficult to tame. Only, as they belong to the cat family, no dependence can be placed on their continued good behavior. Although I was glad to leave that wild town with its burning climate and retrace the long way back to Egypt, across the desert and down the Nile, I felt very sorry at being obliged to take leave forever of all my pets. The little gazelle said, Wow, wow, in answer to my goodbye. The hyenas howled and tried to bite just as much as ever. But the dear old lioness I know would have been sorry if she could have understood that I was going. She frisked around me, licked my hand, and I took her great tawny head into my arms and gave her a kiss. Since then I have never had a lion for a pet, and may never have one again. I must confess I am sorry for it, for I still retain my love for lions four-footed ones, I mean, to this day. End of chapter 3 Recording by Sharon Kilmer Rio Medina, Texas Chapter 4 of the Junior Classics, Volume 8 Animal and Nature Stories this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tom Merritt. The Junior Classics, Volume 8, Animals and Nature Stories, edited by William Patton. My Fight with a Catamount, by Alan French. My guide Alaric and I had gone in after moose in the country beyond Mud Brook in Maine. There its watershed between the east branch and the west is cut up into valleys. 
in one or another of which a herd of moose in winter generally takes up quarters. It was not yet yarding time, for the snow was only about four inches deep, making it just right for the moose hunter, who is at the same time a sportsman. Our task was a slow one. We had to examine each valley for moose tracks, tramping up one side and down the other, or, as we usually managed it, separating at the valley's mouth, each taking a side, meeting at the end, and then, if successful, taking the quickest way back to camp. And unsuccessful we were, since for three days we found no trail. But Alaric was not in the least discouraged. You can never tell about moose, he said. They travel so. There are moose in this country before the snow, and there are moose within a day's walk of us now. It's just as I told you. We may have to spend five days in finding where they are. It was on the second day that we found that, while after moose, we had been tracked by a catamount. The print of its paw was generously large. I've seen bigger, said Alaric but this feller's big enough. He's just waiting around, I guess, so as to get some of the meat we kill. We'll remember him, he said, looking up at me as he knelt on the snow, so's to see that he doesn't spoil the hide or the head. I accepted the theory and thought little more of the matter for twenty-four hours. At the end of the third day, we found that the catamount had for a second time been following our trail. Not only our trail, but also mine. He had followed me all day as I walked along the hillside, looking ahead on both sides, but seldom behind. Alaric examined his tracks carefully for half a mile. He was in sight of you all the way, he said. See here, where he stood for some time, just shifting about in one place, watching. I saw and thought. After a while, it seemed to me, a catamount might get tired of waiting for us to kill his meat, and would start in to kill it for himself. Unquestionably, the easiest game for him to get would be human, for there were no deer in the region, and the caribou were all herded in Katahdin and Traveler. The previous severe winter had decimated the partridges, and big is the catamount that will tackle a moose. I mentioned the theory to Alaric. Mm, yes, perhaps, he said, and eyed me dubiously. Then I wished that I had not said anything. It is not well to let your guide think that you are afraid. In the morning when we had attained the valley's mouth, Alaric was about to keep with me, instead of leaving me as before. But that made our hunting much slower, for we could cover much less ground. And I sent him around the other way. All right, said he, but keep a good lookout behind you now. He disappeared in a cedar swamp, and I made my way along the slope of the hill. I watched indeed behind as well as in front, and in every fox's track I crossed, I saw a catamount. Until finally, I got used to the situation and believed that the Indian devil had concluded to let me alone. The day was fine. The sun shone bright and the softening snow dropping from the upper branches of the trees kept up a constant movement in the woods. I took and held a good pace and with my eyes searching the snow ahead and on all sides of me for signs of moose, walked for a full hour, seeing nothing living but the woodpeckers and the chickadees, hearing nothing but the rustle of the branches. As released of their loads, they sprung back into place. Then, quite needlessly, I found insecure footing under the snow and plunged suddenly at full length. My rifle whirled from my hand with force, and I heard it strike against the uncovered top of a sugar-loaf stone. I jumped up in fear and hastily examined it. The breach was shattered. 
my rifle was as useless as any stick. Now I thought of the catamount, as with a broken rifle in my hands I looked about me in the woods, bright with sun and snow. I was not entirely helpless, for my revolver and knife were in my belt. Yet a thirty-eight caliber revolver, even with a long cartridge and a long barrel, is not a sure defense against an animal as heavy as myself, which in facing me would present for a mark only a round head and a chest with muscles so thick and knotty that they would probably stop my revolver bullet. I doubted my ability to hit the eye. Very likely I was no longer followed. And in any case, I might call Alaric and yet he was too far away for a shout to reach him. And I dared not fire signal shots, for in order to travel light, I had left at camp all revolver cartridges but those in the chambers. So I started at once for the bottom of the valley, hoping to strike Alaric's trail on the opposite slope, and intending to follow it until I caught him. My rifle I left where it was. It was useless and heavy. I cast many a glance behind me as almost at a trot I made my way down the long hillside. I strode on rapidly, for I had certainly a mile to cover before I could strike Alaric's trail, much more before I could catch my nimble guide. I was cheerful and unalarmed until, pausing to look behind, I saw a hundred yards away a tawny animal quickly slip behind a tree. I hastily drew my revolver and knife, but no movement came from its hidden breast, and rather than stand and wait, I pursued my retreat. I moved more slowly, yet as fast as I could, and still guard myself against another fall and watch for a rush from behind. I scanned the ground in front of me and glanced back every second. For some time I saw no more of the catamount, but when I did see him, I was startled at his nearness. He was within fifty yards. I hurried on as he slipped aside again, but looking again in a moment I saw him now following boldly upon my trail. I stopped, but he stopped too, and stood regarding me. He was too far away for me to fire yet, and as he made no movement to approach I cautiously continued my retreat, always after a few steps stopping to face him. He stopped as I stopped. Yet each time I turned away, he came closer. I was already thinking of awaiting him without further movement, when the way was blocked by a ravine. It was cut by the stream that drained the valley, and its steep sides were nearly fifteen feet in height. They even overhung in places, but this I did not then know. I was in no mind to trust myself in the deep gully where the catamount might drop upon me before I could scramble out upon the other side. I walked into an open space and took my stand close to a birch that grew on the very edge of the bank. For thirty feet there was no good cover for the catamount, so armed and determined I waited his action. The animal skirted the bushes about me, as if examining the ground, and to my disappointment began to come upon me along the edge of the ravine. This gave him the best cover before his charge, and at the same time assured him that the momentum of his rush would not carry him tumbling into the gully. Always keeping too well concealed for a good mark, he crept up behind a fallen tree on the near side of which a little bush grew, and flattened himself there, watching me, I felt sure, and waiting in the hope that he might catch me off guard. I cannot describe how stealthy and noiseless and altogether perfect his maneuvering was, although the trees that grew about were all small and the bushes bare, and although the white snow gave no background for concealment, he covered himself so perfectly at one time, and slipped in and out of sight so quickly at another, 
that although I stood with revolver pointed and cocked, I could find no opportunity for a shot. As he circled for position, he came ever nearer, and I could see at one time the round head with its short, pointed ears. At another, the long, sinuous, muscular body. But they moved so rapidly that before I could shoot, they were gone from sight. All the time, he made no sound, but a little rustle. In his final concealment, I saw nothing of him but his tail that twitched and twitched and twitched. At last I caught the glint of his pale green eye and fired. There came a snarl from behind the bush, and it was dashed to one side and the other, while round head and bared teeth and tawny body came crashing through. I pulled trigger again, and the report sounded muffled, and the smoke for an instant obscured the beast. All was white, when like a breath it passed, and I saw the rushing catamount not ten feet from me. I had not time to fire or crouch, but with ready legs hurled myself to one side and threw my left arm around the tree that grew at the edge of the bank. With an awful dread, I felt the ground giving way beneath me. I dropped my knife and caught the tree closer when it too leaned to fall. It hung for a moment over the steep slope, and I could not save myself. The frost had not clamped the overhang to the solid ground. The last fall rains had cut it under. The first spring thaw would have brought it down, had not my weight been thrown upon it. With a twist, the tree and I fell together. I clutched my revolver desperately, despite the sickening fear of the fall, and in my grasp it exploded mid-air. Then I fell, and although my body struck easily in the snow-covered ravine, my right hand had been beaten against a sharp rock, and the birch was upon me so that I could not move. My legs were on the bank, and underneath the snow beneath my shoulders I soon felt the ice, from which stones protruded. One snow-covered rock received and supported my head. I lay upon my right side, and my right hand, swinging in a curve, had struck with force upon another stone, and lay upon the ice the only part of my body, except my head, which was free. My left arm was pressed close to my side by the birch, which lay across my body and legs. The weight was not so great, but that I could have lifted it, could I but have gained purchase. But I must at the same time lift my own body, for my hips were lower than my feet, my shoulders lower than my hips, and I could not gather ten pounds of force in that position. My fall confused me somewhat, and I could not at first feel anything, either the pain in my hand or the danger I was in. I noticed only the fine powdery snow, which, cast up by the fall, settled upon me as I lay. Then I saw my arm stretched out in front of me, with a bloody hand at the end of it, and I came fully to myself. A pain shot from my fingertip to shoulder as I closed my hand tighter upon the butt of the revolver. But I clenched my teeth and tried to rise, tried twice more before I gave it up as hopeless. Then I raised my hand and put it in a better position, propped upon a stone. The movements hurt me terribly, but I thought of the catamount, which would surely not be satisfied with two bullets for its breakfast. I was scarcely ready when the head of the beast was thrust over the edge of the bank to look for me. He saw and gloated, as a human enemy might have done. His savage snarl was full of intelligence, and his slow approach was deliberate torture. He stood for a moment in full view, then slipped and slid down to the surface of the ice, where ten yards away he stood and looked at me. I saw his magnificent build, his superb muscular development, as with his body in profile, his head turned toward me, he waited before approaching, playing with my helplessness. But I was not entirely helpless. With shaking hand, I took aim. I could not use my thumb to cock the revolver, but drew hard at the trigger, and the hammer rose and fell. My turn for gloating had come now, for the catamount was crying with rage and pain, 
he fell writhing, striking with his forepaws at the snow, and raising his head to snap at nothing. But this did not last long. Slowly he dragged himself to a sitting posture, and I could understand his plight and estimate my own danger. My first two bullets had but torn his flesh. My last had broken his back. He was paralyzed in his hind legs, as I have seen a deer. Yet he had many minutes to live, perhaps hours, and was strong and angry enough to finish me. Painfully, he started on that short journey to me, with his forepaws, his claws digging the snow. He began to drag himself toward me. I could only wait. I had but one more shot, and wished to hold it till he should be close. But my torn hand was weak, and the bruised tendons had already begun to stiffen. Into that deep space where bank and trees overhung, the sun did not come, and I felt the cold striking into my raw flesh. More than that, my weight upon my shoulder began to cut off the blood from my arm. I felt pricking in my flesh. My arm began to be numb, and I feared that I might not be able to shoot. If he could but hurry, he dragged himself at a snail's pace. It would be so long before he came close that my hand would be useless. Yet as he crawled directly at me, the mark was a poor one. I saw with satisfaction that he would have to turn aside for one of the rocks in his path. When at last he reached it and began to drag himself around it, he gave me my last chance. I saw the space behind his shoulder, prayed that my bullet might miss his ribs, summoned the last force of my almost dead hand, and fired. A little drift of air blew the smoke aside so quickly that I could see the fur fly. He bit savagely at his side, but he crawled on without stopping. From my numb hand the revolver fell without noise in the snow. My fight was finished. He came on. He was only fifteen feet away from me. When he stopped and coughed, would he sink, unable to move farther? No, he started again. Although his legs dragged behind him, impeding, although he left a red trail on the snow, and each step forced a snarl from him, he came on. With glittering eyes and hoarse breath, he forced himself to cross the last space. Minutes passed before he was close enough to touch me. Ah, oh, even as he turned toward my hand to seize it, even as I waited to see, rather than feel, the crunching of my senseless arm, his head drooped. He raised it once more, but his power was gone. He laid his head, once so powerful, upon my hand, rested his body against the stone that stood high enough to support him, and glared at me with his fierce, malignant eyes. Then the fire changed in his eyes, clouded, flickered, glowed, went out. The last breath was expelled with a wheeze. He was dead. Then my own powers sank, and I thought that I was dying too. Somewhere in the midst of my faintness I had a sense as if I felt rather than heard, hasty, heavy footsteps on the bank above me. As soon as I knew anything clearly, I knew that the tree had been pulled away and that Alaric was bending over me. He had with ears alert for any sound and with footsteps kept as near to me as they might be, with obedience to my order, came rushing to my aid at the sound of my first revolver shot but the distance was so great that he did not arrive until my fight was over. End of chapter 4 Chapter 5 of the Junior Classics Volume 8 Animal and Nature Stories This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Junior Classics, Volume 8, Animal and Nature Stories, edited by William Patton. In Canada with a Lynx, by Roel Hendrick. 
This adventure came about through an invitation which Ray Churchill received from his friend Jacques Pourbière of Two Rivers, New Brunswick. Ray had half promised to visit his New Brunswick acquaintance during the deer hunting season, and late in August was reminded of the fact. A second letter came in September, the carefully worded school English of the writer not being able to conceal the warmth and urgency of the invitation. So Ray telegraphed his acceptance and four days later arrived at Fredericton, where he secured a hunting license. The next morning he reached Two Rivers, and Jacques met him with a span of ponies attached to a queer spring vehicle, mounted on wheels, that seemed out of all proportion to the body of the carriage. Ray wondered if it was a relic of Acadia, but did not like to ask. They drove for a dozen miles through a wooded and hilly country, and arrived at their destination shortly before nightfall. Jacques was quite alone at the time, as his parents had gone to visit their older children along the St. John River. He promised Ray at least one deer within a couple of days, and another within a week. The poor Bière home resembled those of the better class of habitants, but with a difference due to the greater prosperity of the family in preceding generations. The main room had a huge fireplace, used only occasionally, for there was an airtight stove connected with the chimney just above it to afford greater warmth in winter. The other rooms were chiefly detached, although there was an entry-like porch on the south front of the living room and a huge door opening at the east end, both connecting with the yard outside. But the woodshed, milk house, and summer kitchen were in the rear, each being a rectangular building of heavy logs with low lofts above. The homestead was, in fact, a cluster of houses rather than a single dwelling. What most attracted Ray's attention were the huge bedsteads in the living room. They were tall four-posters, such as he had seen elsewhere, but with the difference that a canopy covered them. Each had a carved wooden frame surmounting the top of the post like a roof. The wood was black with age, its surface being covered with elaborate foliage and armorial devices representing the toil of some old French artisan of the 17th century. They probably had been brought across the Atlantic by the original emigrant and carefully preserved ever since. They stood in diagonally opposite corners of the room, and upheld the hugest of feather beds, with gay, homemade worsted coverlets and valences that shamed the hues of the rainbow. They certainly tempted to rest in that climate and at that season, but would have seemed suffocating in a warmer region. That evening Ray said, See here, Jacques, you have double windows, with no way of opening them that I can find, and your fireplace is closed to make a better draft for the stove I'm used to fresh air at night. If I leave the end door ajar, you won't be afraid of burglars, will you? The Canadian shrugged his shoulders at this exhibition of his guest's eccentricity, but his hospitality was more than equal to the strain. No, no, he replied. Nobody rob. We never lock doors to you. And his white teeth flashed. Ray laughed softly as he thrust a billet of wood between the door and its frame. But why do you say brrrr under your breath? he asked. Cold before morning, they are cold. I know, but we'll be snug in bed and you won't feel it. You Canadians wouldn't have so much consumption if you breathed purer air when you slept. We oui, was the polite reply, and nothing more was said. Long before dawn, Ray sprang from bed, closed the door, and stirred up the fire. The moon, although low in the west, was still brilliant when they made their way to where a stream trickled down to Cedar Lake, and within a half hour got their first deer, a fine three-year-old buck. They secured some smaller game during the morning, and in the afternoon took the deer home and skinned and dressed it. Most of the carcass was hung in the milk room, but Jacques carried a hind quarter in and suspended it beside the closed fireplace, later cutting off steaks for supper and breakfast. They passed a merry evening, each telling stories of his experiences. 
which were so different in quality that they possessed all the charm of novelty to the respective listeners. Again Ray set the door ajar after they had undressed, and in a few moments both were asleep. Several hours passed. Had either young man been awake, he might have heard soft footfalls about the door. A squatty, heavily built animal with huge feet, bobbed tail, and pointed ears, adorned with tufts of hair, had traced the slaughtered deer to the farmhouse by means of drops of blood, and now was searching eagerly for the meat. He sought the milk room again and again, and even sprang to the window ledge, but could not get inside. Then he came back and sniffed at the partly open door of the living room. The human smell was there, and he hesitated, but so too was the odor of fresh venison, and his mouth watered. A round head was thrust inside the door. The moon, peering above the hemlocks to the southeastward, cast its rays through a window directly upon the fresh meat. The temptation was greater than the intruder was able to withstand. Inch by inch he crowded past the swaying door and silently crept toward the venison. The two men were breathing very loudly, but neither stirred and at last he gathered supreme courage and leaped upon the meat. It fell with a crash against the stove, and the two were awakened simultaneously. As Jacques sprang from the bed, the animal backed, dragging the quarter of venison toward the door. He collided with it, knocking the billet of wood outside, and the latch fell into place with a clash. Finding himself a prisoner, the creature advanced, spitting and growling, straight at Jacques, who, crying, Lou Sevier, Lou Sevier, retreated to the bed. But the pursuit did not end there. Seeing that the beast was about to leap upon the bed, the Canadian hastily climbed one of the posts, not a second too soon, and ensconced himself on the edge of the canopy top with his back pressed against the timbers of the loft floor above. Ray had been too much amazed to interfere at first, but now the time seemed ripe to reopen the door and drive the lynx out. He made a rush, but the angry creature turned and dashed at his leg so viciously that in a couple of seconds he, too, found himself perched precariously on the canopy of his own bed, with prick ears spitting and snarling on the coverlet. "'Can that beast climb up here like a cat?' he asked, with no little anxiety in his tones. "'Oui,' was the reply. "'He can, but Lou Sevier don't climb much.' In a few moments the lynx went back to the venison and began eating it voraciously, only stopping to snarl when the young man spoke or moved. The fire was very low. The room had been well aired, and the two were thinly clad. Before long, their teeth were chattering. If I can get him away from door, I'll run and get gun and fix him, Jacques said, with marked ill will underlying his quaint English. He clambered about the creaking canopy frame, which threatened to collapse at any moment, till he reached the side wall. Along this were suspended loops of onions. A big one hurtled through the air and hit the intruder in the side. He whirled about and dashed for the bed. Babette, the family cat, had been concealed beneath this bed during the preceding scrimmage. She now thrust out her head just in time to be seen by the lynx, and the liveliest sort of chase about the room ensued. When hard-pressed, she somehow reached a shelf close behind Ray climbed recklessly over him, her claws stabbing him in a dozen places, and hid behind him. The lynx was thoroughly aroused, and although clumsier and heavier, set out sturdily to follow. Ray's hand fell on the shelf and clutched a flat iron, of which there were a half dozen in a row. Leaning forward, he struck the oncomer a hard blow over the head. Prick ears fell to the floor and rolled, writhing, struggling, and half stunned under the bed. Now, Jacques, now, Ray yelled. His host jumped and was outside the door in an instant. Ray grasped another flat iron and waited. 
The sound of struggling beneath the bed was unabated. In five minutes he heard a plaintive voice calling outside. Where do you put them guns? In the milk room. Oui, but where? I'm freezing. I, I don't remember. Jacques, saying many things in a patois he had never learned in the provincial school, went back to the milk room. The lynx ventured to show his head, and a flat iron dented the floor close beside it. Then the animal circled the room, dodged another missile, and hid in a dark corner. Ray could hear Jacques tossing things about in the obscurity of the milk room, but plainly finding no guns and as plainly getting colder every minute. Something must be done at once. He clutched a flat iron in each hand, screwed his courage to the sticking point, and dropped to the floor. As he flung the door wide open, he heard the rasping of the lynx claws on the boards behind him. He dashed outside, threw both flat irons wildly at his pursuer, and jumped as far as he could to one side. The lynx kept straight on, headed for the woods, a few rods away. Jacques had found his gun at last. He took a flying shot in the moonlight, hitting a tree at least a rod at the lynx's right. Then the two went inside, enlivened the fire, and dressed as hastily as possible. Consumption is bad, very bad for Canadians, said Jacques, a half hour later, picking his words with care. Ray grinned, but made no reply. Night air is good, but uh, I don't like these these big microbes it bring in. End of chapter five. Chapter six of the Junior Classics, Volume Eight, Animal and Nature Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Junior Classics, Volume 8, Animal and Nature Stories, edited by William Patton. Solomon's Grouch, The Story of a Bear, by Franklin W. Calkins. A pet grizzly bear had been, for a number of years, a feature at Hartranth's. As a puny infant, barely able to crawl, Solomon, as he was solemnly dubbed, was brought in off the Teton Mountains, and as milk was scarcer than money at the horse ranch, he was aristocratically fed on malted milk. On this expensive diet the cub throve amazingly. Good feeding was continued after his weaning from the rubber nipple, and at the end of three years Solomon had grown to be a fat, woolly monster. He was kept chained to a post in the warm season, and had an enclosed stall in a big barn for his winter quarters. Ordinarily he was good-natured, but he was a rough and not altogether safe playfellow. The nearby bawling of cattle always aroused in him ebullitions of rage. Solomon's got an awful grouch again any noise bigger than what he can make himself, was the saying of the ranch hands. When Joe Hartranst's sister, Mrs. Murray, and her two boys, Ruth and Perry, came to the ranch to spend the month of June, Solomon was promptly hustled into his stall in the barn. It was thought best to have no boys fooling round the grizzly. This would undoubtedly have been the safest disposition, but for an oversight of the stable boss. A big percheron had been kept loose in a closed stall adjoining Solomon's, and one day when the bear's voice was raised in remonstrance against his shrill neighing, he had turned his heels loose against the partition which separated them. His fierce battery had loosened two boards four or five feet above the floor, and the cracks he made had gone unnoted, or at least the mending had been neglected. A few days after the visitors came, a fine short-horned cow with a new calf was turned into the barn for the day. Men and workhorses were at work at the alfalfa cutting, 
and the bear and cow and calf were sole occupants of the barn when Ruth and Perry mounted an outside ladder and entered its loft. This loft, with its grain bins, its huge empty space, its cross beams and braces, offered an attractive gymnasium. In one of the bins used chiefly for storage, they discovered a lot of fishing tackle, seines, and spears of various sorts for taking the salmon which annually ran up the Snake River and its tributaries. They had ventured to drag out one of the seines and unroll it on the floor of the loft when the cow below them broke into distressful bawling, peering down a square aperture through which hay was lifted by machine forks in the season of storing, they saw that the calf had got in between the wheels of two buggies which were housed on one side of the driveway. The feeble creature was stuck fast enough, and the helpless dam could only bellow her distress. The boys, in spite of some fear of the cow, would have gone down to extricate the calf, but at this instant Solomon roused in his lair and took a hand in the demonstration. His uproar became frightful as the cow, more than ever alarmed for her calf, continued to bawl. There was a trap door raised for ventilation over Solomon's stall, and the boys ran eagerly to have a look at the grizzly. They were highly entertained for a moment. Hair on end, teeth gnashing, Solomon charged back and forth in his enclosure. Then he reared up on his hind legs and clawed at the pine planks which shut him in. He had not long continued this performance when his claws caught in the crack of a loosened board. There was a ripping creak and a crash, and down came the board. Another followed, and Solomon, ceasing his violent threats for the instant, peered through a wide gap into another domain. His hesitation was brief. He scrambled through, walked out of the open door of the horse stall into an alley, and sought wider range. At first the boys were a little frightened, but they concluded that Solomon would not be able to climb into the loft, and that it was safer for them to stay above than to go down the ladder, for the grizzly might easily push aside one of the half-dozen sliding doors and get out of the barn. The barn was at a considerable distance from the house, so they determined not to alarm the women unless Solomon should get outside and so make it necessary. They sat for a time listening to the monotonous bawling of the cow. Solomon seemed to have lost interest in her noise, as they heard him now and then rummaging among the empty stalls. They had begun to hope that the bear would not find its way out of the stalls when they heard him scrabbling heavily. Then came a resounding thump as he dropped from one of the open mangers to the floor of the barn. Almost instantly a terrific bawling and uproar broke out below. Solomon had reached the cow at last. The boys ran to the edge of the hayloft and peered down. The cow was directly underneath, had backed up against the buggies, and stood tossing her head and bawling like a crazy thing. Dropping their eyes below the level of the loft floor, the lads saw Solomon coming round a pile of new alfalfa, which had been unloaded in front of the central stalls. His rage was terrific, although he advanced slowly to the attack. He came under the wide opening and swayed back and forth before the cow like a tiger in its cage, roaring his threats and watching for an opening to get by the lowered horns. He was a creature of instinct and with a veteran's precaution before a wicked pair of horns. Nevertheless, the cow in a lightning charge caught him broadside on and bore him in a swift rush into the midst of the heap of clover. But for that soft padding for his ribs, it would have gone hard with Solomon. He was doubled up and thrust into the soft mass, fighting wildly. Bear and cow were buried in a storm of clover and flying hay. They twisted about. Then the bear got his back braced against the stall and his hind feet against the cow, and he bowled her into the middle of the barn. 
With a huge grunt, she alighted on her side and rolled clean over. As she scrambled to her feet, full of pluck and snorting fiercely, Solomon issued from the midst of the alfalfa heap, and again the two faced each other, filling the barn with loud-mouthed threats. It was a splendid and exciting battle, but Rufe and Perry, certain that the bear would kill the cow unless prevented, felt that they must do something. They had heard their Uncle Joe say that, since Solomon was getting crosser, he would give him away if anybody could be found to come and get him. Since nobody else was within reach, they cast about for some means of distracting Solomon from his fell purpose. Better kill the bear, if possible, than let him destroy a valuable farm animal. Suddenly, as the bear came directly beneath, Perry bethought him of the fishing spears. In a twinkling he had one in hand and was standing over the wide aperture. That's it, that's it, shouted Roof. Stab him, stick it clear into him. That'll keep him busy for a while. Solomon was again weaving back and forth before the threatening horns, and as he came within easy reach, Perry gave him a fierce thrust between the shoulders. As the tines pierced his muscles, the bear reared to his hind legs with a whining roar of pain. Perry, still clinging to the handle of the spear, was suddenly thrown off his perch and tumbled head foremost upon the grizzly. Thus the peril of breaking bones and falling was avoided by the peril of rolling on the barn floor in the clutches of a mad grizzly. The bear had twisted his neck to seize the spear handle, and when Perry hit him was bowled over on his side. The spear handle snapped in his teeth, and as he wrenched frantically at the fragment, its tines were twisted, cutting deeper into his flesh. This wound, the first he had ever received, set Solomon crazy. He paid not the slightest heed to boy or cow, but rolled and threshed, biting at the fragment of spear handle, giving vent to his rage and pain in a hoarse, distressful roar. Perry might easily have scrambled to his feet and escaped, but he also was flung at full length on the floor, and instantly Solomon, in distress, rolled over him, crushing the breath from his lungs. The terrified Roof, looking down upon his brother's blackened face and the bear's wicked claws waving above it, leaped to his feet and started to run to the barn loft door to scream for help. At less than half the distance his feet caught in the meshes of the unrolled net, and he measured his length on the floor. As he quickly untangled the foot, the thought flashed into his mind. Throw this net upon the bear's legs. In a flash he was at the edge of the open floor and hauling the big seine in coils at his feet. When he had a heap to the height of his knees, he gathered it in his arms and dropped the coils upon Solomon's waving legs. The bear's claws took instant hold of the stout meshes, and Bruin, feeling his feet entangled, wrenched at their fastenings, rolling himself over on his side and off the body of the prostrate boy. Perry, well-nigh smothered, had barely strength enough to crawl out of reach of the whirlwind fight which now took place. Even the cow was awed to silence by the uproar of Solomon's rage, as he fought with the entangling folds of the salmon net. The seine needed no attendance. It did its own work once the grizzly's legs had been thrust through its meshes. Coil after coil, the hundred and fifty feet of seine came down out of the loft as the bear rolled and pitched and tumbled. The more he tore and threshed, the more meshes there were to enwrap and entangle him. In five minutes from the time its first meshes dropped upon him, the net had Solomon so wound and bound that his legs were immovable, and he could barely wriggle his neck. Perry soon recovered his breath, and before they ran to the field to tell of Solomon's plight, the two boys had the presence of mind to pen the cow up, where she could not, should she take a notion, gore the helpless grizzly. Amid both laughter and commiseration, blended with comments on the pluck of the two youngsters, the ranchman performed a surgical operation on the helpless Solomon extracting the spear from his flesh. 
with much greater difficulty they freed him from the seine and got him back into his lair end of chapter 6 recording by arnold banner thurmond north carolina chapter 7 of the junior classics volume 8 animal and nature stories this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Junior Classics, Volume 8, Animal and Nature Stories, edited by William Patton. Chapter 7, A Droll Fox Trap, by C. A. Stevens. When I was a boy, I lived in one of those rustic neighborhoods on the outskirts of the great Maine woods. Foxes were plenty, for all about those sunny pioneer clearings, birch partridges breed by thousands, as also field mice and squirrels, making plenty of game for Renyard. There were red foxes, cross grays, and silver grays, even black foxes were reported, these animals were the pests of the farmyards and made havoc with the geese, cats, turkeys, and chickens. In the fall of the year, particularly after the frosts, the clearings were overrun by them night and morning. Their sharp, cur-like barks used often to rouse us, and of a dark evening we would hear them out in the fields, mousing around the stone heaps, making a queer squeaking sound like a mouse to call the real mice out of their grass nests inside the stone heaps. This, indeed, is a favorite trick of Renyard. At the time of my story, my friend Tom Edwards, ten years of age, and myself were in the turkey business, equal partners. We owned a flock of thirty-one turkeys. These roosted by night in a large butternut tree in front of Tom's house, in the very top of it and by day they wandered about the edges of the clearings in quest of beech nuts, which were very plentiful that fall. All went well till the last week in October, when on taking the census one morning a turkey was found to be missing. The thirty-one had become thirty since nightfall the previous evening. It was the first one we had lost. We proceeded to look for traces. Our suspicions were divided. Tom thought it was the Twombly boys, nefarious Sam in particular. I thought it might have been an owl. But under the tree, in the soft dirt where the potatoes had recently been dug, we found fox tracks and two or three ominous little wads of feathers, with one long tail feather adrift. Thereupon we concluded that the turkey had accidentally fallen down out of the butternut, had a fit perhaps, and that its flutterings had attracted the attention of some passing fox, which had forthwith taken it in charge. It was, as we regarded it, one of those unfortunate occurrences which no care on our part could have well foreseen, and a casualty such as turkey raisers are unavoidably heirs to, and we bore our loss with resignation. We were glad to remember that turkeys did not often fall off their roosts, this theory received something of a check when our flock counted only twenty-nine the next morning. There were more fox tracks and a great many more feathers under the tree. This put a new and altogether ugly aspect on the matter. No algebra was needed to figure the outcome of the turkey business at this rate, together with our prospective profits in the light of this new fact. It was clear that something must be done and at once, too, or ruin would swallow up the poultry firm. Rightly or wrongly, we attributed the mischief to a certain silver gray that had several times been seen in the neighborhood that autumn. It would take far too much space to relate in detail the plans we laid and put in execution to catch that fox during the next two weeks. I recollect that we set three traps for him to no purpose, and that we borrowed a foxhound to hunt him with, but merely succeeded in running him to the burrow in a neighboring rocky hillside, whence we found it quite impossible to dislodge the wily fellow. 
Meanwhile, the fox, or foxes, had succeeded in getting two more of the turkeys. Heroes, it is said, are born of great crises. This dilemma of ours developed Tom's genius. I'll have that fox, he said, when the traps failed, and when the hound proved to be of no avail, he still said, I'll have him yet. But how? I asked. Tom said he would show me. He brought a two-bushel basket and went out into the fields. In the stone heaps and beside the old logs and stumps there were dozens of deserted mouse nests, each a wad of fine dry grass as large as a quart box. These were gathered up and filled the great basket. There, said he triumphantly, don't them smell mousy? They did, certainly. They savored as strongly of mice as Tom's question of bad grammar. And don't foxes catch mice? demanded Tom confidently. Yes, but I don't see how that's going to catch a fox, I said. Well, look here then, I'll show ye, said he. Play use the fox, and play twas night, and you was prowling around the fields. Go off now, out there by that stump. Full of wonder and curiosity, I retired to the stump. Tom, meanwhile, turned out the mass of nests, and with it completely covered himself. The pile now resembled an enormous mouse nest, or rather a small haycock. Pretty soon I heard a low, high-keyed, squeaking noise, accompanied by a slight rustle inside the nest. Evidently there were mice in it, and feeling my character as fox at stake, I at once trotted forward, then crept up, and as the rustling and squeaking continued, made a pounce into the grass, as I had heard it said that foxes did when mousing. Instantly two spry brown hands from out the nest clutched me with a most vengeful grip. As a fox I struggled tremendously, but Tom overcame me forthwith and choked me nearly black in the face, then in dumb show knocked my head with a stone. Do you see now? he demanded. I saw. But a fox would bite you, I objected. Let him bite, said Tom. I'll risk him when once I get these two bread hooks on him. And he can't smell me through the mouse nests either. That night we set ourselves to put the stratagem in operation. With the dusk we stole out into the field where the stone heaps were, and where we had oftenest heard foxes bark. Selecting a nook in the edge of a clump of raspberry briars, which grew about a great pine stump, Tom lay down, and I covered him up completely with the contents of the big basket. He then practiced squeaking and rustling several times to be sure that all was in good trim. His squeaks were perfect successes, made by sucking the air sharply between his teeth. Now be off, said Tom and don't come poking around, nor get in sight till you hear me holler. Thus exhorted, I went into the barn and established myself at a crack on the backside, which looked out upon the field where Tom was ambushed. Tom, meanwhile, as he afterward told me, waited till it had grown dark, then began squeaking and rustling at intervals to draw the attention of the fox when first he should come out into the clearing for foxes have ears so wonderfully acute that they are able to hear a mouse squeak twenty rods away, it is said. An hour passed. Tom must have grown pretty tired of squeaking. It was a moonless evening, though not very dark. I could see objects at a little distance through the crack, but could not see so far as the stump. It got rather dull watching there, and being amidst nice cozy straw, I presently went to sleep, quite unintentionally. I must have slept some time, though it seemed to me but a very few minutes. What woke me was a noise, a sharp, suppressed yelp. It took me a moment to understand where I was and why I was there. A sound of scuffling and tumbling on the ground at some distance assisted my wandering wits, and I rushed out of the barn and ran toward the field. As I ran, two or three dull whacks came to my ear. "'Got him, Tom?' I shouted, rushing up. Tom was holding and squeezing one of his hands with the other, and shaking it violently. 
He said not a word, but left me to poke about and stumble on the limp, warm carcass of a large fox that lay near. Bite ye? I exclaimed, after satisfying myself that the fox was dead. Some, said Tom, and that was all I could get from him that night. We took the fox to the house and lighted a candle. It was the silver gray. Tom washed his bite in cold water and went to bed. Next morning he was in a sorry and very sore plight. His left hand was bitten through the palm and badly swollen. There was also a deep bite in the fleshy part of his right arm, just below the elbow, several minor nips in his left leg above the knee, and a ragged grab in his chin. These numerous bites, however, were followed by no serious ill effects. The next day Tom told me that the fox had suddenly plunged into the grass, that he had caught hold of one of its hind legs, and that they had rolled over and over in the grass together. He owned to me that when the fox bit him on the chin he let go of the brute and would have given up the fight, but that the fox had then actually attacked him. Upon that, said Tom, I just determined to have it out with him. Considering the fact that a fox is a very active, sharp-biting animal, and that this was an unusually large male, I have always thought Tom got off very well. I do not think that he ever cared to make a fox trap of himself again, however. We sold the fox skin in the village and received thirteen dollars for it, whereas a common red fox skin is worth no more than three dollars. How or by what wiles that fox got the turkeys out of the high butternut is a secret, one that perished with him. It would seem that he must either have climbed the tree or else have practiced sorcery to make the turkey come down. End of chapter 7 Recording by Arnold Banner, Thurmond, North Carolina Chapter 8 of the Junior Classics, Volume 8, Animal and Nature Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Junior Classics, Volume 8, Animal and Nature Stories, by William Patton. Chapter 8, The Horse That Aroused the Town by Lillian M. Gask. A wise and just monarch was the good King John. His kingdom extended over central Italy and included the famous town of Atri, which in days gone by had been a famous harbor on the shores of the Adriatic. Now the sea had retreated from it, and it lay inland. No longer the crested waves rolled on its borders, or tossed their showers of silvery spray to meet the vivid turquoise of the sky. The great desire of good King John was that every man, woman, and child in his dominions should be able to obtain justice without delay, be they rich or poor. To this end, since he could not possibly listen to all himself, he hung a bell in one of the city's towers, and issued a proclamation to say that when this was rung a magistrate would immediately proceed to the public square and administer justice in his name. The plan worked admirably. Both rich and poor were satisfied, and since they knew that evildoers would be quickly punished and wrongs set right, men hesitated to defraud or oppress their neighbors, and the great bell pealed less often as years went on. In the course of time, however, the bell rope wore thin, and some ingenious citizen fastened a wisp of hay to it that this might serve as a handle. One day in the height of summer, when the deserted square was blazing with sunlight and most of the citizens were taking their noonday rest, their siesta was disturbed by the violent pealing of the bell. Surely some great injustice has been done, they cried, shaking off their languor and hastening to the square. To their amazement, they found it empty of all human beings save themselves. No angry supplicant appealed for justice, but a poor old horse, lame and half-blind, with bones 
that nearly broke through his skin was trying with pathetic eagerness to eat the wisp of hay. In struggling to do this, he had rung the bell, and the judge summoned so hastily for such a slight cause was stirred to indignation. To whom does this wretched horse belong? he shouted wrathfully. What business has it here? Sir, he belongs to a rich nobleman who lives in that splendid palace, whose tall towers glisten white above the palm grove, said an old man, coming forward with a deep bow. Time was that he bore his master to battle, carrying him dauntlessly amid shot and shell, and more than once saving his life by his courage and fleetness. When the horse became old and feeble, he was turned adrift, since his master had no further use for him, and now the poor creature picks up what food he can in highways and byways. On hearing this, the judge's face grew dark with anger. Bring his master before me, he thundered, and when the amazed nobleman appeared, he questioned him more sternly than he would have done the meanest peasant. Is it true, he demanded, that you left this, your faithful servant, to starve, since he could no longer serve you? It is long since I heard of such gross injustice. Are you not ashamed? The nobleman hung his head in silence. He had no word to say in his own defense, as with scathing contempt the judge rebuked him, adding that in the future he would neglect the horse at his peril. For the rest of his life, he said, you shall care for the poor beast as he deserves, so that after his long term of faithful service he may end his days in peace. The decision was greeted with loud applause by the town folk who gathered in the square. Our bell is superior to all others, they said to each other, with nods and smiles, for it is the means of gaining justice, not only for men, but for animals, too, in their time of need and with shouts of triumph they led the old war-horse back to his stable, knowing that for the future its miserly owner would not dare to begrudge it the comfort to which it was so justly entitled. End of chapter 8 Recording by Richard Kilmer, Rio Medina, Texas Chapter 9 of the Junior Classics, Volume 8, Animal and Nature Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Thompson. The Junior Classics, Volume 8, Animal and Nature Stories. Edited by William Patton. What Ginger Told Black Beauty by Anna Sewell. One day, when Ginger and I were standing alone in the shade, we had a great deal of talk. She wanted to know all about my bringing up and breaking in, and I told her. Well, said she, if I had had your bringing up, I might have had as good a temper as you, but now I don't believe I ever shall. Why not, I said. Because it has been all so different with me, she replied. I never had any one, horse or man, that was kind to me, or that I cared to please, for in the first place I was taken from my mother as soon as I was weaned, and put with a lot of other young colts. None of them cared about me, and I cared for none of them. There was no kind master like yours to look after me, and talk to me, and bring me nice things to eat. The man that had the care of us never gave me any kind word in my life. I do not mean that he ill-used me, but he did not care for us one bit further than to see that we had plenty to eat and shelter in the winter. A footpath ran through our field, and very often the great boys passing through would fling stones to make us gallop. I was never hit, but one fine young colt was badly cut in the face, and I should think it would be a scar for life. We did not care for them, but of course it made us more wild, and we settled it in our minds that boys were our enemies. We had very good fun in the free meadows, galloping up and down and chasing each other round and round the field, then standing still under the shade of the trees. But when it came to breaking in, that was a bad time for me, 
Several men came to catch me, and when at last they closed me in on one corner of the field, one caught me by the forelock, another caught me by the nose and held it so tight I could hardly draw my breath. Then another took my underjaw in his hard hand and wrenched my mouth open, and so by force they got on the halter and the bar into my mouth. Then one dragged me along by the halter, another flogging behind, and this was the first experience I had of men's kindness. It was all force. They did not give me a chance to know what they wanted. I was high-bred, and had a great deal of spirit, and was very wild, no doubt, and gave them, I dare say, plenty of trouble. But then it was dreadful to be shut up in a stall day after day instead of having my liberty, and I fretted and pined and wanted to get loose. You know yourself it's bad enough when you have a kind master and plenty of coaxing, but there was nothing of that sort for me. There was one, the old master, Mr. Ryder, who I think could soon have brought me round and could have done anything with me, but he had given up all the hard part of the trade to his son and to another experienced man, and he only came at times to oversee. His son was a strong, tall, bold man. They called him Samson, and he used to boast that he had never found a horse that could throw him. There was no gentleness in him, as there was in his father, but only hardness, a hard voice, a hard eye, a hard hand, and I felt from the first that what he wanted was to wear all the spirit out of me, and just make me into a quiet, humble, obedient piece of horse-flesh. Horse-flesh, yes, that is all that he thought about, and Ginger stamped her foot, as if the very thought of him made her angry. Then she went on, if I did not do exactly what he wanted, he would get put out and make me run round with that long rein in the training field till he had tired me out. I think he drank a good deal, and I am quite sure that the oftener he drank, the worse it was for me. One day he had worked me hard in every way he could, and when I lay down I was tired and miserable and angry. It all seemed so hard. The next morning he came for me early, and ran me round again for a long time. I had scarcely had an hour's rest when he came again for me with a saddle and bridle and a new kind of bit. I could never quite tell how it came about. He had only just mounted me on the training ground when something I did put him out of temper, and he chucked me hard with the rein. The new bit was very painful, and I reared up suddenly, which angled him still more, and he began to flog me. I felt my whole spirit set against him, and I began to kick and plunge and rear as I have never done before. And we had a regular fight, for a long time he stuck to the saddle and punished me cruelly with his whip and spurs. But my blood was thoroughly up, and I cared for nothing he could do if only I could get him off. At last, after a terrible struggle, I threw him backwards. I heard him fall heavily on the turf, and, without looking behind me, I galloped off to the other end of the field. There I turned round and saw my persecutor slowly rising from the ground and going into the stable. I stood under an oak tree and watched, but no one came to catch me. The time went on, and the sun was very hot. The flies swarmed round me and settled on my bleeding flanks where the spurs had dug in. I felt hungry, for I had not eaten since the early morning, and there was not enough grass in that meadow for a goose to live on. I wanted to lie down and rest, but with the saddle strapped tightly on, there was no comfort, and there was not a drop of water to drink. The afternoon wore on, and the sun got low. I saw the other colts led in, and I knew they were having a good feed. At last, just as the sun went down, I saw the old master come out with a sieve in his hand. He was a very fine old gentleman with quite white hair, but his voice was what I should know him by, amongst a thousand. It was not high, nor yet low, but full and clear and kind, and when he gave orders it was so steady and decided that everyone knew, both horses and men, that he expected to be obeyed. He came quietly along, now and then shaking the oats about that he had in the sieve, and speaking cheerfully and gently to me, "'Come along, lassie, come along, lassie, come along, come along.' I stood still and let him come up. He held the oats to me, and I began to eat without fear. His voice took all my fear away. He stood by, patting and stroking me whilst I was eating, and seeing the clots of blood on my side, he seemed very vexed. Poor lassie, 
It was a bad business, a bad business. Then he quietly took the rein and led me to the stable. Just at the door stood Samson. I laid my ears back and snapped at him. Stand back, said the master, and keep out of her way. You've done a bad day's work for this filly. He growled out something about a vicious brute. Hark ye, said the father, a bad-tempered man will never make a good-tempered horse. You've not learned your trade yet, Samson. Then he led me into my box, took off the saddle and bridle with his own hands, and tied me up. Then he called for a pail of warm water and a sponge, took off his coat, and while the stableman held the pail, he sponged my sides a good while, so tenderly that I was sure he knew how sore and bruised they were. Whoa, my pity one, he said. Stand still, stand still. His very voice did me good, and the bathing was very comfortable. The skin was so broken at the corners of my mouth that I could not eat the hay. The stalks hurt me. And he looked closely at it, shook his head, and told the man to fetch a good brown mash and put some meal into it. How good that mash was, and so soft and healing to my mouth. He stood by all the time I was eating, stroking me and talking to the man. If a high-mettled creature like this, said he, can't be broken in by fair means, she will never be good for anything. After that he often came to see me, and when my mouth was healed, the other breaker, Job they called him, went on training me. He was steady and thoughtful, and I soon learned what he wanted. End of chapter 9「Some True Stories of Horses and Donkeys by W. H. G. Kingston The horse becomes the willing servant of man, and when kindly treated looks upon him as a friend and protector. I have an interesting story to tell you of a mare which belonged to Captain I, an old settler in New Zealand. She and her foal had been placed in a paddock between which and her master's residence three or four miles away several high fences intervened the paddock itself was surrounded by a still higher fence one day however as captain i was standing with a friend in front of his house he was surprised to see the mare come galloping up supposing that the fence of her paddock had been broken down and that pleased at finding herself at liberty she had leaped the others. He ordered a servant to take her back. The mare willingly followed the man, but in a short time was seen galloping up towards the house in as great a hurry as before. The servant, who arrived some time afterwards, assured his master that he had put the mare safely into the paddock. Captain I told him again to take back the animal and to examine the fence more thoroughly still believing that it must have been broken down in some part or other, though the gate might be secure. Captain I and his friend then retired into the house and were seated at dinner when the sound of horses' hoofs reached their ears. The friend, who had on this got up to look out of the window, saw that it was the mare come back for the third time and observing the remarkable manner in which she was running up and down, apparently trying even to get into the house, exclaimed, What can that mare want? I am sure that there is something the matter. Captain I, on hearing this, hurried out to ascertain the state of the case. No sooner did the mare see him than she began to frisk about and exhibit the most lively satisfaction, but instead of stopping to received the accustomed caress, off she set again of her own accord towards the paddock, looking back to ascertain whether her master was following. His friend now joined him, and the mare, finding that they were keeping close behind her, 
trotted on till the gate of the paddock was reached where she waited for them on its being opened she led them across the field to a deep ditch on the farther side when what was their surprise to find that her colt had fallen into it and was struggling on its back with its legs in the air utterly unable to extricate itself in a few minutes more probably it would have been dead the mare it was evident finding that the servant did not comprehend her wishes had again and again sought her master in whom she had learned from past experience to confide here was an example of strong maternal affection eliciting a faculty superior to instinct which fully merits the name of reason the memory of horses is remarkable the newsman of a country paper was in the habit of riding his horse once or twice a week to the houses of fifty or sixty of his customers the horse invariably stopping of his own accord at each house as he reached it but the memory of the horse was exhibited in a still more curious manner it happened that there were two persons on the route who took one paper between them and each claimed the privilege of having it first on each alternate week the horse soon became accustomed to this regulation and though the parties lived two miles distant he stopped once a fortnight at the door of the half customer at one place and once a fortnight at the door of the half customer at the other and never did he forget this arrangement which lasted for several years i was once traveling in the interior of portugal with several companions my horse had never been in that part of the country before we left our inn at daybreak and proceeded through a mountainous district to visit some beautiful scenery on our return evening was approaching when i stopped behind my companions to tighten the girths of my saddle believing that there was only one path to take i rode slowly on but shortly reached a spot where i was in some doubt whether i should go forward or turn off to the left i shouted but heard no voice in reply nor could i see any trace of my friends darkness was coming rapidly on my horse seeming inclined to take the left hand i thought it best to let him do so in a short time the sky became overcast and there was no moon the darkness was excessive still my steed stepped boldly on so dense became the obscurity that i could not see his ears nor could i indeed distinguish my own hand held out at arm's length i had no help for it but to place the reins on my horse's neck and let him go forward we had heard of robberies and murders committed and i knew that there were steep precipices down which had my horse fallen we should have been dashed to pieces still the firm way in which he trotted gave me confidence hour after hour passed by the darkness would at all events conceal me from the banditti if such were in wait that was one consolation but then i could not tell where my horse might be taking me it might be far away from where i hoped to find my companions at length i heard a dog bark and saw a light twinkling far down beneath me by which i knew that i was still on the mountain side thus on my steady steed proceeded till i found that he was going along a road and i fancied i could distinguish the outlines of trees on either hand suddenly he turned on one side when my hat was nearly knocked off by striking against the beam of a trellised porch covered with vines and to my joy i found that he had brought me up to the door of the inn which we had left in the morning my companions trusting to their human guide had not arrived having taken a longer though safer route my steed had followed the direct path over the mountains which we had pursued in the morning another horse of mine which always appeared a gentle animal and which constantly carried a lady was during my absence ridden by a friend with spurs on my return i found that he had on several occasions 
attacked his rider when dismounted with his forefeet and had once carried off the rim of his hat from that time forward he would allow no one to approach him if he saw spurs on his heels and i was obliged to blindfold him when mounting and dismounting as he on several occasions attacked me as he had done my friend a horse was shut up in a paddock near leeds in a corner of which stood a pump with a tub beneath it the groom however often forgot to fill the tub the horse having thus no water to drink the animal had observed the way in which water was procured and one night when the tub was empty was seen to take the pump handle in his mouth and work it with his head till he had procured as much water as he required a remarkable instance of a horse saving human life occurred some years ago at the cape of good hope a storm was raging when a vessel dragging her anchors was driven on the rocks and speedily dashed to pieces many of those on board perished the remainder were seen clinging to the wreck or holding on to the fragments which were washing to and fro amid the breakers no boat could put off when all hope had gone of saving the unfortunate people a settler somewhat advanced in life appeared on horseback on the shore his horse was a bold and strong animal and noted for excelling as a swimmer the farmer moved with compassion for the unfortunate seamen resolved to attempt saving them fixing himself firmly in the saddle he pushed into the midst of the breakers at first both horse and rider disappeared but soon they were seen buffeting the waves and swimming towards the wreck calling two of the seamen he told them to hold on by his boots then turning his horse's head he brought them safely to land no less than seven times did he repeat this dangerous exploit thus saving fourteen lives for the eighth time he plunged in when encountering a formidable wave the brave man lost his balance and was instantly overwhelmed the horse swam safely to shore but his gallant rider alas was no more some horses in the county of limerick which were pastured in a field broke bounds like a band of unruly schoolboys and scrambling through a gap which they had made in a fence found themselves in a narrow lane along the quiet by-road they galloped helter-skelter at full speed snorting and tossing their manes in the full enjoyment of their freedom but greatly to the terror of a party of children who were playing in the lane as the horses were seen tearing wildly along the children scrambled up the bank into the hedge and buried themselves in the bushes regardless of thorns with the exception of one poor little thing who too small to run fell down on its face and lay crying loudly in the middle of the narrow way on swept the horses but when the leader of the troop saw the little child lying in his path he suddenly stopped and so did the others behind him then stooping his head he seized the infant's clothes with his teeth and carefully lifted it to the side of the road laying it gently and quite unhurt on the tender grass he and his companions then resumed their gallop in the lane unconscious of having performed a remarkable act we have no less authority than dr franklin to prove that donkeys enjoy music the mistress of a chateau in france where he visited had an excellent voice and every time she began to sing a donkey belonging to the establishment invariably came near the window and listened with the greatest attention one day during the performance of a piece of music which apparently pleased it more than any it had previously heard the animal quitting its usual post outside the window unceremoniously entered the room and to exhibit its satisfaction began to bray with all its might donkeys sometimes exert their ingenuity to their own advantage a certain ass had his quarters in a shed in front of which was a small yard on one side of the yard was a kitchen garden separated from it by a wall in which was a door fastened by two bolts and a latch 
the owner of the premises one morning in taking a turn round his garden observed the footprints of an ass on the walks and beds surely some one must have left the door open at night thought the master he accordingly took care to see that it was closed again however he found that the ass had visited the garden the next night curious to know how this had happened he watched from a window overlooking the yard at first he kept a light burning near him the ass however remained quietly at his stall after a time to enable him to see the better he had it removed when what was his surprise to see the supposed stupid donkey come out of the shed go to the door and rearing himself on his hind legs unfasten the upper bolt of the door with his nose this done he next withdrew the lower bolt then lifted the latch and walked into the garden he was not long engaged in his foraging expedition and soon returned with a bunch of carrots in his mouth placing them in his shed he went back and carefully closed the door and began at his ease to munch the provender he had so adroitly got possession of the owner suspecting that people would not believe his story invited several of his neighbors to witness the performance of the ass not till the light however had been taken away would the creature commence his operations evidently conscious that he was doing wrong a lock was afterwards put on the door which completely baffled the ingenuity of the cunning animal end of chapter ten Chapter 11 of the Junior Classics, Volume 8, Animal and Nature Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Junior Classics, Volume 8, Animal and Nature Stories, by William Patton. Chapter 11 old mustard a tale of the western pioneers by e w friends when grandmother lane was a little girl her father came in one day and said wife it is all settled at last i have sold the farm next week we will start west there is a large company going from here and we must try to get ready to go with them little mary as grandmother was then called heard the news with great delight because she knew it would mean a long long journey lasting months and carrying them into a new country where there was never any cold weather and where great crops could be raised without much hard work and there would always be plenty to eat besides her family was not going alone but many other families whom they knew were going at the same time so that she would have some of her playmates with her all the way it was a wonderful sight when the great day came at last and the long wagon train set out in all there were more than forty wagons some drawn by four or six horses and some by as many as eight big oxen and such strange wagons they were more like little houses on wheels only instead of a roof there was a high frame overhead made of hoops and covered with canvas so it made a sort of tent to ride in by day if you wished and to sleep in at night and from these hoops hung all sorts of things hams and pieces of bacon strips of dried pumpkin pans to cook in and clothes underneath the big wagon outside swung the great kettles in which the larger things were cooked and axes and ropes and chains for pulling the wagons out when they got stuck in the mud to little mary it was all new and delightful the big wagons squeaked and groaned and swayed from side to side till the hams hanging from the frame overhead would swing back and forth like the pendulum of a clock 
there were shouts of the men to the horses and oxen the barking of the dogs that ran along the side of the trail the sharp cracking of the driver's whips and the ting tang of the iron kettles swinging against each other and always they were passing through places that were new and seeing things that were fresh and strange the wagon of mr harding that was my grandmother's father was drawn by four oxen but one of them known as jerry began to show signs of sickness when they had been on the road a few days the men gave him medicine and doctored him all they could but he seemed to grow weaker all the time instead of better and one morning when they went to yoke the oxen to the wagon they found him dead for a day or two they went on with only three oxen then mr harding met a trader who was willing to sell him a pet ox that he called old mustard to take the place of jerry it was a very funny-looking ox indeed not like any that mary or anybody in her family had ever seen before he had a very large round head with shaggy hair matted on top and on his back was a large hump in color he was a dirty yellow all over that is why the trader called him mustard he isn't very pretty said the trader but he is strong and good-natured and will pull more than any ox of his size that i ever saw besides he will get on with less grass and less water he is a half buffalo he shows that in his huge head and shoulders for this reason he will be worth more to you than any scout or watchdog he can smell indians a mile away and will fight them on sight mr harding did not quite like to buy so strange an animal but he must get another ox somewhere and so he took old mustard by the end of the first day he was very glad he had done so for the funny-looking yellow creature took its place at the tongue of the cart and pulled steadily and well and every day after that he did his work faithfully and seemed never to be sick or to feel tired by the end of the fourth week the wagon train had entered a country where the indians were known to be on the warpath and trouble was expected they even found the remains of three partly burned wagons great care was now taken to send scouts ahead during the day and to prepare the camp for defense at night the first thing that was done as soon as the stop was made for the night was to park all the wagons as they called it the big ox carts were placed in a great circle and chained one to another sometimes the cattle were picketed outside to graze with men armed with guns to watch them and sometimes they were driven inside but always the campfires were built in the circle and round them the different families gathered to cook and eat their supper one night when the wagons had been parked and every one had eaten supper and gone to sleep old mustard began to act very strangely at first he tossed his head and blew hard through his nostrils then he began to move about uneasily as far as his rope would let him and to snort and paw the ground when one of the guards went near him he turned upon him a pair of eyes that were bright green and shiny at last mr harding happened to think of what the trader had told him do you suppose it can be that he scents indians he asked one of the other men it may be he said it is sure that he is excited over something perhaps we had better be on the safe side and wake the men quietly mr harding went from wagon to wagon rousing the sleepers he had hardly finished when old mustard with a terrible roar snapped the rope that held him 
dashed to the edge of the circle, leaped a cart tongue, and thundered away into the darkness. Almost instantly there came a scream, and then the rushing charge of Indian riders. They were met by the men of the party, now all prepared for them and protected by the circle of wagons. And finding that their attack had been discovered too soon, the Indians drew off after the first rush. By the earliest flush of daylight, a searching party went out from the camp. It came upon poor old Mustard grazing about, and not far away lay an Indian trampled into the dust. The Indian was the foremost of the band that was quietly creeping up on the camp when Old Mustard had scented them, and not only given warning but surprised and killed the leader. End of chapter 11 Recording by Sharon Kilmer, Real Medina, Texas Chapter 12 of the Junior Classics, Volume 8, Animal and Nature Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Junior Classics, Volume 8, Animal and Nature Stories by William Patton. Chapter 12, Carlo, the Soldier's Dog by General Rush C. Hawkins. The Ninth New York Volunteers was organized in April 1861 in the city of New York. Two of the companies were made up of men from outside the city. C. was composed of men from Hoboken and Patterson, New Jersey, and G. marched into the regimental headquarters, fully organized from the town of Fort Lee in that state. With this last-named company, came Carlo, the subject of this sketch. When he joined the regiment, he had passed beyond the period of puppyhood and was in the full flush of dogly beauty. He was large, not very large, would probably have turned the scales at about fifty pounds. His build was decidedly stocky, and, as horsey men would say, his feet were well under him. His chest was broad and full, back straight, color, a warm, dark brindle, nose and lips very black, while he had a broad, full forehead and a wonderful pair of large, round, soft, dark brown eyes. Add to this description an air of supreme, well-bred dignity, and you have an idea of one of the noblest animals that ever lived. His origin was obscure. One camp reunion asserted that he was born on board of a merchant ship while his mother was making a passage from Calcutta to New York, and another told of a beautiful mastiff living somewhere in the state of New Jersey that had the honor of bringing him into the world. It would be very interesting to know something of the parentage of our hero, but since the facts surrounding his birth are unattainable, we must content ourselves with telling a portion of the simple story of a good and noble life. It may be safe to assert that he was not a Native American. If he had been, he would have provided himself with the regulation genealogical tree and family coat of arms. During the first part of his term of service, Carlo was very loyal to his company, marched, messed, and slept with it. But he was not above picking up here and there from the mess tents of the other companies a tidbit now and then which proved acceptable to a well-appointed digestion. His first turn on guard was performed as a member of a detail from Company G, and always afterwards, in the performance of that duty, he was most faithful. No matter who else might be late, he was ever on time when the call for guard mount was sounded, ready to go out with his own particular squad. At first, he would march back to company quarters with the old detail, but as soon as he came to realize the value and importance of guard duty, he made up his mind that his place was at the guard tent and on the patrol beat, where he could be of the greatest service in watching the movements of the enemy. 
In the performance of his duties as a member of the guard, he was very conscientious and ever on the alert. No stray pig, wandering sheep, or silly calf could pass in front of his part of the line without being investigated by him. It is possible that his vigilance in investigating intruding meats was sharpened by the hope of a substantial recognition in the way of a stray rib extracted from the marauding offender whose ignorance of army customs in time of war had brought it too near our lines. As a rule, Carlo, what with his guard duties and other purely routine items, managed to dispose of the day until dress parade. At this time he appeared at his best and became the regimental dog. No officer or soldier connected with the command more fully appreciated the pomp and circumstance of great and glorious wars than he. As the band marched out to take position previous to playing for the companies to assemble, he would place himself alongside the drum major, and when the signal for marching was given, would move off with stately and solemn tread, with head well up, looking straight to the front. Upon those great occasions he fully realized the dignity of his position, and woe betide any unhappy other dog that happened to get in front of the marching band. When upon the parade field, he became, next to the colonel, the commanding officer, and ever regarded himself as the regulator of the conduct of those careless and frivolous dogs that go about the world like street urchins, having no character for respectability or position in society to sustain. Of those careless ne'er-do-wells, the company had accumulated a very large following. As a rule, they were harmless and companionable and were always on hand ready for a free lunch. It was only on dress parade that they made themselves over-officious. Each company was attended to the parade ground by its particular family of canine companions. And when all of them had assembled, the second battalion of the regiment would make itself known by a great variety of jumpings, caperings, barks of joy, and cries of delight. To this unseasonable hilarity, Carlo seriously objected, and his actions plainly told the story of his disgust at the conduct of the silly members of his race. He usually remained a passive observer until the exercise in the manual of arms, at which particular period in the ceremonies the caperings and the barkings would become quite unendurable. Our hero would then assumed the character of a preserver of the peace. He would make for the nearest group of revelers and, in as many seconds, give a half a dozen or more of them vigorous shakes, which would set them to howling and warn the others of the thoughtless tribe of an impending danger. Immediately the offenders would all scamper to another part of the field and remain quiet until the dress parade was over. This duty was self-imposed and faithfully performed upon many occasions. After the parade was dismissed, Carlo would march back to quarters with his own company, where he would remain until the last daily distribution of rations, whereupon, after having disposed of his share, he would start out upon a tour of regimental inspection, making friendly calls at various company quarters, and by taps turning up at the headquarters of the guard. His duties ended for the day. He would enjoy his well-earned rest until reveille, unless some event of an unusual nature occurring during the night disturbed his repose and demanded his attention. During the first year of his service in the field, Carlo was very fortunate. He had shared in all the transportations by water, in all the marchings, skirmishes, and battles, without receiving a scratch for having a day's illness. But his good fortune was soon the end, for it was ordained that, like other brave defenders, he was to suffer in the great cause for which all were risking their lives. The morning of April 18, 1862, my brigade, then stationed at Roanoke Island, 
embarked upon the steamer Ocean Wave for an expedition up the Elizabeth River, the object of which was to destroy the locks of the dismal swamp canal in order to prevent several imaginary ironclads from getting into Albemarle Sound. Among the first to embark was the ever-ready and faithful Carlo, and the next morning, when his companions disembarked near Elizabeth City, he was one of the first to land, and during the whole of that long and dreary march of thirty miles to Camden Courthouse, lasting from three o'clock in the morning until one in the afternoon, he was ever on the alert, but keeping close to his regiment. The field of battle was reached. The engagement, in which his command met with great loss, commenced and ended, and when the particulars of the disaster were inventoried, it was ascertained that a Confederate bullet had taken the rudimentary claw from Carlo's left foreleg. This was his first wound, and he bore it like a hero without a wind or even a limp. A private of Company G, who first noticed the wound, exclaimed, Ah, Carlo, what a pity you are not an officer. If you were, the loss of that claw would give you sixty days' leave and a brigadier general's commission at the end of it. That was about the time that general's commissions had become very plentiful in the Department of North Carolina. The command re-embarked and reached Roanoke Island in the morning, after the engagement, in time for the regulation hospital or sick call, which that day brought together an unusual number of patients, and among them was Carlo, who was asked to join the waiting line by one of the wounded men. When his turn came to be inspected by the attending surgeon, he was told to hold up the wounded leg, which he readily did and then followed the washing, the application of simple serrate, and the bandaging, with a considerable show of interest and probable satisfaction. Thereafter, there was no occasion to ask him to attend the surgeon's inspection. Each morning, as soon as a bugle call was sounded, he would take his place in line with the other patients, advance in his turn, and receive the usual treatment. This habit continued until the wound was healed. Always after this, to every friendly greeting, he would respond by holding up that wounded leg for inspection, and he acted as though he thought that everybody was interested in the honorable scar that told the story of patriotic duty faithfully performed. Later on, for some reason known to himself, Carlo transferred his special allegiance the Company K, and maintained close connection with that company until the end of his term of service. He was regarded by its members as a member of the company mess, and was treated as one of them. But notwithstanding his special attachments, there can be no reasonable doubt about his having considered himself a member of the regiment, clothed with certain powers and responsibilities. At the end of his term, he was fitted with a uniform, trousers, jacket, and fez, and thus dressed, he marched up Broadway, immediately behind the band. He was soon after mustered out of the service, and received an honorable discharge, not signed with written characters, but attested by the good will of every member of the regiment. End of chapter 12 Recording by Richard Kilmer, Rio Medina Texas. Chapter 13 of The Junior Classics, Volume 8, Animal and Nature Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lee Smalley. The Junior Classics, Volume 8. Animal and Nature Stories, edited by William Patton. 13. A Brave Dog, by Sir Samuel W. Baker. When I was a boy, my grandfather frequently told a story concerning a dog which he knew as a more than ordinary example of the fidelity so frequently exhibited by the race. 
This animal was a mastiff that belonged to an intimate friend, to whom it was a constant companion. It was an enormous specimen of that well-known breed, which is not generally celebrated for any peculiar intelligence, but is chiefly remarkable for size and strength. This dog had been brought up by its master from puppyhood, and as the proprietor was a single man, there had been no division of affection, as there would have been had the dog belonged to a family of several members. Turk regarded nobody but his owner. I shall now honor Turk by the masculine gender. Whenever Mr. Prido went out for a walk, Turk was sure to be near his heels. Street dogs would bark and snarl at the giant as his massive form attracted their attention, but Turk seldom condescended to notice such vulgar demonstrations. He was a noble-looking creature, somewhat resembling a small lioness, but although he was gentle and quiet in disposition, he had upon several occasions been provoked beyond endurance, and his attack had been nearly always fatal to his assailants. He slept at night outside his master's door, and no sentry could be more alert upon his watch than the faithful dog, who had apparently only one ambition, to protect and to accompany his owner. Mr. Prideaux had a dinner party. He never invited ladies, but simply entertained his friends as a bachelor. His dinners were but secondary to the quality of his guests, however, who were always men of reputation, either in the literary world or in the modern annals of society. The dog Turk was invariably present, and usually stretched his huge form upon the hearth rug. It was a cold night in winter when Mr. Prideaux's friends were talking after dinner that the conversation turned upon the subject of dogs. Almost every person had an anecdote to relate, and my own grandfather, being present, had no doubt added his mite to the collection, when Turk suddenly awoke from a sound sleep, and having stretched himself until he appeared to be awake to the situation, walked up to his master's side, and rested his large head upon the table. "'Ha-ha, Turk!' exclaimed Mr. Prideaux. "'You must have heard our arguments about the dogs, so you have put in an appearance.' "'And a magnificent specimen he is,' remarked my grandfather. "'But although a mastiff is the largest and most imposing of the race, "'I do not think it is as sensible as many others,' replied his master, "'because they are generally chained up as watchdogs, "'and have not the intimate association with human beings, "'which is so great an advantage to house dogs. "'But Turk has been my constant companion "'from the first month of his existence, "'and his intelligence is very remarkable.' He understands most things that I say if they are connected with himself. He will often lie upon the rug with his large eyes fixed upon me as though searching my inward thoughts, and he will frequently be aware instinctively that I wish to go out. Upon such times he will fetch my hat, cane, or gloves, whichever may be at hand, and wait for me at the front door. He will take a letter or any other token to several houses of my acquaintance and wait for a reply and he can perform a variety of actions that would imply a share of reason seldom possessed by other dogs. A smile of incredulity upon several faces was at once perceived by Mr. Prideaux, who immediately took a guinea from his pocket and addressed his dog. Here, Turk, they won't believe in you. Take this guinea to number blank, blank street to Mr. Blank, and bring me a receipt. The dog wagged his huge tail with evident pleasure, and the guinea having been placed in his mouth, he hastened towards the door. This being opened, he was admitted through the front entrance to the street. It was a miserable night. The wind was blowing the sleet and rain against the windows. The gutters were running with muddy water, and the weather was exactly that which is expressed by the common term, not fit to turn a dog out in. Nevertheless, Turk had started upon his mission in the howling gale and darkness, while the front door was once more closed against the blast. The party was comfortably seated around the fire, and much interested in the success or failure of the dog's adventure. "'How long will it be before we may expect Turk's return?' inquired an incredulous guest. "'The house to which I have sent him is about a mile and a half distant. Therefore there is no delay when he barks for admission at the door, and my friend is not absent from home. He should return in about three-quarters of an hour with an acknowledgment. If, on the other hand, he cannot gain admission, he may wait for any length of time,' replied his master. Bets were exchanged among the company. Some supported the dog's chances of success, while others were against him. The evening wore away. The allotted time was exceeded, and a whole hour had passed, but no dog had returned. Fresh bets were made, but the odds were against the dog. His master was still hopeful. 
I must tell you, said Mr. Prido, that Turk frequently carries notes for me, and as he knows the house well, he certainly will not make a mistake. Perhaps my friend may be dining out, in which case Turk will probably wait for a longer time. Two hours passed. The storm was raging. Mr. Prideaux himself went to the front door, which flew open before a fierce gust the instant that the lock was turned. The clouds were rushing past a moon, but faintly visible at short intervals, and the gutters were clogged with masses of half-melted snow. "'Poor Turk,' muttered his master, "'this is indeed a wretched night for you. Perhaps they have kept you in the warm kitchen, and will not allow you to return in such fearful weather.' When Mr. Prideaux returned to his guests, he could not conceal his disappointment. Ha! exclaimed one who had betted against the dog. I never doubted his sagacity. With a guinea in his mouth, he has probably gone into some house of entertainment where dogs are supplied with dinner and a warm bed, instead of shivering in a winter's gale. Jokes were made by the winners of bets at the absent dog's expense, but his master was anxious and annoyed. The various bets were paid by the losers, and poor Turk's reputation had suffered severely. It was long past midnight. The guests were departed, the storm was raging, and violent gusts occasionally shook the house. Mr. Prideaux was alone in his study, and he poked the fire until it blazed and roared up the chimney. "'What can have become of that dog?' exclaimed his master to himself, now really anxious. "'I hope they kept him. Most likely they would not send him back upon such a dreadful night.' Mr. Prideaux's study was close to the front door, and his acute attention was suddenly directed to a violent shaking and scratching, accompanied by a prolonged whine. In an instant he ran into the hall and unlocked the entrance door. A mass of filth and mud entered. This was Turk. The dog seemed dreadfully fatigued and was shivering with wet and cold. His usually clean coat was thick with mire, as though he had been dragged through deep mud. He wagged his tail when he heard his master's voice, but appeared dejected and ill. Mr. Prideaux had rung the bell, and the servants, who were equally interested as their master in Turk's failure to perform his mission, had attended the summons. The dog was taken downstairs and immediately placed in a large tub of hot water, in which he was accustomed to be bathed. It was now discovered that in addition to mud and dirt, which almost concealed his coat, he was besmeared with blood. Mr. Prideaux himself sponged his favorite with hot soap and water, and to his astonishment he perceived wounds of a serious nature. The dog's throat was badly torn. His back and breast were deeply bitten, and there could be no doubt that he had been worried by a pack of dogs. This was a strange occurrence, that Turk should be discomfited. He was now washed clean and was being rubbed dry with a thick towel while he stood upon a blanket before the kitchen fire. "'Why, Turk, old boy, what has been the matter?' "'Tell us all about it, poor old man!' exclaimed his master. The dog was now thoroughly warmed, and he panted with the heat of the kitchen fire. He opened his mouth, and the guinea, which he had received in trust, dropped on the kitchen floor. "'There is some mystery in this,' said Mr. Prideaux, "'which I will endeavor to discover to-morrow. He has been set upon by strange dogs, and rather than lose the guinea, he has allowed himself to be half killed without once opening his mouth in self-defense.' "'Poor Turk,' continued his master, "'you must have lost your way, old man, in the darkness and storm, "'most likely confused with the unequal fight. "'What an example you have given us, wretched humans, "'in being steadfast to a trust.' "'Turk was wonderfully better after his warm bath. "'He lapped up a large bowl of good thick soup mixed with bread, "'and in half an hour was comfortably asleep "'upon his thick rug by his master's bedroom door. "'Upon the following morning the storm had cleared away, and a bright sky had succeeded to the gloom of the preceding night. Immediately after breakfast, Mr. Prideaux, accompanied by his dog, who was, although rather stiff, not much the worse for the rough treatment he had received, started for a walk towards the house to which he had directed Turk upon the previous evening. He was anxious to discover whether his friend had been absent, as he concluded that the dog might have been waiting for admittance, and had been perhaps attacked by some dogs belonging to the house or its neighbors. The master and Turk had walked for nearly a mile, and had just turned the corner of a street when, as they passed a butcher shop upon the right hand, a large brindled mastiff rushed from the shop door and flew at Turk with unprovoked ferocity. "'Call your dog off!' shouted Mr. Prideaux to the butcher, who surveyed the attack with impudent satisfaction. "'Call him off, or my dog will kill him!' continued Mr. Prideaux. 
the usual docile Turk had rushed to meet his assailant with a fury that was extraordinary. With a growl like that of a lion, he quickly seized his antagonist by the throat. Rearing upon his hind legs, he exerted his tremendous strength, and in a fierce struggle of only a few seconds, he threw the brindled dog upon its back. It was in vain that Mr. Prideaux endeavored to call him off. The rage of his favorite was quite ungovernable. He never for an instant relaxed his hold, but with the strength of a wild beast of prey, Turk shook the head of the butcher's dog to the right and left until it struck each time heavily against the pavement. The butcher attempted to interfere, and lashed him with a huge whip. "'Stand clear! Fair play! Don't you strike my dog!' shouted Mr. Prideaux. "'Your dog was the first to attack.' In reply to the whip, Turk had redoubled his fury, and without relinquishing his hold, he had now dragged the butcher's dog off the pavement, and occasionally shaking the body as he pulled the unresisting mass along the gutter, he drew it into the middle of the street. A large crowd had collected, which completely stopped the thoroughfare. There were no police in those days, but only watchmen, who were few and far between. Even had they been present, it is probable they would have joined in the amusement of a dog-fight, which in that age of brutality was considered to be sport. "'Fair play!' shouted the bystanders. "'Let him have it out!' cried others, as they formed a circle around the dogs. In the meantime, Mr. Prideaux had seized Turk by his collar. While the butcher was endeavoring to release the remains of his dog from the infuriated and deadly grip. At length Mr. Prideaux's voice and action appeared for a moment to create a calm, and, snatching the opportunity, he, with the assistance of a person in the crowd, held back his dog, as the carcass of the butcher's dog was dragged away by the lately insolent owner. The dog was dead. Turk's flanks were heaving with the intense exertion and excitement of the fight, and he strained to escape from his master's hold to once more attack the lifeless body of his late antagonist. At length, by kind words and the caress of the well-known hand, his fury was calmed down. "'Well, that's the most curious adventure I've ever had with a dog!' exclaimed the butcher, who was now completely crestfallen. "'Why, that's the very dog! He is so... that's the very dog who came by my shop late last night in the howling storm, and my dog Tiger went at him and tousled him up completely. I never saw such a cowardly cur. He wouldn't show any fight.' although he was pretty near as big as a costermonger's donkey. And there my dog Tiger nearly eat half of him, and dragged the other half about the gutter, till he looked more like an old doormat than a dog. And I thought he must have killed him. And here he comes out as fresh as paint today, and kills old Tiger clean as though he'd been only a biggish cat. "'What do you say?' asked Mr. Prideaux. "'Was it your dog that worried my poor dog last night when he was upon a message of trust?' My friend, I thank you for this communication, but let me inform you of the fact that my dog had a guinea in his mouth to carry to my friend, and rather than drop it, he allowed himself to be half killed by your savage tiger. Today he has proved his courage, and your dog has discovered his mistake. This is the guinea that he dropped from his mouth when he returned to me after midnight, beaten and distressed, said Mr. Prideaux, much excited. Here, Turk, old boy, take the guinea again, and come along with me. You have had your revenge, and have given us all a lesson. His master gave him the guinea in his mouth, and they continued their walk. It appeared, upon Mr. Prideaux's arrival at his friend's house, that Turk had never been there. Probably after his defeat he had become so confused that he lost his way in the heavy storm, and had at length regained the road home, some time after midnight, in the deplorable condition already described. End of chapter 13 Recording by Lee Smalley Chapter 14 of the Junior Classics, Volume 8, Animal and Nature Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lee Smalley. The Junior Classics, Volume 8, Animal and Nature Stories. Edited by William Patton. 14. Uncle Dick's Rolf by Georgiana M. Craik. I had been riding for five or six miles one pleasant afternoon. It was a delicious afternoon, like the afternoon of an English summer day. You always imagine it hotter out in Africa by a good deal than it is in England, don't you? Well, so it is, in a general way, a vast deal hotter. But every now and then, after the rains have fallen and the wind comes blowing from the sea, 
we get a day as much like one of our own best summer days as you ever felt anywhere. This afternoon was just like an English summer afternoon, with the fresh, sweet breeze rustling amongst the green leaves, and the great bright sea stretching out all blue and golden, and meeting the blue sky miles and miles away. It wasn't very hot, but it was just hot enough to make the thought of a swim delicious. So after I had been riding leisurely along for some little time, shooting a bird or two as I went, for I wanted some bright feathers to send home to a little cousin that I had in England, I alighted from my horse, and, letting him loose to graze, lay down for a quarter of an hour to cool myself, and then began to make ready for my plunge. I was standing on a little ledge of cliff, some six or seven feet above the sea. It was high tide, and the water at my feet was about a fathom deep. I shall have a delightful swim, I thought to myself, as I threw off my coat, and as just at that moment Rolf, in a very excited way, flung himself upon me, evidently understanding the meaning of the proceeding, and, as I thought, anxious to show his sympathy with it, I repeated the remark aloud. Yes, we'll have a delightful swim, you and I, together, I said. A grand swim, my old lad. And I clapped his back as I spoke, and encouraged him, as I was in the habit of doing, to express his feelings without reserve. But rather to my surprise, instead of wagging his tail and wrinkling his nose, and performing any of his usual antics, the creature only lifted up his face and began to whine. He had lain for the quarter of an hour while I had been resting at the edge of the little cliff, with his head drooped over it. But whether he had been taking a sleep in that position, or had been amusing himself by watching the waves, was more than I knew. He was a capital one for sleeping even then, and generally made a point of snatching a doze at every convenient opportunity. So I had naturally troubled my head very little about him, taking it for granted that he was at his usual occupation. But whether he had been asleep before or not, at any rate, he was wide awake now, and as it seemed to me, in a very odd humor indeed. "'What's the matter, old fellow?' I said to him, when he set up this dismal howl. "'Don't you want to have a swim?' "'Well, you needn't, unless you like, only I mean to have one. So down with you, and let me get my clothes off.' But instead of getting down, the creature began to conduct himself in the most incomprehensible way, first seizing me by the trousers with his teeth and pulling me to the edge of the rock, as if he wanted me to plunge in dressed as I was, then catching me again and dragging me back, much as though I was a big rat that he was trying to worry. In this pantomime, I declare, he went through three separate times, barking and whining all the while, till I began to think he was going out of his mind. Well, God forgive me, but at last I got into a passion with the beast. I couldn't conceive what he meant. For two or three minutes I tried to pacify him, and as long as I took no more steps to get my clothes off, he was willing to be pacified. But the instant I fell to undressing myself again, he was on me once more, pulling me this way and that, hanging on my arms, slobbering over me, howling with his mouth up in the air. And so at last I lost my temper, and I snatched up my gun and struck him with the butt end of it. "'My poor Rolf,' said Uncle Pick, all at once, with a falter in his voice, and he stopped abruptly and stooped down and laid his hand on the great black head. "'He was quieter after I had struck him,' said Uncle Dick, after a little pause. For a few moments he lay quite still at my feet, and I had begun to think that his crazy fit was over, and that he was going to give me no more trouble, when all at once, just as I had got ready to jump into the water, the creature sprang to his feet and flung himself upon me again. He threw himself with all his might upon my breast and drove me backwards, howling so wildly that many a time since, boys, I have thought I must have been no better than a blind, perverse fool not to have guessed what the trouble was. But the fact is, I was a conceited young fellow, as most young fellows are, and because I imagined the poor beast was trying for some reason of his own to get his own way, I thought it was my business to teach him that he was not to get his own way, but that I was to get mine. And so I beat him down somehow. I don't like to think of it now. I struck him again three or four times with the end of my gun, till at last I got myself freed from him. He gave a cry when he fell back. I call it a cry, for it was more like something human than a dog's howl. Something so wild and pathetic that, angry as I was, it startled me, 
and I almost think, if time enough had been given me, I would have made some last attempt then to understand what the creature meant. But I had no time after that. I was standing a few feet in from the water, and as soon as I had shaken him off, he went to the edge of the bit of cliff, and stood there for a moment till I came up to him, and then, just as in another second I should have jumped into the sea, my brave dog, my noble dog, gave one last whine and one look into my face, and took the leap before me. And then, boys, in another instant I saw what he had meant. He had scarcely touched the water, when I saw a crocodile slip like lightning from a sunny ledge of the cliff, and grip him by the hinder legs. You know that I had my gun close at hand, and in the whole course of my life I never was so glad to have my gun beside me. It was loaded, too, and a revolver. I caught it up and fired into the water. I fired three times, and two of the shots went into the brute's head. One missed him, and the first seemed not to harm him much, but the third hit him in some vital place, I hope, some sensitive place at any rate, for the hideous jaws started wide. Then, with my gun in my hand still, I began with all my might to shout out, Rolf! I couldn't leave my post, for the brute, though he had let Rolf go, and had dived for a moment, might make another spring, and I didn't dare to take my eyes off the spot where he had gone down. But I called to my wounded beast with all my might, and when he had struggled through the water and gained a moment's hold of the rock, I jumped down and caught him, and somehow, I don't know how, half carried and half dragged him up the little bit of steep ascent, till we were safe on the top, on the dry land again. And then, upon my word, I don't know what I did next, only I think, as I looked at my darling's poor crushed limbs, with the blood oozing from them, and heard his choking gasps for breath, I, I forgot for a moment or two that I was a man at all, and burst out crying like a child. Boys, you don't know what it is to feel that a living creature has tried to give up his life for you, even though the creature is only a soulless dog. Do you think I had another friend in the world who would have done what Rolf had done for me? If I had, I did not know it. And then, when I thought that it was while he had been trying to save my life that I had taken up my gun and struck him, there are some things, my lads, that a man does without meaning any harm by them, which yet, when he sees them by the light of after events, he can never bear to look back upon without a sort of agony. And those blows I gave to Rolf are of that sort. He forgave them, my noble dog, but I have never forgiven myself for them to this hour. When I saw him lying before me, with his blood trickling out upon the sand, I think I would have given my right hand to save his life, and well I might too, for he had done ten times more than that to save mine. He licked the tears off my cheeks, my poor old fellow. I remember that. We looked a strange pair, I dare say, as we lay on the ground together, with our heads side by side. It's a noble old head still, isn't it, boys? I don't mean mine, but this big one down here. All right, Rolf. We're only talking of your beauty, my lad. It's as grand a head as ever a dog had. I had his picture taken after I came home. I've had him painted more than once, but somehow I don't think the painters have ever seen quite into the bottom of his heart. At least I fancy that if I were a painter, I could make something better of him than any of them have done yet. Perhaps it's only a notion of mine, but to tell the truth, I've only a dozen times or so in my life seen a painting of a grand dog that looks quite right. But I'm wandering from my story, though indeed my story is almost at an end. When I had come to my senses a little, I had to try to get my poor Rolf moved. We were a long way from any house, and the creature couldn't walk a step. I tore up my shirt and bound his wounds as well as I could, and then I got my clothes on and called to my horse, and in some way, as gentle as I could, though it was no easy thing to do, I got him and myself together upon the horse's back, and we began our ride. There was a village about four or five miles off, and I made for that. It was a long, hard jolt for a poor fellow with both his hind legs broken, but he bore it as patiently as if he had been a Christian. I never spoke to him, but, panting as he was, he was ready to lick my hands and look lovingly up into my face. I've wondered since, many a time, what he could have thought about it all, and the only thing I am sure of is that he never thought much of the thing that he himself had done. That seemed, I know, all natural and simple to him. I don't believe that he has ever understood to this day what anybody wondered at in it, or made a hero of him for. 
for the noblest people are the people who are noble without knowing it, and the same rule, I fancy, holds good, too, for dogs. I got him to a resting place at last, after a weary ride, and then I had his wounds dressed, but it was weeks before he could stand upon his feet again, and when at last he began to walk, he limped, and he has gone on limping ever since. The bone of one leg was so crushed that it couldn't be set properly, and so that limb is shorter than the other three. He doesn't mind it much, I dare say. I don't think he ever did. But it has been a pathetic lameness to me, boys. It's all an old story now, you know, said Uncle Dick abruptly. But it's one of those things that a man doesn't forget, and that it would be a shame to him if he ever could forget as long as his life lasts. Uncle Dick stooped down again as he ceased to speak, and Rolf, disturbed by the silence, raised his head to look about him. As his master had said, it was a grand old head still, though the eyes were growing dim now with age. Uncle Dick laid his hand upon it, and the bushy tail began to wag. It had wagged at the touch of that hand for many a long day. We've been together for fifteen years. He's getting old now, said Uncle Dick. End of chapter 14. Recorded by Lee Smalley. Chapter 15 of the Junior Classics, Volume 8 Animal and Nature Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Thompson. The Junior Classics, Volume 8 Animal and Nature Stories. Edited by William Patton. Scrap by Lucia Chamberlain. At the grey end of the afternoon, the regiment of twelve companies went through Monterey on its way to the summer camp, a mile out of the salt meadows, and it was here that Scrap joined it. He did not tag at the heels of the boys who tagged the last company, or rush out with the other dogs who barked at the band, but he appeared somehow independent of any surroundings, and marched, ears alert, stump tail erect, one foot in front of the tall first lieutenant who walked on the wing of Company A. The lieutenant was self-conscious, and so fresh to the service that his shoulder straps hurt him. He failed to see Scrap, who was very small and very yellow, until, in quickening step, he stumbled over him, and all but measured his long length. He aimed an accurate kick that sent Scrap flying, surprised but not vindictive, to the sidelines, where he considered his head cocked. With the scratched ear pricked and the bitten ear flat, he passed the regiment in review until Company K, with old Muldoon, sergeant on the flank, came by. As lean, as mongrel, as tough, and as scarred as Scrap, he carried his wiry body with a devil-may-care assurance, in which Scrap may have recognized a kindred spirit. He decided in a flash. He made a dart and fell in abreast the sergeant of Company K. Muldoon saw and growled at him. Grrr, said Scrap, not ill-naturedly, and fell back a pace, but he did not slink. He had the secret of success. He kept as close as he could and yet escaped Muldoon's boot. With his head high, ears stiff, tail up, he stepped out to the music. Muldoon looked back with a threat that sent Scrap retreating, heels over ears. The sergeant was satisfied that the dog had gone, but when camp was reached and ranks were broken, he found himself confronted by a disreputable yellow cur with a ragged ear cocked over his nose. "'Well, I'm dumbed," said Muldoon, his heart, probably the toughest thing about him, was touched by this fearless persistence. "'Aren't you afraid of nothing, you little scrap?' he said. Scrap, answering the first name he had ever known, barked shrilly. "'What's that dog doing here?' said the tall lieutenant of Company A, disapprovingly. "'I'm after kicking him out, sir,' explained Muldoon, and upon the lieutenant's departure was seen retreating in the direction of the cook-tent, with the meagre and expectant Scrap inconspicuously at his heels. He went to sleep at taps in Muldoon's tent, curled up inside Muldoon's cartridge belt. But at Reveille the next morning the sergeant missed him. 
Between drill and drill, Muldoon sought diligently, with insinuations as to the character of dog-stealers that were near to precipitating personal conflict. He found the stray, finally, in Company B Street, leaping for bones amid the applause of the habitants. Arraigned collectively as thieves, Company B declared that the dog had strayed in and remained only because he could not be kicked out. But their pride in the height of his leaps was too evidently the pride of possession, and Muldoon, after vain attempts to catch the excited Scrap, who was eager only for bones, retired with threats of some vague disaster to before Company B the next day, if his dog were not returned. The responsibility, with its consequences, was taken out of Company B's hands by Scrap's departure from their lines immediately after supper. He was not seen to go. He slid away silently among the broken shadows of the tent. Company B reviled Muldoon. Scrap spent the night in a bugler's cape among a wilderness of brasses and reappeared the next morning at guard mount, deftly following the stately manoeuvres of the band. "'Talk about a dog's gratitude!' said the sergeant of Company B, bitterly, remembering Scrap's entertainment of the previous evening. "'I'm on to his game,' muttered old Muldoon. "'Don't you see, you fool? He don't belong to any one of us. He belongs to the crowd, to the regiment. That's what he's trying to show us. He's what that Frenchman down in F calls a... a mascot, and he jabbers he moves like a soldier.' The regiment's enthusiasm for Scrap, as voiced by Muldoon, was not extended to the commanding officer, who felt that the impressiveness of guard mount was detracted from by Scrap's deployments. Also, the tall lieutenant of Company A disliked the sensation of being accompanied in his social excursions among ladies who had driven out to band practice by a lawless yellow pup with a bitten ear. The lieutenant, good fellow at bottom, was yet a bit of a snob, and he would have preferred the colonel's foolish Newfoundland to the spirited but unregenerate scrap. But the privates and non-coms judged by the spirit, and bid for the favour of their favourite, and lost money at canteen on the next company to be distinguished as scrap's temporary entertainers. He was cordial, even demonstrative, but royally impartial, devoting a day to a company with a method that was military. He had personal friends, Muldoon for one, the cook for another, but there was no man in the regiment who could expect Scrap to run to his whistle. Yet, independent as he was of individuals, he obeyed regimental regulations like a soldier. He learned the guns and the bugles, what actions were signified by certain sounds. He was up in the morning with the roll of the drums. He was with every drill that was informal enough not to require the presence of the commanding officer, and during dress parade languished lamenting in Muldoon's tent. Barking furiously, he was the most enthusiastic spectator of target practice. He learned to find the straying balls when the regimental nine practiced during release, and betrayed a frantic desire to retrieve the shot that went crashing seaward from the sullen-mouthed cannon on the shore. More than once he made one of the company that crossed the lines at an unlawful hour to spend a night among the crooked ways of Monterey. The regiment was tiresome with tales of his tricks. The height of his highest leap was registered in the mess, and the number of rats that had died in his teeth were an ever-increasing score in the canteen. He was fairly a quiver with the mere excitement and curiosity of living. There was no spot in the camp too secure or too sacred for Scrap to penetrate. His invasions were without impertinence, but the regiment was his, and he deposited dead rats in the lieutenant's shoes as casually as he concealed bones in the French horn, and slumbered in the major's hat-box with the same equanimity with which he slept in Muldoon's jacket. The major evicted Scrap violently, but, being a good-natured man, said nothing to the colonel, who was not. But it happened, only a day after the episode of the hat-box, that the colonel entered his quarters to find the yellow mascot, fresh from a plunge in the surf and a roll in the dirt, reposing on his overcoat. To say that the colonel was angry would be weak. But, overwhelmed as he was, he managed to find words and deeds. Scrap fled with a sharp yelp as a boot-tree caught him just above the tail. His exit did not fail to attract attention in the company street. 
The men were uneasy, for the colonel was noticeably a man of action, as well as of temper. Their premonitions were fulfilled when at assembly the next morning an official announcement was read to the attentive regiment. The colonel, who was a strategist as well as a fighter, had considered the matter more calmly overnight. He was annoyed by the multiplicity of Scrap's appearances at times and places where he was officially a nuisance. He was more than annoyed by the local paper's recent reference to our crack yellow dog regiment, but he knew the strength of regimental sentiment concerning Scrap and the military superstition of the mascot, and he did not want to harrow the feelings of the summer camp by detailing a firing squad. Therefore he left a loophole for Scrap's escape alive. The announcement read, All dogs found in camp not wearing collars will be shot by order of the commanding officer. Now there were but two dogs in camp, and the colonels wore a collar. The regiment heard the order with consternation. "'That'll fix it,' said the colonel comfortably. "'Suppose someone gets a collar,' suggested the major, with a hint of hopefulness in his voice. "'I know my regiment,' said the colonel. "'There isn't enough money in it three days before pay to buy a button. "'They'll send him out tonight.' Immediately after drill, there was a council of war in Muldoon's tent, Muldoon holding Scrap between his knees. Scrap's scratched ear, which habitually stood cocked, flopped forlornly. His stumped tail drooped dismally. The atmosphere of anxiety oppressed his sensitive spirit. He desired to play, and Muldoon only sat and rolled his argumentative tongue. From this conference, those who had been present went about the business of the day, with a preternatural gloom that gradually permeated the regiment. The business of the day was varied, since the next day was to be a field day, with a review in the morning and cavalry manoeuvres in the afternoon. All day Scrap was conspicuous in every quarter of the camp, but at supper time the lieutenant of Company A noted his absence from his habitual place at the left of Muldoon in the men's mess tent. The lieutenant was annoyed by his own anxiety. "'Of course they'll get him out, sir,' he said to the Major. "'Of course,' the Major assented, with more confidence than he felt. The Colonel was fairly irritated in his uncertainty over it. Next morning the sentries, who had been most strictly enjoined to vigilant observation, reported that no one had left the camp that night, though a man on beat four must have failed in an extraordinary way to see a private crossing his line six feet in front of him. The muster failed to produce any rag-eared, stub-tailed, eager-eyed, collarless yellow cub, nor did the mess call raise his shrill bark in the vicinity of the cook's tent. The lieutenant felt disappointed. He thought that the regiment should at least have made some sort of demonstration in Scrap's defence. It seemed a poor return for such confidence and loyalty to be hustled out of the way on an official threat. It seemed to him the regiment was infernally light-headed, as, pipe-clay white and nickel-bright in the morning sun, it swung out of camp for the parade-ground, where the dog-carts and runabouts and automobiles were gathering from Del Monte and the cottages along the shore. The sight of the twelve companies moving across the field with the step of one warmed the cockles of the colonel's pride. The regiment came to parade-rest, and the band went swinging past their front, past their reviewing-stand, as it wheeled into place, the colonel, who had been speaking to the adjutant, who was the lieutenant of Company A, bit his sentence in the middle and glared at something that moved, glittering, at the heels of the drum major. The colonel turned bright red. His glass fell out of his eye socket. "'What the devil is the matter with that dog?' he whispered softly, and the adjutant, who had also seen and was suffocating, managed to articulate, "'Collars!' The colonel put his glass back in his eye. His shoulders shook. He coughed violently as he dressed the adjutant. Have that dog removed. No, let him alone. No, adjutant, bring him here. So the adjutant, biting his lip, motioned Muldoon to fall out. Tough old Muldoon tucked Scrap, struggling, squirming, glittering like a hardware shop, under his arm, and saluted his commander, while the review waited. The colonel was blinking through his glass and trying not to grin. Sergeant, how many collars has that dog got on? Thirteen, sir, said Muldoon. What for? said the colonel severely. 
One for each company, sir, and one for the band. End of chapter 15「Sixteen of the Junior Classics, Volume Eight, Animal and Nature Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by David Lawrence. The Junior Classics, Volume Eight, Animal and Nature Stories. Edited by William Patton. Chapter Sixteen, A Firefighter's Dog. By Arthur Quiller Couch. This is the story of a very distinguished member of the London Fire Brigade, the dog Chance. It proves that the fascinations of fires, and who that has witnessed a fire cannot own this fascination, extends even to the brute creation. In old Egypt, Herodotus tells us the cats used, on the occasion of a conflagration, to rush forth from their burning homes and then madly attempt to return again. And the Egyptians, who worshipped the animals, had to form a ring round to prevent their dashing past and sacrificing themselves to the flames. This may, however, be due to the cat's notorious love for home. In the case of the dog Chance, another hypothesis had to be searched for. The animal formed his first acquaintance with the brigade by following a fireman from a conflagration in Shoreditch, to the central station at Watling Street. Here, after he had been petted for some time by the men, his master came for him and took him home. But the dog quickly escaped and returned to the central station at the very first opportunity. He was carried back, returned, was carried back again, and again returned. At this point his master, like a mother whose son will go to sea, abandoned the struggle and allowed him to follow his own course. Henceforth, for years, he invariably went with the engine, sometimes upon the carriage itself, sometimes under the horse's legs, and always, when going uphill, running in advance and announcing by his bark the welcome news that the fire engine was at hand. Arrived at the fire, he would amuse himself with pulling burning logs of wood out of the flames with his mouth, firmly impressed that he was rendering the greatest service and clearly anxious to show the layman that he understood all about the business. Although he had his legs broken half a dozen times, he remained faithful to the profession he had so obstinately chosen. At last, having taken a more serious hurt than usual, he was being nursed by the fireman beside the hearth, when a call came. At the well-known sound of the engine turning out, the poor old dog made a last effort to climb upon it, and fell back, dead. He was stuffed and preserved at the station for some time, but even in death he was destined to prove the friend of the brigade, for, one of the engineers having committed suicide, the fireman determined to raffle him for the benefit of the widow, and such was his fame that he realized a hundred and twenty-three pounds, ten shillings, ninepence, or over six hundred and fifteen dollars in American money. End of chapter 16 A Firefighter's Dog Chapter 17 of the Junior Classics, Volume 8, Animal and Nature Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Junior Classics, Volume 8, Animal and Nature Stories by William Patton chapter 17 Plato the story of a cat by a s downs one day last summer a large handsome black cat walked gravely up one side of main street crossed and went halfway down the other he stopped at a house called the den went up the piazza steps and paused by an open window a lady inside saw and spoke to him, but without taking any notice, he put his paws on the seal, looked around the room as if wondering if it would suit him, 
and finally gazed into her face. After thinking a minute he went in, and from that hour took his place as an important member of the family. Civil to all, he gives his love only to the lady whom he first saw, and it is odd to see, as he lies by the fire, how he listens to all conversation, but raises his head only when she speaks, and drops it again when she has finished, with a pleased air. No other person in the house is so wise, for he alone never makes a mistake. The hours he selects for his exercise are the sunniest, the carpets he lies upon the softest, and he knows the moment he enters the room whether his friend will let him lie in her lap, or whether, because of her best gown, she will have none of him. No one at the den can tell how he came to be called Plato. It is a fact that he answers to the name, and when asked if so known before he came there, smiles wisely. What matters it, the smile says, how I was called, or where I came from, since I am Plato, and am here. He dislikes noise and entirely disapproves sweeping. A broom and dustpan fill him with anxiety and he seeks the soft cushions of the big lounge. But when these, in their turn, are beaten and tossed about, he retreats to the study table. However, as soon as he learned that once a week his favorite room was turned into chaos, he sought another refuge, and refuses to get up that day until noon. Many were the speculations as to Plato's Christmas present. All were satisfied with a rattan basket just large enough for him to lie in, with a light open canopy, cushions of cardinal chinks, and a cardinal satin bow to which was fastened a lovely card. It was set down before Plato, and although it is probable it was the first he had ever seen, he showed neither surprise nor curiosity, but looked at it loftily as if such a retreat should have been given him long ago. For could not any discerning person see he was accustomed to luxury? He stepped in carefully and curled himself gracefully upon the soft cushions, the glowing tints of which were becoming to his sable beauty. It was soon seen that Plato was very fond of his basket and was unwilling to share it in the smallest degree. When little Bessie put her doll in, just to see if Cardinal was becoming to her, he looked so stern and walked so fiercely toward them that Dolly's heart sank within her. And Bessie said, Please excuse us, Plato. If balls and toys were carelessly dropped there, he would push them out without delay. And if visitors took up the basket to examine it, he would fix his eyes upon them, thinking, Oh, yes, you would pick pockets or steal the spoons if I did not watch you. As his conduct can never be predicted, great was the curiosity when one cold afternoon he was noticed walking up the avenue while a miserable yellow kitten dragged herself after him. She was so thin you could count her bones, and she had been so pulled and kicked that there seemed to be nothing of her but length and dirt. When Lord Plato chooses, he enters the front doors, but as he waits no man's pleasure unless it pleases him first, he has a way of getting in on his own account. Upon one of the shed doors is an old-fashioned latch, which by jumping he can reach and lift with his paw. Having opened the door, he pushed his poor yellow straggler in and followed himself. She lay down at once on the floor, and Plato began washing her with his rough tongue, while the lookers-on assisted his hospitality by bringing a saucer of milk. While she ate, Plato rested, 
looking as pleased as if he were her mother, at her enjoyment. The luncheon finished, the washing was resumed, and as the waif was now able to help, she soon looked more respectable. But Plato had not finished his work of mercy. He looked at the door leading to the parlor, then at her, and finally bent down gently to her little torn ears, as if whispering, but she would not move. Perhaps in all her wretched life she had never been so comfortable, and believed in letting well enough alone. Reason and persuasion alike useless, Plato concluded to try force, and taking her by the back of the neck, carried her through the house, and dropped her close to his dainty cherished basket. Then he appeared a little uncertain what to do. The basket was nice and warm. He was tired and cold. It had been a present to him. The street wanderer was dirty still, and the rug would be a softer bed than she had ever known. Were these his thoughts? And was it selfishness he conquered when at last he lifted the shivering homeless creature into his own beautiful nest? End of chapter 17 Recording by Sharon Kilmer, Rio Medina, Texas. Chapter 18 of the Junior Classics, Volume 8, Animal and Nature Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Thompson The Junior Classics, Volume 8, Animal and Nature Stories, edited by William Patton Peter, a Cat of One Tail, by Charles Morley Peter, the admirable cat whose brief history I am about to relate, appeared in the world on a terrible winter's night. A fierce snowstorm was raging, the sleet was driving at a terrific rate through the air, and the streets were banked up with snowdrifts. All traffic had been stopped. The roar of London was hushed, and everyone who had the merest pretense of a fireside sought it on this memorable occasion. It was a wild night in the city, a wild night in the country, a wild night at sea, and certainly a most unpropitious night for the birth of a cat, an animal which is always associated with home and hearth. The fact remains that Peter was born on the night of one of the most terrible storms on record. Our chairs were drawn up to the fire, the tea things were on the table, and my mother was just about to try the strength of the brew, when Anne Tibbets, our faithful and well-tried maid of all work, bounced into the room without knocking at the door. Her cap was all awry, her hair was dishevelled, and she gasped for breath, as she addressed herself to my mother thus, in spasms, "'Please, ma'am, the cat has put her kittens in your bonnet.' Such a breach of discipline had never been known before in our prim household, where there was a place for everything, and everything had a place. My mother pushed her spectacles onto her forehead, and, looking severely at Anne, said, "'Which one, Anne, my summer bonnet or my winter bonnet?' The one with a fur lining, ma'am, and a most comfortable bonnet to live in, I'm sure, replied my mother sarcastically, as much as to say that she wished all cats had such a choice under the circumstances. Another cat would have chosen the one with the lace and the violets, out of sheer perverseness. But there, I knew I could depend on a cat which had been trained in my house. My mother poured out a cup of tea betraying no agitation as she dropped two lumps of sugar into the cup, her customary allowance, and helped herself to cream. In a minute or two, however, she took up her knitting, and I noticed that two stitches in succession were dropped, a sure sign that she was perturbed in spirit. Suddenly, my mother turned her eyes to the fire. "'How many, Anne?' she continued, addressing our faithful servant, who still remained standing at the table, awaiting her orders seven ma'am seven 
cried my mother. Seven? It's outrageous. Why, my bonnet wouldn't hold em. Three in the bonnet, ma'am, and two in your new muff. My new muff? cried my mother. I knew you were keeping something back. And the stitches dropped fast and furious. That's only five, Anne, she continued, looking up from her work. Where are the other two? I insist upon knowing. In the Alaska tail boa, ma'am, responded Anne, timidly. Slowly my mother's wrath evaporated, and her features settled down to their ordinary aspect of composure. Well, she said, it might have been worse. She might have put them in my silk dress. But there, it is evident that something must be done. I'm a kind woman, I hope, but I'm not going to be responsible for seven young and tender kittens. And Tibbets, England expects every woman to do her duty. All? asked Anne. Four, replied my mother. Now? asked Anne. The sooner the better, said my mother. At this moment, a sudden blast shook every window in the house, which seemed to be in momentary danger of a total collapse. Not fit to turn a dog out, murmured my mother. Not fit to turn a dog out. Ugh! How cold it is, and here am I condemning to death four poor little kittens on a night like this, to snatch them away from their warm mother, my muff, and Alaska tail, and dip them in a bucket of ice-cold water. And yet they must go, but Anne, I've an idea. Warm the water. They shall leave the world comfortably. They'll never know it. The faithful, unemotional Anne carried out her instructions. Peter was one of the three kittens which were born in my mother's fur-lined bonnet, and the white marks on his body always reminded me of the terrible snowstorm in the midst of which he sounded his first mew. After several weeks the liberty which our cat Cordelia had taken with my mother's finery was forgotten, and the household had settled down to its usual humdrum routine. Tibbets had made the new arrivals a bed in the little box-room, and the doctor declared that Mrs. Cordelia was doing as well as could be expected. Every morning we had to ask the usual question, How is Cordelia? Quite well, thank you. And the kittens? Also quite well. In due course, Anne brought the welcome news that the three kittens had opened their eyes, and the kid glove was at once detached from the knocker of the front door. It was on the morning after they had obtained their blessed sight that I was invited by Sibbitz to go downstairs and take my choice. I went down, but I could see nothing of the kittens. There was only Cordelia, with tail twisting, eyes aflame, and whiskers bristling, wheeling round and round a number of straw cases in which champagne had once been packed. Lo, one of the cases began to walk. The movement caught Cordelia's eye, and she knocked it over with her paw. A fluffy, chubby kitten, consisting of a black body with a patch of white on it, was revealed. The little one so captivated my fancy that I put him in my pocket, and without more ado took him upstairs, and publicly announced my determination to claim him as my property. "'What shall we name it?' asked my mother. "'Fizz,' said one, alluding to the empty champagne cases, a suggestion which was at once overruled as we were a temperate family, and little given to sparkling liquids. Pop was also voted against, not only as being vulgar, but as going to the other extreme, and leading people to suppose that we were extensively addicted to ginger ale. I think, my dears, as Peter was born on a... My mother's speech was interrupted by an exultant cock-a-doodle-doo. That horrid fowl again, exclaimed my mother. The cock in question was the property of a neighbour, and was a most annoying bird. Even my kitten was disturbed by the defiant note. Mew, said he, in a meek interrogative, as much as to say, What is that dreadful noise? Cock-a-doodle-doo, cried the bird again. Mew, replied the kitten, this time with a note of anger in his voice. Cock-a-doodle! screamed the bird, evidently in a violent temper. Mew, said the kitten again, in a tone of remonstrance. 
The remaining syllable of his war cry and the kitten's reply were cut short by my mother, who put her fingers to her ears and said, And the cock crowed thrice. My dears, I have it. What, mother? We'll call him Peter, cried the family. Peter Gray? Peter Simple? Peter the Great? No, replied my mother with a humorous twinkle. Peter the Apostle, pointing to the family Bible, which was always kept on a little occasional table in a corner of the sitting room. And let Peter be a living warning against fibbing, my dears, whether on a small scale or a large one. A bowl of water was then placed on the table, and having sprinkled a shower upon his devoted back, I, as his proprietor, looking at him closely, cried, Arise, Peter, obey thy master. In the middle of my exhortations, however, Cordelia jumped on the table, took little Peter by the scruff of his neck, and carried him back to the nursery. The day came when I put Peter into the pocket of my overcoat, and took him away to his new home. I had the greatest confidence in him, being a firm believer in the doctrine of heredity. His father I never knew, but his grandfather bore a great reputation for courage, as was indicated on his tombstone, the inscription on which ran as follows. Here lies Lear, aged about eight years, a tomcat killed in single combat with Tom the Templar, whilst defending his hearth and home. England expects every cat to do his duty. His mother Cordelia was of an affectionate nature, caring little for the chase, indifferent to birds except sparrows, temperate to the matter of fish, timid of dogs, a kind mother, and had never been known to scratch a child. I believed then that there was every possibility of Peter's inheriting the admirable qualities of his relatives. The world into which he was introduced contained a large assortment of curios, which I had bought in many a sales-room, such as bits of old oak, bits of armour, bits of china, bits of tapestry, and innumerable odds and ends which had taken my fancy. Picture, then, Peter drinking his milk from a crown derby dish, which I had placed in a corner between the toes of a gentleman's skeleton, whom time had stained a tobacco brown. The crown derby dish and the skeleton were, like the rest of my furniture, bargains. At this period of his life Peter resembled a series of irregular circles, such as a geometrician might have made in an absent moment. Two round eyes, one round head, one round body. I regarded him much as a young mother would her first baby, for he was my first pet. I watched him, lest he should get into danger. I conversed with him in a strange jargon which I called cat's language. I played with him constantly, and introduced him to a black hole behind the skeleton's left heel, which was supposed to be the home of mice. He kept a close watch on the black hole, and one day, which is never to be forgotten, he caught his first mouse. It was a very little one, but it clung to Peter's nose and made it bleed. Regardless of the pain, Peter marched up to me, tail in air, and laid the half-dead mouse at my feet, with a look in his eyes which said plainly enough, Shades of Caesar, I claim a triumph, master. He returned to the black hole again, and mewed piteously for more. Peter was very green, as you will understand, but he soon discovered that mewing kept the mice away, and having taken the lesson to heart, preserved silence for the future. The mouse hunts occupied but a small portion of Peter's time. He was full of queer pranks, which youth and high spirits suggested to him. He took a delight in tumbling down the stairs. He hid himself in the mouth of a lion whose head was one of my chief treasures. He tilted against a dragon candlestick like a young St. George. He burnt his budding whiskers in an attempt to discover the source of the flame in the wick of the candle. He became, too, a great connoisseur of vases, ornaments, and pictures, sitting before them and examining them for an hour at a time. He was also very much given to voyages of discovery, dark continents having a peculiar fascination for him. Even the lion's mouth had no terror for him. I once produced him from the interior of a brand-new top hat 
like a conjurer an omelette again we were very much surprised at breakfast one morning to see peter walk out of a rabbit pie in which he had secreted himself i used to let my canary fly about the room and peter chased him the canary flew to an old helmet on a shelf and thus baffled peter the canary seemed to know this for when peter was in the room he always flew to the helmet and sang in peace if he perched elsewhere there was a chase the linnet's cage i placed on the window sill in sunny weather and peter took great interest in him he could not see the musician but he heard the music and tried every means he knew to discover its source at last he peeped through a little hole at the back of the cage and when he saw the bird he was quite satisfied and made no attempt to disturb it in the matter of eating and drinking peter was inclined to vegetarianism being fond of beetroot and cabbage but he soon took to carnal habits always liking his food to be divided into three portions consisting of greens potatoes and meat in addition to such food as we gave him he by no means despised any delicacies he could discover on his own account for instance he cleaned out a pot of glycerin having tilted the lid up he pulled out the pins from a pincushion but was saved in time he was curious about a powder box and came mewing downstairs a peter in white he did not despise the birds out of a hat he lost his temper when he saw his rival in the looking-glass and was beside himself with rage when the glass swung round and he saw only a plain board his most curious experience was his first glimpse of the moon which he saw from our bit of back garden he was rooted to the ground with wonder at the amazing sight and we called him in vain the only reply was a melancholy love-stricken mew which went to my heart so peter rejoiced in the days of his youth and there was no end to his frolics but do not think for a moment that his education was neglected especially in the invaluable matters of manners and deportment both of which are so essential to advancement in life i taught him to sit at table to enter a room with grace and to leave it with dignity indeed i spared no trouble and peter became as rigorous as a chesterfield in the proper observance of all such matters i can give you no better example of peter's extensive knowledge of what was right and wrong in the ceremonial side of life than by telling you that when he felt an irrepressible sneeze forming he trotted out of the room and sneezed outside when peter played too he played gently and did not disturb his elders by obtrusive attentions he never required to be told twice to do a thing once was enough for peter then again in the matter of breakages he was as virtuous a kitten as ever lived i had thirty precious blue china vases on my sideboard and through this fragile maze peter always wound in and out without moving a vase his virtues in this respect were well known to my servants who never accused peter of breaking the milk jug or the cups and saucers i can assure you like the best of human beings he had his faults but upon these it would be impertinent to touch more than lightly peter was partial to fridays because fridays were devoted to cleaning up if you have ever watched a woman washing the kitchen floor you will have noticed that she completes one patch before she proceeds with the next as if she took pride in each patch regarding it as a picture it was peter's delight to sit and watch this domestic operation and no sooner was the woman's back turned toward a fresh portion of her territory than peter ran all over the freshly washed patch and impressed it with the seal of his paws just as an explorer would indicate a great annexation by a series of flags that was a mere frolic it was about this time that i discovered peter's power as a performing cat i tied a hare's foot to a piece of string and dangled it before peter's eyes i hid the hare's foot in strange places i flung it downstairs i threw it upstairs the hare's foot never failed to attract him we used to roll on the floor together we played hide and seek together i noticed that he had a habit of lying on his back with his tail out his head back and his paws crossed 
By degrees I taught him to assume this attitude at the word of command, so that when I said, Die, Peter, Peter turned on his back and became rigid until he received permission to live again. I also taught him to talk in muse at the word of command. I hear some genial critic exclaim that this cannot be true. I decline to argue with any critic that ever lived, and repeat fearlessly and in measured terms that Peter talked to me. Of course he would not drop into conversation with the first person who bade him good morning, but I assert again that Peter and I held many conversations together by means of the mew, used with a score of inflections, often delicately shaded, each of which conveyed its meaning to me. Peter took to reading, too, quite easily, and sat up with eyeglasses on his nose and a paper between his paws. It was, as you may well imagine, a red-letter day with me when Peter said his prayers for the first time, and I was better pleased when he put his little paws up and lifted his eyes up to the ceiling than with any other of his accomplishments, though they were more appreciated by unthinking friends. It was all very well to place a mouse at my feet and thus play to the gallery, but I felt that Peter's thirst for applause might be his ruin. When the summer came and the London pavements began to quake with heat, I determined to fly to the country. As delights are doubled when shared with those we care for, I determined to take Peter with me, so I packed him up in a specially constructed travelling saloon of his own, to wit, a flannel-lined basket, containing all the necessary comforts for the journey, such as air-holes and feeding bottles, and off we started in the highest of spirits. Peter found a new world open to him, and the thousand and one beauties of the country fascinated us both. We were the guests of a burly farmer, who lived in a queer old house, half timber and half brick, with low-ceilinged rooms. The general living room was the capacious kitchen, which looked mighty picturesque. Oak panels ran halfway up the ceiling. The pots and pans were ranged neatly in an open cupboard, pleasantly suggestive of good fare and plenty of it. There were flowers in red pots in the windows, and my bedroom was a picture of coolness and cleanliness. Amid these pleasant surroundings, Peter soon made himself very happy, and became a great friend of a cat called Jack, who took him under his charge and showed him the ways of the country. Jack was a favourite on the farm. He was certainly given to roving, and did not always come home to tea. As a mouser, he had few equals in the countryside, and one evening, when we were telling stories by the fireside, the farmer told me that Jack had dispatched no less than four hundred mice from one hayrick. Jack was a disciple of Isaac Walton. He would crouch on a mossy knoll by the edge of the river, and sometimes was successful in capturing a small trout. The farmer was himself a great fisherman. Jack was a study, while the preparations were in progress, and, all intent, would follow close at his master's heels. He would crouch among the rushes whilst the tackle was being adjusted, and anxiously scan the water as the fly drifted along the surface. He took a keen delight in the sport, and when the fish was negotiating the bait, he always purred loudly in anticipation of the feast in prospect. The trout landed and the line recast. He would seize his prey, and with stealthy gait slink off with his prize, leaving the old farmer to discover his loss when he might. Together, Jack and Peter roamed over the meadowlands, and the poultry run was an object of great interest to them. Together they fought the rats, and together they would lie in wait for the thrush and the blackbird. I am happy to say in vain. The farmer told me that in his youth Jack once took up his residence in the hollow of an old oak, where he lived on the furred and feathered game. At last he returned home. For hours he wandered about his old home, fearful of discovery, now crouching among the flower beds, and now flying in terror at the sound of the hall clock. At last he ventured into the kitchen, entering the window, and creeping to the kitchen hearth, where he dozed off to the music of the cricket, to be welcomed by another prodigal son. Alas, these delights were cut short, for Peter and I were soon compelled to pack up our traps and proceed to the seaside for professional purposes. Peter was not fond of the sea, 
when I took him out yachting, he was compelled to call for the steward. And one day, when exploring the rocks at low water, gazing with rapture at his own charming face, as it was reflected in the glassy surface of a deep pool, an inquiring young lobster nipped his tail, and the shore rang with piteous calls for help. Peter has never cared for the sea since then, and so deeply was the disaster impressed upon him that I have known him reject a choice bit of meat which happened to have a few grains of salt on it. It wafted him back to the ocean, the lobster, and the steward. What powers of imagination were Peter's? As these memoirs cover a period of seven or eight years, and as space is limited, my readers will kindly consent to take a seat on the convenient carpet of the magician and be wafted gently to the next station on the road without further question. This is a pleasant byway in suburban London, greatly frequented by organ grinders, travelling bears, German bounds, and peripatetic white mice. This road is always associated in my mind with the mysterious disappearance of Peter. We had often laughed at the odd old lady who lived two doors higher up, for the anxiety which she displayed when any of her pets were missing. It was our turn now. This same old lady was very fond of her cats, and had nine of them at the time I am writing of. Every morning, when the weather was warm, she and her cats would come out and unconsciously form a succession of tableaus for our amusement. A rug was spread out under the pear tree in the middle of the tiny lawn. A great basket chair was placed in the middle of this rug. And these preparations having been made, the old lady, who was very stout, and always wore a monster poke bonnet and a shapeless black silk dress, came out, followed by her nine cats, and took possession of the basket chair. A little maid then appeared with a tray, on which were nine little blue china saucers and a jug of milk. The nine little saucers were ranged in a semicircle and filled with milk, whereupon the old lady cried out, Who says breakfast, dearies? Who says breakfast? Breakfast! This invitation was immediately responded to by the nine cats. When they had done, the old lady cried, Who says washy, dearies? Washy! 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 Whereupon the nine cats sat on their haunches and proceeded to make their toilets. The requirements of cleanliness having been satisfied, and the nine basins having been cleaned away by the little maid, the old lady shouted out, Who says play, dearest? Play, 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 holding out her arms and calling out, Dido dums, Dido dums, come here, dearie, when a fine Persian cat jumped on her right shoulder. Now, diddles, doddles, diddles, doddles, and another Persian cat jumped on to her left shoulder. Tootsie Wootsie, she called once more, and a black cat scrambled up to the crown of the poke bonnet, and one by one they were summoned by some endearing diminutive, until the nine cats had taken possession of every possible coin of vantage which was offered by the old lady's capacious person. There they sat, waving their tails to and fro, evidently very pleased by their mistress's little attentions. Mrs. Mee was not very popular in the neighbourhood, except with the milkman and the butcher. The cat's meat man, indeed, who supplied various families in our road, positively hated her, so I gathered from our servant, and had been heard to say sotto voce, in unguarded moments, Ha ha, I'll be revenged. It was not unnatural, as the cats were fed on mutton cutlets and fresh milk, and cat's meat was at a discount. About three weeks before Peter disappeared, Mrs. Mee, in the short space of three or four days, had lost no less than five cats by a violent death, and five little graves had been dug, marked by five little tombstones, and the five dead cats had been laid in their last resting places by the hands of the old lady herself. A funeral is not generally amusing, but I could not restrain a smile when I saw my eccentric old neighbour follow the remains of her dead pets, which were reverently carried on the tea-tray by the little serving-maid, the old lady herself leading the way, ringing a muffled peal with the dinner-bell, the remaining cats bringing up the rear, pondering over the fate of their dead comrades. It happened that three of these unfortunate victims had been found on my doorstep. I felt very angry with the old lady, 
who blamed me for the destruction of her pets, adducing the fact that they were found dying on my doorsteps as proof conclusive. One morning I received an anonymous postcard. Although it bore the Charing Cross postmark, I felt sure it came from the old lady. It read as follows. The Assyrian came down like a wolf on the fold. This was the last straw, for I felt that as regard the old lady's cats, I had behaved in a sympathetic and neighbourly spirit. I remembered this postcard, because the same afternoon that it came, Peter disappeared, and I began to fear that he had yielded to the temptation of a poisoned pig's foot, which had been found in my garden stripped of its flesh. This was a delicacy which Peter had never been able to resist, though why he should have preferred it to the choice foods that were daily piled upon his plate, I cannot for the life of me say. We searched the neighbourhood in vain, and at last I determined to advertise. Accordingly, I addressed an advertisement to my favourite paper. It ran as follows. Come back, Peter. Lost, stolen, strayed, or poisoned, a white and black cat called Peter, who left his friends at blank on Monday afternoon last. Round his neck he wore a blue ribbon with the word Peter embroidered upon it in red silk. Before retiring to rest, he always says his prayers. Dead or alive, a reward of two pounds is offered to anyone who will restore him to his mourning friends. I little knew what I was bringing on my devoted head. I had been troubled enough before with dying cats, but now they were all alive. Cats were brought to me in baskets, in boxes, in arms. Manx cats, and cats whose tails were missing for other than hereditary reasons. Lame cats, blind cats, cats with one eye, and cats who squinted. Never before had I seen such an extraordinary collection. My whole time was now taken up in interviewing callers with cats. If the boys were bad before, they were a thousand times worse now. Here is one example out of a score. He was a boy known as Pop, who carried the laundry baskets. Have you found your cat yet? No, we haven't. Did you say it was a yellow one? No, I didn't. What did I say, Hop? Continued Pop, triumphantly turning to a one-legged friend who swept a crossing close by. You said, Pop, as it was a tortoise, murmured the bashful Hop, who had sheltered himself behind Pop. A tortoise, that's it, a tortoise, and Hop and I's found it, sir. We've got it here. You're wrong. My cat's not a tortoise, I replied. Bless you, we know that, Governor, just as if we didn't know Peter. Ah, Peter was a cat as wants a lot of replacing, Peter does. But me and Hop's got a tortoise as, as is a winner, Governor. A heap better nor Peter. Poor old Peter, he's dead and gone. Be sure of that. This is a regular bad road. A prize winner, weren't he, Hoppy? They held up the prize winner, who was not a tortoise, and was mangy. Look here, my boys, you can take her away. Now, be off. Quick march. You don't want it, Governor? Just think again. Why, how will you get along without a cat? The mice is horrible in this ear road. Come, Governor, I'll tell you what I'll do. You shall have a bargain, said Pop. I insisted that the tortoise prize winner should be taken away, and the next day I stopped the advertisement and resigned myself to despair. A week after Peter had disappeared, I heard the voice of my friend Pop at the door. I say, mister, I've some news. Come along o' me. I think I found him. Real. A blue ribbon round his neck and says his prayers. Put on your hat and follow, follow, follow me. Mr. Pop led the way along the road and turned off to the right, and we walked up another road until we reached a large house which had been unoccupied for many months. The drains were up, and two or three workmen were busy. Pop at once introduced me as the gent was, was looking for his cat. Have you seen a cat with a blue ribbon round his neck? I asked them, very dubious as to the honesty of Pop's intention. Well, such a cat has been here for some days, replied the workman, to whom I had spoken. He used to come when we were getting our bit of dinner, but we never knowed but what it came from next door. You go upstairs to the first floor front, and you'll see a sight. On the top of the stairs was Peter, who knew me at once, and began to purr and rub himself against my legs in a most affectionate manner, as if to appease any outburst of wrath on my part. 
I felt too pleased to be angry and followed Peter into the empty room which was littered with paper and rubbish and the remains of forty or fifty mice lay strewn about the floor Peter looked up to me as if to say not a bad bag eh master in the corner of the room was a bit of sacking which Peter had used as a bed Pop explained to me that he had heard the men talking about the funny cat that came and dined with them every day This conversation induced him to search the house with the happy result that Peter was restored to the bosom of his sorrowing family and Pop gave up the laundry basket and invested the reward in a small private business of his own Peter and I have had many homes in London and in the country Together we have lived in flats in hotels in farmhouses and in lodgings for single gentlemen in Lodgings for single gentlemen. We have many strange experiences Which would occupy too much time to relate and I will therefore touch but lightly upon this period of Peter's career Peter being a gentlemanly cat never quarreled with ladies However hard they might be to please and let them gird at him as much as they would For did not that gracious animal when mrs. Nagsby was accusing him of stealing fowls say did he not arch his bonny back and purr against mrs. Nagsby's ankles and endeavor to appease her in her softer moods she did sometimes relax and even allowed Peter to sit by her side as she read the paper Peter was held responsible for every article that was lost in mrs. Nagsby's apartments and the amount of money I paid to that good lady for breakage in the course of six months would have furnished a small cottage mrs. Nagsby was a widow and the late lamented Nagsby had supported her by his performances on the euphonium This instrument was kept in a case in mrs. Nagsby's little room Which was on the ground floor back and looked on to a series of dingy walls Mrs. Nagsby used to polish up the euphonium every Saturday morning with a regularity which nothing prevented Did it not speak volumes for her affection for the late lamented? On one of these Saturdays it happened that a German band stopped at the front door Mrs. Nagsby could never resist the seductive power of brass music She rushed upstairs to the first floor front to listen to the performance Fate ordained it that mrs. Nagsby should leave the precious euphonium on the floor in her haste to hear the band Fate ordained it also that Peter should come downstairs at this particular moment and went his way to mrs. Nagsby's parlor Fate also had ordained it that a mouse which lived in a hole Behind mrs. Nagsby's easy chair should issue at this particular moment for a little breadcrumb expedition Mrs. Nagsby was a careful housekeeper and finding no crumbs about the mouse roamed into the silent highway Presented by the orifice of the euphonium It was natural enough that Peter should follow the mouse Unfortunately Peter's progress was stopped the girth of his body being too great to admit him and My door being open I at once rushed to the rescue and found Peter with his head in the depths of the euphonium and Making fierce struggles to vacate the position Mrs. Nagsby came downstairs and entered her parlor just as I succeeded in extricating Peter from the musical instrument fiercely was I reproached for Peter's escapade and humbly did I make his apologies little knowing the secret of the plight from which I had rescued him Having soothed my landlady She at length took up the euphonium and proceeded to apply her eye to the main orifice To see if Peter had damaged it handling the euphonium in the manner of a telescope I Was thinking of the reproaches in prospect when I was startled by a loud shriek to which the euphonium imparted a metallic vibration and mrs. Nagsby dropped the instrument on the floor the good lady herself following it with a thud a Wee mouse scuttled across her face Disappeared behind the easy chair and doubtless rejoined his anxious family Mrs. Nagsby recovered after her maid of all work and I burnt a few sheets of brown paper under her nostrils But I had great difficulty in making the peace in vain I pointed out that the responsibility did not remain with me or even with Peter We agreed after some debate that it was the German band Which was never afterwards patronized by mrs. Nagsby 
I got into further trouble with Mrs. Nagsby, owing to a greyhound which I had bought at a sale. I had no character with him, for he had no character. If Mrs. Nagsby had killed him with the meat hatchet, I would have held my peace, for never a day passed, but King Arthur took his name in vain. The first night I brought him home, Mrs. Nagsby gave me permission as a great favour to chain him to the kitchen table. In the morning two of the table legs had been mangled, and that is our reason why I called him King Arthur of the Round Table. The next night King Arthur was taken upstairs and attached to the leg of my washstand. I was awakened out of my beauty sleep by a horrible clamour, which caused me to think that the house had fallen in. I presumably realised that King Arthur had mistaken the water jug for a dragon. In any case, it was smashed to bits, and the noise brought Mrs. Nagsby to my door in anger. I should be sorry to say what King Arthur cost me in hard cash for breakages and legs of mutton. Poor Peter! Thou wast a saint when compared with that fiend on four legs. The denouement came at last, and it arose from King Arthur's fondness for the ladies. There was nothing remarkable in the appearance of the old lady who was Mrs. Nagby's favourite lodger, who had held the rooms above mine for three years. But the lady had a most beautiful sealskin jacket, trimmed with tails of sable. King Arthur had unluckily a feminine affection for furs, and I never dared to take him into any of the fashionable thoroughfares, as he had a way of following the ladies, not for their own dear sakes, but for the fur which they might happen to be wearing. Whether they were only tippets or dyed rabbit skins, it did not matter to King Arthur. Well, one unfortunate afternoon, I was leading my greyhound home. A few yards in front of us was Mrs. Nagby's first-floor lady, taking the sun in all the glories of her sealskin jacket and sable tails. To my horror, I dropped the chain in taking a matchbox out of my pocket, and before I could take any steps to prevent him, King Arthur was coursing Mrs. Nagsby's first-floor lodger at his highest rate of speed. King Arthur held on his course and literally took the old lady aback and began to tear those choice sable tippets asunder. Nor was the base creature content to rest at the sable tippets. Before I reached his victim, his mouth was full of sealskin. Let me pass on, merely saying that King Arthur was shot that night in the mews at the back of Mrs. Nagsby's, a victim to his own indiscretions. And now I come to the fatal catastrophe, which finally drove me and Peter from the shelter of Mrs. Nagsby's roof. That lady had a set of false teeth, which she was in the habit of depositing on her dressing table when she went to bed. I had learned this from Sarah, when that damsel was in a confidential mood. Peter, I think I have told you, slept in my room. One very warm night, Mrs. Nagsby left her door open, and her nightlight was burning as usual. I also slept with my door open, and Peter, being hot like the rest of us, left the room for a stroll, and visited Mrs. Nagsby's apartment. Presently he came back with Mrs. Nagsby's teeth between his own. At least I suppose so, for I found them on the hearthrug when I awoke. I was greatly amused, though a little puzzled to know how I could replace them. After some reflection, I went down to breakfast, placed the trophy in a saucer, and showed it to Sarah, who screamed, who traitorously ran up and informed her mistress. Mrs. Nagsby came down rampant, but, of course, speechless. I was thankful for this. But the violent woman, after spluttering spasmodically, caught sight of the mitting article in the saucer, and, lost to all sense of shame, replaced it in position, and poured forth a torrent of the most violent abuse. Peter and I left. End of chapter 18「Chapter 19 of the Junior Classics, Volume 8, Animal and Nature Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
Recording by Sheila Wood. The Junior Classics, Volume 8, Animal and Nature Stories, by William Patton. Chapter 19, Jeff the Inquisitive, by General Rush C. Hawkins. Among the gunboats doing duty on the inland waters of North Carolina in the early spring of 1862, which composed what Commodore Goldsboro designated his pasteboard fleet, was the Louisiana, commanded by Commander Alexander Murray, who was noted for his efficiency and good nature. His treatment of his crew made him one of the most popular officers in the whole fleet. He entered into all of their sports and sympathized with the discomforts of forecastle life. He was fond of animal pets and always welcomed the arrival of a new one. At the time of which I am writing, his ship carried quite a collection of tame birds and four-footed favorites. Among them was a singular little character known as Jeff. He was a perfectly black pig of the racer razorback order, which at that time were plentiful in the coast sections of the more southern of the slave-holding states. They were called racers because of their long legs, slender bodies, and great capacity for running, and razorbacks on account of the prominence of the spinal column. The origin of this particular species of the porcine tribe is unknown, but there is a tradition to the effect that their progenitors were a part of the drove that came to the coast of Florida with De Soto when he started on the march which ended with the discovery of the Mississippi River. History records the fact that a large number of animals were brought from Spain for food, and that a considerable number of them succeeded in getting away from the expedition soon after the landing was effected. Our particular specimen of this wandering tribe of natural marauders was captured by a boat's crew of the Louisiana in one of the swamps adjacent to Currituck Sound when he was a wee bit of an orphaned waif, not much larger than an ostrich egg. He was an ill-conditioned little mite that had probably been abandoned by a heartless mother, possibly while escaping from the prospective mess kettle of a Confederate picket. In those days, Confederate pickets were not very particular as to the quality or kind of food, and I have a suspicion that even a razorback would have been a welcome addition to their meal. When Jeff was brought on board, his pitiful condition excited the active sympathy of all, from the commander down to the smallest powder monkey and numerous were the suggestions made as to the course of treatment for the new patient. The doctor was consulted, and after a careful diagnosis, decided there was no organic disease. Want of parental care, want of nourishment and exposure were held responsible for Jeff's unfavorable condition. It was decided to put him on a light diet of milk, which proved an immediate success, for within 48 hours after his first meal, the patient became as lively as possible. As days and weeks went on, there appeared an improvement of appetite that was quite phenomenal, but no accumulation of flesh. His legs and body grew longer, and with this lengthening of parts there came a development of intellectual acuteness that was particularly surprising. He attached himself to each individual of the ship. He had no favorites, but was hail fellow well met with all. He developed all the playful qualities of a puppy, and reasoned out a number of problems in his own way. His particular admirers declared that he learned the meaning of the different whistles of the boatswain, that he knew when the meal pennant was hoisted to the peak, could tell when the crew was beat to quarters for drill, and often proved the correctness of this knowledge by scampering off to take his place by one particular gun division which seemed to have taken his fancy. I can testify personally to only one item in the schedule of his intellectual achievements. It is a custom in the Navy for the commander of a ship to receive any officer of rank of either branch of the service in the gangway of the ship. In this act of courtesy he is always accompanied by the officer of the deck and often by others that may happen to be at hand. After the advent of Jeff, whenever I went on board the Louisiana, he was always at the gangway and seemingly was deeply interested in the event. It may be said of him generally that he was overflowing with spirits, and took an active interest in all the daily routine work of his ship. 
He had a most pertinacious way of poking his nose into all sorts of affairs, not at all after the manner of the usual pig, but more like a village gossip who wants to know about everything that is going on in the neighborhood. In the gradual development of Jeff's character, it was discovered that he had none of the usual well-known traits of the pig. He was more like a petted and pampered dog, was playful, good-natured, and expressed pleasure, pain, anger, and desire with various squeals and grunts, delivered with a variety of intonations that were very easily interpreted. He was never so happy as when in the lap of one of the sailors having his back stroked. His pleasure upon those occasions was evinced by the emission of frequent good-natured grunts and looking up into the face of the friendly stroker. When on shore, he followed his favorites like a dog, and was never known to root. Except in speech and appearance, he was the counterpart of a happy, good-natured, and well-cared-for household dog, possibly, however, rather more intelligent than the average canine pet. The 4th of July, 1862, was a gala day at Roanoke Island. The camps of the island and the vessels in the harbor were in holiday attire, Colors were flying, bands playing, drums beating. Patriotic steam was up to high pressure. The good old day, so dear to the hearts of Americans, was made more glorious by the exchange of camp hospitalities and an indulgence in such simple hilarity as the occasion seemed to require. But Jeff was not forgotten. Early in the morning he was bathed and scrubbed, more than to his heart's content, and then patriotically decorated. In his right ear was a red ribbon, in his left a white one, around his neck another of blue. Thus adorned, he was brought on shore to pay me a visit, and as he came through my door he appeared to be filled with the pride of patriotism and a realization of the greatness of the occasion. His reward for this unusual demonstration was instantaneous and consisted of some apples and a toothsome dessert of sugar. Afterward, he made the round of the camps with a special escort of warrant officers and devoted Jack Tars. During this triumphant march over the island, an incident occurred which developed the slumbering instinct of the swamp racer. In a second, as it were, and seemingly without cause, Jeff was seen to move off at a tremendous pace at right angles with the line of march. He was seen after he had run a few yards to make a great jump, and then remain in his tracks. The pursuing party found him actively engaged in demolishing a moccasin, which he had crushed by jumping and landing with his feet upon its head and back. Hogs of this particular kind are famous snake killers. A big rattler or a garter snake is all the same to them. They advance to the attack with the greatest impetuosity, and a feast upon snake is the usual reward of exceptional bravery. Jeff was a confirmed lover of good eating, and in time paid the usual penalty for overindulgence of his very piggish appetite. While the meal pennant was up, it was his habit to go from one forecastle mess to another, and to insist upon having rather more than his share of the choice morsels from each. In a short time he came to the repair shop, very much the worse for wear, with an impaired digestion and a cuticle that showed unmistakable evidence of scurvy. For the first, he was put upon short rations. For the second, sand baths on shore were prescribed. Under this treatment, poor Jeff lost all his buoyancy of spirits and his habitual friskiness, and became sad and dejected, but bore his troubles with patience. He took to the sand baths at once, and gave forth many disgruntled grunts when lifted out of them. The last time I saw Jeff in 1862, he was buried up to his ears in the cool sands of the Roanoke Island shore, with eyes upturned and looking like a very sad pig. But I fear none the wiser for his offenses against the rights of a well-regulated digestion. End of chapter 19. Recording by Sheila Wood. Chapter 20 of The Junior Classics, Volume 8, Animal and Nature Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bill Mosley. The Junior Classics, Volume 8. Animal and Nature Stories by William Patton. Chapter 20. The Impudent Guinea Pig by Charles F. Lummis. No other creature is so absolutely graceful as a rattlesnake, and none more gentle in intention. It is only against imposition that he protests. Our forefathers had learned a not unworthy lesson from their contact with nature in the New World when they put upon the first flag of the colonies a rattlesnake with the Latin legend Nemo me impune lecesset. No one wounds me with impunity. The flag of independence, however, only half told the real meaning of its emblem, the warning and not the self-restraint. There is a device, to my notion much more expressive, a rattlesnake rampant with the Spanish motto Ni huyes ni persigues. Thou needest not flee, but thou must not pursue. Or, in other words, I impose upon no one, no one must impose upon me. That is the real meaning of the rattlesnake, as any one can testify who knows him well. I chanced one day to enter the market in Los Angeles, and was surprised to find in one of the stalls a large collection of rattlesnakes, mostly brought in from the Mojave Desert. It was the first time I had ever seen the Quotalis sold in the stalls of a city market and as they went at the very reasonable figure of fifty cents apiece, I promptly purchased a pair. The dealer, with a noose of cord, lassoed the two I indicated, and, after some maneuvering, got them stowed in two large cigar boxes, which he tied up tightly. Reaching home safely with my new pets, I made them a roomy cage with wire screen in front and a sliding door on top, and transferred them to it without much difficulty. One was a strong, handsome fellow, five feet long, and with fifteen rattles. The other was about three feet in length, and had an ordinary string. The dealer told me they had eaten nothing in six months, and fancying it must be about lunchtime with them, I went downtown as soon as they were comfortably settled in their new quarters to get them food. A rattler, you know, will touch no dead meat, so I had to seek some living bait. After ransacking the markets, I found at last one young Cuye, the funny little South American generally miscalled among us the guinea pig. It was about half grown a very proper-sized morsel for the larger snake. My friends rattled a little as I opened the slide on the top of their cage, promptly closing it as I dropped the couille in. But, to my surprise, they paid no further attention to the newcomer, except to appear very much bored by him. And, stranger yet, the guinea pig showed no sign whatever of fear. I have so often watched birds, rabbits, dogs, horses, cattle, and other animals, up to the strongest and boldest in presence of the rattlesnake, and have always noted in them such unmistakable tokens of terror that it astonished me to find the pretty little white and tan creature so utterly unconcerned. In dropping from the door, he alighted squarely upon the backs of the snakes, whereupon they drew away uneasily, and he proceeded to look and sniff about, very much as you may have seen a rabbit do. I stood by the cage a long time, 
expecting the snakes to lose patience at last and enact a tragedy but nothing happened the cuyay scurried freely about the cage generally treading upon the irregular loops which covered most of the floor and the snakes neither rattled nor raised their heads at him for fully a week the three lodged together harmoniously sometimes on entering the room i found the guinea pig quietly reposing inside the careless coil of one of his strange bedfellows several times he was squatting upon them and more than once sitting squarely upon the head of one i began to wonder if there were anything constitutionally wrong with the snakes whether they deemed him too big or too foolish to be eaten i have never known but whatever the reason they made no motion toward eating him unfortunately he did not know how to return a favor one afternoon i was writing at my desk when a tremendous rattling behind me caused me to jump up and go to the cage the smaller snake was up in arms scurrying his rattle violently while the larger one was twisting uneasily about but not showing fight and what do you imagine ailed him why that miserable cuyé was perched upon him coolly nibbling that beautiful rattle of which only three or four beads were left in my righteous indignation i tore open the slide and snaked out the vandal as quickly as possible afterward it occurred to me to wonder that i had not been struck for nothing so alarms and angers a clotalus as a swift motion like that with which i had removed the cuyé the rattles never grew again and my best snake was spoiled why the cuyé should have cared to eat that mysterious husk which is so absolutely dry and flavorless i can explain only by adding that rats and mice have the same perverted taste and that it seems fairly a passion with them i have had many skins and rattles eaten up by them shortly after this episode one of our helpers in the office found a nest of mice and mindful of my hungry snakes i contrived to catch one mouse alive when the rattlers saw him through their screen they manifested such a lively interest as nothing had aroused in them before i cautiously opened the slide in the top of the cage held the mouse up by the tail and let him drop there was a fair illustration of the matchless agility of the crotalus when he cares to be quick the cage was just twelve inches high in the clear but before the falling mouse was halfway to the bottom there was an indescribable gray blur and i knew that the larger snake had hit him i have improved numerous chances to study the stroke of rattlesnake which is the swiftest motion made by any living creature but that particular case better than any other gave me a conception of its actual rapidity from the years of experience with the pneumatic shutter and photographing objects in rapid motion i should say the snake's head traversed that twelve or fifteen inches in something like the three hundredth part of a second the mouse fell upon the floor of the cage and it never moved again the snake knew perfectly that it had done its work for in place of recovering for another stroke as they invariably do after a failure he swallowed the mouse in the usual slow and painful fashion with as much apparent effort as a morsel four times as large should have given him End of chapter 20 Recording by Bill Mosley, Llano County, Texas, USA Chapter 21 of the Junior Classics, Volume 8, Animal and Nature Stories This is a LibriVox recording. 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Thompson. The Junior Classics, Volume 8, Animal and Nature Stories, edited by William Patton. Chapter 21, Hard to Hit, by Ernest Ingersoll. The spring weather we sometimes have in March reminds me, especially in the evening, of some days passed so high up in the Rocky Mountains that the summer was left down in the valley. One such spring-like evening we camped close to the timber limit, and I made my first trip into the region above, in which no trees grow. Having left the spruce woods quickly behind, there came stiff climbing up ledges of broken rocks, standing cliff-like, to bar the way to the summit. These surmounted, the way was clear, for from the northeast, the side I was on, this mountain presents a smooth, grassy slope to the very top. But the western side of the range is a series of rocky precipices, seamed and shattered. This is true of many mountains in Colorado. Just above the cliffs grew a number of dwarfed spruces, some of them with trunks six inches in diameter, yet lying flat along the ground, so that the gnarled and wind-pressed boughs were scarcely knee-high. They stood so closely together and were so stiff that I could not pass between them. But on the other hand, they were strong enough to bear my weight, so that I could walk over their tops when it was inconvenient to go around. Some small brown sparrows of two or three species lived there, and they were very talkative. Sharp metallic chirps were heard also, as the blue snowbird flitted about, showing the white feathers on either side of its tail, in scudding from one sheltering bush to another. Doubtless careful search would have discovered its home, snugly built of circularly laid grasses, and tucked deeply into some cosy hollow beside the root of a spruce. My pace now became slow, for in the thin air of a place twelve thousand feet above the sea level, climbing is exhausting work. But before long I came to the top, and stood on the verge of a crag that showed the crumbling action of water and frost. Gaping cracks seamed its face, and an enormous mass of fallen rock covered the broad slope at its foot. The very moment I arrived there, I heard a most lively squeaking going on, apparently just under the edge of the cliff, or in some of the cracks. It was an odd noise, something between a bark and a scream, and I could think of nothing but young hawks as the authors of it. So I set at work to find the nest, but my search was in vain, while the sharp squeaking seemed to multiply and to come from a dozen different quarters. By this time I had crawled down the rough face of the cliff and had reached the heaps of fallen rock. There I caught a glimpse of a little head with two black eyes, like a prairie dog's, peering out of a crevice, and I was just in time to see him open his small jaws and say, Shink! about as a rusty hinge would pronounce it. I whipped my revolver out of my belt and fired, but the little fellow dodged the bullet and was gone. Echoes rattled about among the rocks, wandered up and down the cannon, and hammered away at half a dozen stone walls before ceasing entirely. But when they had died away, not another sound was to be heard. Every little rascal had hid. So I sat down and waited, in about five minutes, a tiny, timid squeak broke the stillness, then a second a trifle louder, then one away under my feet in some subterranean passage. Hardly daring to breathe, I waited and watched. Finally, the chorus became as loud as before, and I caught sight of one of the singers, only about ten yards away, head and shoulders out of his hole, doubtless commenting to his neighbour in no complimentary way upon the strange intruder. Slowly lifting my pistol, I pulled the trigger. I was sure he had not seen me, yet a chip of rock flying from where he had stood was my only satisfaction. He had dodged again. I had seen enough, however, to know that the noisy colony was a community of little chief hares, Lagomis princeps, as they are named in the textbooks, or conies, as the silver miners call them. They are related to the woodchucks, as well as to the hare, and they live wholly at or above timberline, 
burrowing among the fallen and decomposing rocks which crown the summits of all the mountains. Not every peak by any means harbors conies. On the contrary, they are rather uncommon, and are so difficult to shoot that their skins are rare in museums, and their ways are little known to naturalists. During the middle of the day they are asleep and quiet, but in the evening and all night when the moon shines, they leave their rocky retreats and forage in the neighboring meadows, meeting the yellow-footed marmot and other neighbors. About the only enemies they have, I fancy, are the rattlesnake and weasel, excepting when a wildcat may pounce upon one or an owl swoop down and cut up some rambler. In the cold season, of course, their burrows are deep in snow, but then the little fellows are taking their long winter sleep and neither know nor care what the weather may be. An Indian will eat a coney, if he can catch it. He likes to use its fur also for braiding his locks into those long plaits which delight his soul. But the lively little rodents are pretty safe from all human foes, even one with a colt's revolver. End of chapter 21「Chapter Twenty Two of the Junior Classics, Volume Eight, Animal and Nature Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Greg Giordano. The Junior Classics, Volume Eight, Animal and Nature Stories, edited by William Patton. Chapter Twenty Two That Sly Old Woodchuck by William O. Stoddard. Dear me, dey's just one mo row o taters. It's a hoein de best I know. Julius leaned on his hoe for a moment. His bright black face was turned a little anxiously toward the front fence. Over in the road beyond that there stood a white boy of about his own size, and he was calling Quib quib come here dar he goes said julius dey a got him again he de best dog for woodchucks he is and i can't go long tell you what doe if i'd a ha taught he'd run away for i'd hold these taters i'd never have given him dat big bone de rascal he's just hid it away somewhere down among de cabbages and that was what quib had done with his precious bone but now his little lean yellow legs were carrying him rapidly down the road with half a dozen very noisy boys behind him pete pete corey where was it you saw that woodchuck finest woodchuck you ever saw in all your life was pete's reply he'll get away from us no he won't abe solover is watching for him that woodchuck is in the stone heap at the corner of old hamburger's pasture lot quib must have understood what mart peniman said for he did not halt for one second till he reached the bars that led into that very field. It was more than a quarter of a mile from the potato patch, but Quib had barked all the way, probably out of respect for the size and importance of the coming woodchuck. Mart Peniman and Abe Silover had started their great game on the way home from driving their cows. They had raced him across the pasture and along the fence, into the stone heap, and and then Abe had stayed to keep watch while Mart went after Julius Davis's dog. That meant also, of course, as large a crowd of boys as he could pick up in going and coming. It was a sad thing for Julius that his mother had set him at the potato patch, and that Quib had broken his contract with the bone. Quib was not usually so treacherous, but he happened to be on friendly terms with every boy of that hunting party. They had all helped him chase woodchucks at one time or another, and he had great confidence in them, but that was nothing at all to their confidence in him. The pasture bars did not stop a single one of the woodchuck hunters. All the boys went over while Quib was wriggling under, through a hole he knew, and there, almost right before them, was the stone heap. It was quite a large one, and it was thickly overgrown with wild raspberry vines. Abe, is he there? He didn't get away, did he? Are you sure he is in there? Quib, Quib, shouted Abe. Woodchucks, Quib, woodchucks. Right in here, find him. Quib was dancing around in a quiver of noisy excitement, for he had caught a sniff of something under the first bush he sprang into. How he did bark and yelp and scratch for about a minute. Poise, poise, what is all this? What do you want, this mine stone heap, eh? 
it was old hamburger himself climbing the fence and he looked longer and leaner just then and had more pipe in his mouth than the boys thought they had ever seen before the finest woodchuck you ever saw mr hamburger began cole thomas by way of an apology woodchuck that's it and so you puts a talk into mine stone heap and you steps onto mine grass and you knock over all of mine beautiful mullen stalks and mine thistles and mine skulk feet puff puff came the great clouds of smoke from the grim lips of the old german but it struck cole thomas that mr hamburger himself was on the watch for that woodchuck bow wow yow yup and mart shouted there he goes hey we'll get him screamed abe take him quib take him quib had started a woodchuck there was never a stone heap piled up that had room in it for both a dog and a woodchuck mr hamburger took the pipe out of his mouth which was a thing nobody could remember ever having seen him do those poise dat woodchuck de tog is a good one they will prick dar little necks just see how they run but de tog is a deepest runner of dem poise except de woodchuck mr hamburger did not run nobody had ever seen him do any such thing as that but he walked on across the pasture lot toward the deep ravine that cut through the side of the hill to the valley all that time poor julius had been hoeing away desperately upon the last row of his mother's potatoes and she had been smiling at him from the window she was anxious he should get through for she meant to send him to the village for a quarter of a pound of tea it was just as julius reached the last hill that the baby cried and when mrs davis returned to the window to say something about the store and the kind of tea she wanted all she could see of julius was the hoe lying beside that last hill if he hasn't finished them taters and run away she would have been proud of him if she could have seen how wonderfully fast he did run away and down the road he had seen quib and the other hunters days into de lot he exclaimed when he came to the bars dar's pete cory's old straw hat lyin by de stone heap must have been something wonderful or he'd never forgot his hat that was an old woodchuck of course or he would not have been so large and it may be he knew these boys as well as quib did if not it was his own fault for every one of them had chased him before and so had quib he knew every inch of that pasture lot and he knew the shortest way to the head of the deep ravine boys shouted abe Silover with all the breath he had boys he's going for the glen now we've got him the ravine was a rocky and wonderful place and all the boys were perfectly familiar with it and considered it the grandest playhouse in the world or at least in the vicinity of the village if quib once got the woodchuck penned up among those rocks they could play hide-and-seek for him till they should find him some city people that had a picnic there once had called it a glen and the name had stuck to it mainly because it was shorter than any other the boys could think of and beside that the schoolmaster of the district two years before who didn't suit the trustees had been named glen and so the word must have been all right some of the boys were near enough to see the woodchuck make for the two maples at the head of the ravine and bob hicks tumbled over andy thompson while he was shouting catch him quib after they got past those two maple trees there was no more fast running to be done down down deeper and rockier and rougher every rod of it the rugged chasm opened ahead of them and it was necessary for the boys to mind their steps it was a place where a woodchuck or a small dog could get around a good deal faster than any boy but they all followed quib in a way that would have scared their mothers if they had been there it's grand fun said mark penniman finest woodchuck you ever saw come on boys shouted abe Silover away ahead we'll get him this time abe had a way of being just the next boy behind the dog in any kind of chase and they all clambered after him in hot haste on went quib and even abe Silover could not see him more than half the time for he had an immense deal of dodging to do in and out among the rocks and trees and it was dreadfully shady at the bottom of that ravine the walls of rock where abe was rose more than sixty feet high on either side and the glen was only a few rods wide at the widest place he's hold him he's hold him come on we've got him now quib was scratching and yelping like an insane dog at the bottom of what looked like a great crack between two rocks in the left-hand side of the glen as you went down the crack was only an inch or so wide at the bottom and twisted a good deal as it went up for the rock was of the kind known as pudding stone there was a hole just there large enough for a woodchuck too small for a dog dig boys dig dig yourself said pete corey who's going to dig a rock i'd like to know let quib in anyhow he'll drive him out abe was prying at that hole with the dead branch of a tree and 
almost while he was speaking a great piece of the loose pudding stone fell off and came thumping down at his feet a cave boys a cave just look in quib did not wait for anybody to look in but bounded through the opening with a shrill yelp and abe silover squeezed after him pete corey felt a little nervous when he saw how dark it was but he followed abe and the other boys came on as fast as the width of the hole would let them that is they crept through one boy at a time what surprised them was that the moment they had crawled through that hole they could stand up straight where's the woodchuck asked bob hicks woodchuck why boys this is a regular cave replied abe quib's in here somewhere said mart peniman just hear him yelp hold on said cole thomas there's more light coming in we shall be able to see in a minute the fact was that it took a little time for their eyes to get accustomed to the small amount of light there was in that cave the cave itself was not very large it grew wider for about twenty feet from the hole they came in by and the floor which was covered with bits of rock sloped upward like the roof of a house only not quite so abruptly in the middle it was more than a rod wide then it grew narrower and steeper and darker with every step but they knew about where the upper end must be for they could hear quib barking there it's dark enough said andy come on boys shouted abe silover we'll have that woodchuck this time he's in this cave somewhere they were not very much afraid to keep a little way behind abe silover and in a few minutes they heard him say quib is he there have you got him quib barked and whined and the sound seemed to come from away above them come on boys i can see a streak of light it's like climbing up an old chimney quib's almost on him all that time while they were groping through that cave julius davis was looking around the pasture lot after them he would have been glad of a small glimpse of quib but all he had found as yet was mr hamburger who was standing under an old butternut tree and looking down at a round hollow place in the ground he was smoking very hard have you seen my dog asked julius hold still poi just you wait hi there goes dose woodstuck that's so he's coming right up out ob the hole and dar ain't no dog to foller him away went the woodchuck and julius gave him up for lost but mr hamburger smoked harder than ever and looked down at the hole hark hear dem it is de tog place mine eyes if they don't chase those woodchucks right under mine pasture lot julius could hear quib bark now away down there in the ground and he could not stand still on any one side of that hollow so he danced up and down on every side of it one minute two three minutes it was a dreadfully long time and then it was the voice of abe silover mixed with a long yelp from quib come on boys i've shoved him through i'm going right up after him nothing to pull away but some sods that's de tog exclaimed mr hamburger keep still black boy the rest of those footchucks is coming keep still nothing but some sods to pull away to make that hole large enough and then abe silover's curly head popped out and the rest of him followed grimy and dirty but in a great fever of excitement and fun after him climbed the other boys one by one mr hamburger did you see where that woodchuck went to de woodchuck i don't know him but de black poy haf run after de tog aunt he vas run so fast and never you saw var you little woodchucks come from eh you climb under mine pasture no use abe said mart peniman we've missed that woodchuck this time we found the cave though said pete corey it is through that he got away from us so many times i tell you vat said mr hamburger de next time you little woodchucks want to chase dat older woodchuck you put a peg over dis hole then you chase him round among de rocks and you will catch de tog and de woodchuck in the same peg that's what we'll do said abe silover but not today boys he was the finest woodchuck i ever saw but we missed him this time End of chapter 22。Chapter 23 of The Junior Classics, Volume 8 Animal and Nature Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bill Mosley. The Junior Classics, Volume 8, Animal and Nature Stories, by William Patton, Chapter 23, The Faithful Little Lizard, by Lieutenant Colonel W. Hill James. 
on the diggings near the avoca river the lizard's future master had as was the digger's custom come out of his hole or shaft at eleven o'clock for a short half-hour's rest between breakfast and the midday meal he threw himself down in a half-sitting posture and was dreamily smoking his pipe when from beneath a neighboring rock popped out a little lizard who eyed the stranger with inquisitive interest as quickly retiring to return again in a few minutes this was repeated several times the lizard's keen eyes always fixed on the face of the intruder presently the digger's foot was approached and evidently approved of for its warmth after a retreat to the rock a further advance was made this time to the knee of the stranger to whose face the two brilliant little eyes were still inquiringly directed. Before the half-hour's rest was over, the left arm of the smoker had been mounted, his neck rounded, and the right arm descended. The venturesome journey ended by the lizard squatting contentedly on the back of his new-found friend's right hand confidence had thus been established between the two but not to the extent of capture for on the gold seeker attempting to place his left hand over his new acquaintance he scuttled away to his rock with almost inconceivable quickness the digger's smoke over he returned to his work in the hole leaving his blouse where he had sat when the work of the day was finished, the tired gold-seeker mounted to the surface and, taking up his blouse, was about to march to his camp three miles away, when, to his great surprise, he discovered his little four-footed friend lying hidden in the fold of the garment. He carried him gently in the blouse to the camp, and there, with the usual courage and confidence of his race, the little reptile quickly adapted himself to his new surroundings in the digger's tent. He was carefully fed, kept warm at night, and soon began to like his new quarters with the gold seekers. In return for much affectionate attention, he was, in a few days, quite at home with all the party. On the walk to camp he had made his home in his master's serge blouse, running up the arm of the loose garment or round the full front above the tight waistband as fancy took him and enjoying the warmth of his master's body it was very interesting and amusing to see him poke his little head out between the buttons or through a buttonhole of the blouse at intervals to ask with glittering eye and jerky movement for an occasional fly from his master's hand caught on the shafts or cover of the cart. When the camp was pitched for the night, Master Lizard would employ himself by making the most inquisitive scrutiny and inspection of the immediate surroundings, within and without the tent. He made himself acquainted with every stone, tuft, stump, or hole, within what he considered his domain eventually retiring with the sun to the blanket on his master's bed where he invariably slept on one occasion during the darkness of the night he became extremely restless and ran about on the bed evidently with a view to awakening his protector who being a sound sleeper was not easily disturbed failing to attract attention he proceeded to run rapidly backwards and forwards over the sleeper's face making at the same time a low spitting noise like an angry cat by this means he at length roused his friend who gently pushed him away several times speaking soothingly to him in the hope of quieting the excited little animal but the lizard would not be soothed having attracted attention he continued his inexplicable movements with redoubled energy until at length his master convinced that something must be amiss got up struck a light 
and looked round the tent, the sharp eyes of the lizard following every movement with intense interest. As nothing unusual could be seen, the gold hunter retired once more, after pooh-poohing the lizard for his fears. Scarcely had he dropped off to sleep when he was again disturbed, and, losing patience at these repeated interruptions to his slumbers, he seized the lizard and threw him lightly across the tent. In this involuntary flight, the little creature unfortunately struck the tent pole with considerable force, and half of his tail was broken off, a matter of no great importance to a lizard, perhaps, but still a discouraging reward for a well-meant warning. Notwithstanding this, the little reptile returned to the bed, keeping close to his master, but he continued to be very restless and excited for the remainder of the night. When day dawned, preparations were begun for the day's march. The tents were struck, and the bedding was rolled up, ready to be placed on the rough digger's cart. Then the mystery was explained. In the twigs and ferns thrown underneath the scanty bedding, to keep it from the bare ground, a huge tiger snake with several young ones was discovered. This snake is of a deadly description, and is much feared by the colonists. Like all snakes, it gives forth a strong odor, which no doubt made the lizard aware of his enemy's presence, unless, perhaps, he saw it creep under the curtain of the tent. Of course, the snakes were killed at once. After this, our little friend, with half a tail, became a greater favorite than ever, because we recognized that he was protector as well as friend. End of chapter 23 Recording by Bill Mosley, Llano County, Texas, USA Chapter 24 of the Junior Classics, Volume 8, Animal and Nature Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Junior Classics, Volume 8, Animal and Nature Stories. Edited by William Patton. Chapter 24 Toby the Wise by General Rush C. Hawkins. The chief subject of this truthful history is a jet-black, middle-aged bird, commonly known in England as a rook, but nevertheless a notable specimen of the crow family. In his babyhood he was, in the language of the ancient chroniclers, grievously hurt and wounded full sore, and particularly so in the left wing. He was so badly disabled that he had to forego the pleasure of flying through the air and was obliged to content himself as best he could with trudging about on the rough surface of Mother Earth. In his sad plight, with the maimed wing dragging painfully along, he chanced to pass the window of a library belonging to and occupied by a charming old English gentleman, a perfect example of the old school, learned, benevolent, and very fond of animals and feathered pets. No one can tell what chance it was that brought the unhappy and wounded young rook to the window of this good man. But possibly it was a real inspiration on the part of the young bird. Toby was wet, weary, wounded, and hungry, and as he looked in upon the cheerful wood-fire and the kindly face of the master of the house, his longing expression was met by a raising of the window and an invitation to walk in to a breakfast of corn and meal that had been hastily prepared for him. He gazed and thought, and thought and gazed upon the joys within, and still he doubted. But finally appetite and curiosity got the better of his discretion, and, as he walked cautiously in, the window was closed behind him. So the wounded bird entered upon a new life. At first he was a little shy and cautious, and it took considerable time for him to convince himself that his protector was his friend. After a few weeks, however, he realized the value of his new position and consented to the establishment of intimate relations. In fact, 
Toby became so attached to his master that he was not happy out of his presence. During the first month of his captivity, his wounded wing was bound close to his body for the purpose of giving the fractured bone an opportunity to unite, and during most of that time he would walk by his master's side, cawing and looking up into his face, as if asking for recognition. When the wing got well, and his ability to fly was re-established, he would anticipate the direction of the promenades by flying in advance, from shrub to bush, alighting and awaiting the arrival of his master. The most singular part of Toby's domestication was his exclusive loyalty to a single person. He had but one intimate friend, and to him his loyalty was intense. He would tolerate the presence of other members of the household, but when strangers appeared, he was decidedly offish, and scolded until they disappeared. Three times a day Toby is decidedly funny, and goes through a comical performance. In his master's study there is a contrivance which, on a small scale, resembles the old New England well-pole. At one end, which rests upon the floor, Toby commences his ascent with a great flapping of wings and uproarious cawing. When he arrives at the upper end of the pole, some eight or nine feet from the floor, it falls and lands him upon a platform beside a plate containing his food. This climbing up the pole precedes each meal and takes place punctually at the same hour and minute of each day. In the spring of 1890, Toby was tempted from his loyalty and flew off with a marauding flock of his kind. He remained away all summer. He was missed, but not mourned, for his master felt certain he would return. And sure enough, one bleak cold morning in November, Toby was found looking longingly into the room where he had first seen his good master. The window was open, he walked in, and mounted his pole, and after him came a meek, modest, and timid young rook, more confiding than Toby, and differing from him in many other respects. He too was duly adopted, and was christened Jocko. He was easily domesticated, and soon became a part of the household of one of the finest old Bedfordshire manorial homes. With age, Toby has taken on quite an amount of dignity. He is neither so noisy nor so companionable as formerly, but is more staid and useful. One of his favorite resting places, where he enjoys his after-breakfast contemplations and his afternoon siestas, is among the branches of a fine old English oak, whose protecting shades in the far-off past were the scene of the stolen love-meetings of Amy Wentworth and the Duke of Monmouth. Neither of these knowing birds has been able to understand the mystery of a looking-glass. They spend many hours of patient investigation before a mirror in their master's room, but all to no purpose, for the puzzle seems to remain as great as ever. They usually walk directly up to it, and betray great surprise when they find two other rooks advancing to meet them. For a while they remain silent and motionless, looking at the strangers and waiting, apparently for some sign of recognition. Then they go through a considerable flapping of wings, and indulge in numerous caws, but after long waiting for an audible response, they give up the useless effort, only to return next day, as eager as ever to solve the mystery. The older bird and his admiring junior are perfectly contented with their home, and never leave it. They often look out from their perches upon wandering flocks of vagrant rooks, but are never tempted to new adventures. The old fellow is very wise. Like a fat old office-holder, he knows enough to appreciate a sinecure in which the rewards are liberal and the service nominal. His devoted follower never falters in his dutiful imitation of his benefactor. Toby proves by his actions that he appreciates the advantages of the situation, and, in his simple way, makes some return for the pleasures he enjoys. During a considerable portion of the pleasant days of the year, he is really the watchman upon the tower, ever on the lookout to give notice of the approach of visitors to his castle, 
and no one can intrude upon the premises under his self-appointed watchmanship without exciting vigorous cause, which are enthusiastically reinforced by those of his faithful subordinate. Aside from his affectionate devotion to his master, this duty of chief watchman of the castle is Toby's most substantial return for favors received. In a letter of last May, the master wrote, My two crows are sitting on chairs close to me, and cawing to me that it is time for me to let them out of the window, so I must obey. This quotation gives but a faint intimation of the exceptionally friendly relations existing between these devoted friends. Blessed are the birds that can inspire such affection in the heart of a noble old man, and doubly blessed is he who is the object of such loving appreciation. Long may they all live to enjoy the fullness of their mutual attachments. This brief sketch is not intended for an amusing story. It is only a narrative of facts, in support of an often repeated theory, viz., that the humblest creatures are worthy of our tender consideration, and, when properly treated, will make pleasing returns for the affection we may bestow upon them. End of chapter 24 Recording by Melora Chapter 25 of The Junior Classics, Volume 8, Animal and Nature Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Junior Classics, Volume 8, Animal and Nature Stories. Edited by William Patton. Chapter 25. Blackamoor by Ruth Landseer. Many will wonder how I managed to keep order in the schoolroom and give proper attention to the lessons with three baby woodchucks, a turtle, two squirrels, and a young crow about the place. My fellow teachers will be inclined to say that the children would have eyes and ears for nothing else. In point of fact, it made little difference after my pupils became accustomed to the sight and sound of these pets. Moreover, they were a source of endless pleasure, and, I think, profit, for I gave little talks upon the habits and history of all these creatures, and sought to inculcate sentiments of compassion and love toward all living things. This was my first school, however, and people wondered. The supervisor also wondered, and was skeptical. Several of the parents, who did not understand very well, complained to him that I kept a menagerie instead of a school. There were some, even, who did not wish to have their children taught natural history, because they came home and asked questions. They did not like it, and deemed it quite unnecessary. They desired to have their children attend strictly to their school studies. It came about, therefore, that at the end of the second term the position was given to another teacher and for one whole term my occupation was gone. Yet my former pupils lamented so openly and said so much at home that their small voices wrought a change of opinion, and at the beginning of the second year the school was given to me again. The teacher who had taken my place said, a little spitefully, on leaving, that I had spoiled the school for anyone else. She was a very worthy young lady, but one of those who scream at the sight of a spider, a mouse, or a harmless snake. Blackamoor came to school one morning, in July, head downward, in the hands of one of my larger boys, named Wigan Brown, who was a little inclined to thoughtless cruelty. On the part of children, indeed, cruelty is usually thoughtless. They are rarely cruel after they have been taught to think on the subject. Wiggin and his older brother had taken Blackamoor from a nest in the top of a hemlock tree. By this time the reader will have guessed that Blackamoor was the young crow which became one of our schoolhouse pets. At first we built a pen for him at the farther corner of the schoolyard, where we kept him until he could fly. After that he was released, to stay with us or depart. He chose to stay and during school hours usually sat on the ridge of the schoolhouse roof. At night he often accompanied me home, 
and lingered about the farmhouse or barns till school time the next day. At the recesses he swaggered and hopped about with the children at play, often cawing uproariously. If a dog or a cat approached during school hours, Blackamoor would cry, Harrr! from the roof, and drive the intruder away. If it was a person, he cried, Haw! quite sharply, on a different key. If another crow or large bird flew past, he turned up an eye and said, Haw! rather low. In fact, he kept us posted on all that was going on out of doors, for we soon came to know most of his signal cries. The boys would glance up from their books and smile when they heard him. Blackamore had certain highly reprehensible traits. He was thievish, and we were obliged to keep an eye on him, or he would steal all our lead pencils, pocket handkerchiefs, and other small objects. What he took he secreted, and was marvelously cunning in doing so. He fell finally into a difficulty with a gang of Italian laborers who were excavating for a new railroad line that passed within a quarter of a mile of the schoolhouse. There were fifty-five of these Italians, and they had their camp in a grove of pines within plain sight of us. My pupils were afraid of these swarthy men, for they jabbered fiercely in an unknown tongue, and each one was armed with a sheath-knife. On the whole, I thought it better that my boys should not go to their camp. But Blackamoor went there, and indeed became a constant visitor. There were probably tidbits to be secured about their cooking fires. For a time he nearly deserted the schoolhouse for the Italian camp in the Pines, or at least was flying back and forth a great deal, hawing and hawing. All appeared to go well for a while. Then one forenoon I heard loud shouts outside, and on going to the door saw a hatless Italian pursuing Blackamoor across the pasture below the house. He was a very active young man, and was filling the air with stones and cries. Blackamoor, however, was taking it all easily, flying low, but keeping out of reach. He had something in his beak. Catching sight of me in the doorway, the Italian stopped, but gesticulated eagerly, pointing to the crow, and he said much that I failed utterly to comprehend. I conjectured that Blackamoor had purloined something, and felt that I must keep him from going to the camp, but that was not easily accomplished. We tied him by the leg, but he tugged at the string till it was frayed off, or came untied, and flew away. But a crisis was at hand. The second morning afterward, an alarming commotion began, as I was hearing a class in mental arithmetic. The house was surrounded by excited Italians. Stones rattled on the roof. Angry shouts filled the air. It was a mob. The children were terrified, and I was sufficiently alarmed myself, for a pane of glass crashed and clubs banged against the sides of the house. Hastily locking the door, I peered out of the window. Certainly wild Indians could hardly have looked more savage than did those Italians, hurling stones and clubs at the house. Yet through it all I had a suspicion that the demonstration was directed at Blackamoor rather than against us, for I fancied that I had heard our bird say, Haw! a moment before the hubbub burst forth. Still, it was decidedly alarming while it lasted, and continued for a much longer time than was pleasant. I judged it more prudent to keep the door locked than to go forth to remonstrate. Finally, after a great bombardment, the outcries and racket subsided, and with a vast sense of relief I saw the Italians retiring across the pasture to their camp. As a matter of course, the children carried home terrible accounts of what had occurred and our small community whacked indignant over what was deemed an outrage by lawless foreigners. The suspicion, however, remained with me that Blackamoor was at the bottom of all the trouble. I had the boys catch him and make him fast again, this time with a small dog-chain which he could not bite off. He cawed vigorously, 
but we kept him at anchor for a week or more. And meanwhile, the Italian camp was moved to a point six miles farther along the line of the new railway. At a schoolhouse in the country, it is often difficult to get small repairs made. Early that season, the boys had broken a pane of glass in the low attic window at the front end of the house. I had been trying to get it replaced for two months, and now we had two panes broken. At last I bought new glass and a bit of putty, and with the aid of Wigan and another boy, set the panes myself one night after school. But while setting the attic pane, we made a singular discovery. In the low dark loft, just inside the hole of the broken pane, lay a heap of queer things which caused us first to stare and then to laugh. The like, I am sure, was never found in the loft of a New England schoolhouse before. I made a list. There were the much-soiled photograph of an Italian baby, three photographs of pretty Italian girls, four very villainous old pipes, many straws of macaroni, an old felt hat, a dirty stick of candy, five small silver coins, a harmonica, an odd sort of flute, the bonnet of an Italian baby, four soiled red bandanas, a black wallet containing about a dollar in silver, two tin cups, two pictures of peasants, two plugs of tobacco. These are but samples. All told, there were at least ninety articles. It was Blackamoor's hoard, and all the while we were overhauling it, he cawed and hawed in great glee. That night we talked it over and decided that restoration was our only proper course. The long-suffering Italians were now six miles away. But on Saturday we procured a pair of farm horses and a wagon with three seats for our journey of reparation. The purloined articles were put in a large basket, and we set up a perch in the wagon, to which Blackamoor was chained, in token of punishment. After this manner, six of us drove to the new camp. When we arrived, the gang was hard at work in a cutting, but when, one after another, they caught sight of our wagon, with Blackamoor atop, exclamations, not of a complimentary nature, burst forth all along the line. But I beckoned to their Irish boss, and after showing him our basket, and explaining the circumstances, asked him to allow each of the men to take what belonged to him. "'Ah, sure,' replied the foreman, with a broad grin. "'Here, all of you,' he shouted down the cutting. "'Come get your trinkets, what the crow stole.' Wonderingly, the gang gathered round the wagon. But when they saw the basket and what was in it, the liveliest expressions of satisfaction arose. Each seized his own. I had the foreman say to them how very sorry we were that our bad bird had given them so much trouble. Then followed, in response, as pretty a bit of politeness as I have ever witnessed. The Italians took off their hats and bowed all round. One of them then made a little speech, which the Irish boss translated, after his own fashion, somewhat like this. "'It's all right,' they say. "'You are most good.' They thank you with all their hearts. They are sorry you have had to come so far. You are a very, very kind signorina. The foreman grinned apologetically. They want to sing you a song, he said. I said that we should be delighted. Immediately four of them stepped forth together and sang. It was an Italian song, and had a refrain so plaintive that I often catch myself trying to hum it. "'Now, then, get back to your work, men,' shouted the boss. And so this odd little episode ended. Yet it was not wholly ended, either, for in October, as the gang tramped back along the roadbed of the railway, going home with all their packs and bundles, one of those who had sung came up to the schoolhouse and laid a little bouquet of frost flowers and red autumn leaves on the doorstep. Catching sight of me through the window, he nodded brightly, pointed to the bouquet, nodded again, then hurried on after his fellows. I went to the door, and when they saw me there, 
half a hundred old hats were raised and hands were waved in token of farewell i thought of our previous fears and of the hard things that had been said and was ashamed again the truth of that humane old proverb came home to me almost everybody is a good fellow if you treat him right and blackamoor a few days later blackamoor deserted us a large flock of his wild kindred was mustering in the vicinity for the autumn migration we concluded that he had joined his tribe and were not inconsolable end of chapter twenty five Recording by Melora. Chapter twenty six of the Junior Classics, Volume Eight Animal and Nature Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Chessie Joy. The Junior Classics, Volume Eight Animal and Nature Stories edited by william patton a parrot that had been trained to fire a cannon by sir samuel w baker there are no people who surpass the natives of india in the training of elephants or other wild animals for many ages the custom has prevailed among the native princes of that country for educating not only the elephant and the dog but the leopard and the falcon to assist them in the chase the Gaikwa of Baroda, during my sojourn in his state, most kindly furnished me with opportunities of witnessing the excellent training of his falcons, hunting leopards or cheetahs, and other animals. We were also allowed to inspect the immense collection of jewels belonging to the Gaikwa. These were in such numbers and variety that I quite lost my respect for diamonds and rubies, although one of the former had actually been purchased for $450,000. The gold and silver batteries of field guns were also exhibited. There were only four of these cannon, two of which were solid gold four-pounders, fitted with an internal tube of steel. The carriages were plated with gold, and the harness for the team of oxen is heavily ornamented with the same precious metal. Gold horns are fitted upon those of the oxen employed, and these animals are selected for their immense size and general perfection of appearance. The silver guns, carriages, limbers, harness, etc., were precisely similar. The most interesting artilleryman in His Highness's service was a small green parrot. This bird was one of many which had been trained to the various exercises of a field gun, and it was exhibited by its native tutor in our presence. A large table was placed in the arena where rhinoceroses, buffaloes, and rams had been recently struggling for victory in their various duels and a far more interesting exhibition was exchanged for the savage conflicts. Upon this table stood a model brass cannon about eight inches in length of barrel, and a caliber equal to a number twelve smooth-bore gun. The rammer and sponger lay by the side of the small field piece. About a dozen green parrots were spectators, who were allowed to remain on perches, while the best-trained gunner was to perform in public before at least three thousand spectators, the Gaikwa, and his ministers and friends, including ourselves, being seated in a raised structure similar to the grandstand of an English race course, which commanded the entire arena, the parrots being immediately beneath. The gunner was placed upon the table, and at once took its stand by the gun, and, in an attitude of attention, waited for orders from its native master. The word of command was given, and the parrot instantly seized the sponger in its beak, and inserting it within the muzzle without the slightest difficulty, vigorously moved it backwards and forwards, and then replaced it in its former position. The order was now given to load. A cartridge was laying on the table, which the bird immediately took within its beak, and dexterously inserted in the muzzle. It then seized the rammer, and with great determination of purpose and force, rammed the cartridge completely home, giving it several sharp taps when at the breech. The parrot replaced the rammer by the side of the sponger, and waited for further orders, standing erect close to the rear of the gun. The trainer poured a pinch of priming powder upon the touch hole, and lighted a small port fire. This he gave to the parrot, which received it in its beak at a right angle, and then stood by its gun waiting for the word. Fire! 
At that instant the parrot applied the match, and the report of the gun was so loud that most people started at the noise. But the pretty green gunner never flinched. The parrot stood by its gun quite unmoved. The trainer took the port fire, which it had never dropped from its beak, and gave an order to sponge the gun, which was immediately executed, the bird appearing to be quite delighted at its success. End of chapter 26「CHAPTER Twenty Seven of the Junior Classics, Volume Eight, Animal and Nature Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Junior Classics, Volume Eight, Animal and Nature Stories, by William Patton. Chapter Twenty Seven. THE SANDPIPER'S TRICK by Celia Thraxter One lovely afternoon in May I had been wandering up and down, through rocky gorges, by little swampy bits of ground, and on the tops of windy headlands, looking for flowers, and had found many. Large blue violets, the like of which you never saw, white violets, too, creamy and fragrant gentle little ustonians gay and dancing erythromiums and windflowers delicately tinted blue straw-color pink and purple i never found such in the mainland valleys the salt air of the sea deepens the colors of all flowers i stopped by a swamp which the recent rains had filled and turned to a little lake light green iris leaves cut the water like sharp and slender swords and in the low sunshine that streamed across threw long shadows over the shining surface some blackbirds were calling sweetly in a clump of bushes and song sparrows sang as if they had but one hour in which to crowd the whole raptures of the spring as i pressed through the budding bayberry bushes to reach some milk-white sprays of shad bush which grew by the waterside, I startled three curfews. They flew away, trailing their long legs and whistling fine and clear. I stood still to watch them out of sight. How full the air was of pleasant sounds! The very waves made a glad noise about the rocks, and the whole sea seemed to roar afar off, as if half asleep and murmuring in a kind of gentle dream. The flock of sheep was scattered here and there, all washed as white as snow by the plenteous rains, and nibbling the new grass eagerly, and from near and far came the tender and plaintive cries of the young lambs. Going on again I came to the edge of a little beach, and presently I was startled by the sound of such terror and distress that it went to my heart at once. In a moment a poor little sandpiper emerged from the bushes, dragging itself along in such a way that, had you seen it, you would have concluded that every bone in its body had been broken. Such a dilapidated bird! Its wings drooped and its legs hung, as if almost lifeless. It uttered continually a shrill cry of pain, and kept just out of the reach of my hand, fluttering hither and thither as if sore wounded and weary. At first I was amazed and cried out, Why, friend and gossip, what is the matter? And then stood watching it in mute dismay. Suddenly it flashed across me that this was only my sandpiper's way of concealing from me a nest, and I remembered reading about this little trick of hers in a book of natural history. The object was to make me follow her by pretending that she could not fly, and so lead me away from her treasure. So I stood perfectly still, lest I should tread on the precious habitation, and quietly observed my deceitful little friend. Her apparently desperate and hopeless condition grew so comical when I reflected that it was only affectation that i could not help laughing loud and long dear gossip i called to her 
pray don't give yourself so much unnecessary trouble you might know i wouldn't hurt you or your nest for the world you most absurd of birds as if she understood me and as if she could not bear being ridiculed up she rose at once strong and graceful and flew off with a full round clear note delicious to hear then i cautiously looked for the nest and found it quite close to my feet near the stem of a stunted bayberry bush mrs sandpiper had only drawn together a few bayberry leaves brown and glossy a little pale green lichen and a twig or two and that was a pretty enough house for her four eggs about as large as robins were within all laid evenly with the small ends together as in the tidy fashion of the sandpiper family no wonder i did not see them for they were pale green like the lichen with brown spots the color of the leaves and twigs and they seemed a part of the ground with its confusion of soft neutral tints i couldn't admire them enough but to relieve my little friend's anxiety i came very soon away and as i came i marveled much that so very small a head should contain such an amount of cunning end of chapter twenty seven recording by sharon kilmer rio medina texas chapter twenty eight of the junior classics volume eight animal and nature stories this is a LibriVox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. the junior classics volume eight animal and nature stories by william patton chapter twenty eight how did the canary do it by celia thaxter a little friend of mine who was going away for the winter asked me to take charge of one of her canaries till she returned in the spring the bird was a foreigner born and bred in faya and brought across the water in his youth a gray-green and golden little creature whose name was willie I gladly consented, and one day Willie was brought over from Jamaica Plains, a distance of ten miles, and deposited in my parlor. His cage was closely covered with brown paper during the journey, and he came in the cars by the roundabout way of Boston. At first he seemed somewhat lonely and lost, but soon grew very happy and content in his new home, and well he might be for he had all his wants supplied and did not lack companions i had two canaries a robin and a song sparrow and they soon began to make beautiful music all together the sun could not rise without shining into the parlor windows it lingered there all day till the last glow of the evening red faded out of the sky at two windows the light streamed through green leaves and gay flowers and made a most cheerful atmosphere in which no bird could possibly help singing the song sparrow's clear friendly notes seemed to bring may to the very door and the robin executed sotto voce all his fine out-of-door melodies and put one into an april mood with his sweet melancholy rain song Willie could not choose but be happy, so they all sang and chirruped together the whole winter through, and cheered us in that cold, sad season. Slowly the earth turned daily more and more towards the sun, and before we were ready to realize so much joy, the willow wands were spangled with downy silver, and the adder catkins began to unwind their long spirals and swing pilant in the first winds of March then the melting airs of april set the brooks free the frogs began to pipe and there was rare music birds came in flocks the soft green grass stole gradually over the land and dandelions shone gay in the meadows 
when beneath a southern window the flowering almond blossomed i kept the windows open during fine weather and left the bird cages on the sill the whole day little wild birds came and sat on the grapevine trellis above and twittered and talked with the captives and sometimes alighted on the cages the pink almond sprays waved round them and all were or seemed to be as happy as the day is long willie's little mistress returned about this time and i only awaited a proper opportunity to return my charge safe and well into her hands i congratulated myself on his state of health and spirits and thought how glad she would be to see him again but alas for human calculations one afternoon i went as usual to take in the cage for the night there was dick the robin and philip the sparrow and slender rupert my own canary and his mate but willie of faya the green and golden stranger was gone cage and all i looked out of the window there lay the cage upon the ground empty imagine my consternation had some strange prowling cat devoured i was in despair at the thought if it had been any one but willie i said again and again he had been entrusted to my care what should i say when he was required of me in great sorrow i wrote to my youthful friend and told her all she mourned her bird as dead but only for a day for what do you think happened the most surprising thing you never will guess so i shall tell you all at once willie was not devoured he escaped from his cage and flew unerringly back to his former home ten miles from mine the night after he disappeared from my window he was heard pecking at the window of the little girl's chamber but no one noticed him so he stayed about the house till morning and flew in when the window was opened and was found perched on the cage of his old companion great was every one's astonishment as you may imagine there was no mistaking him it was willie and no other yes really and truly now how do you suppose he found his way over all those miles of unfamiliar country straight to that chamber window what guided him did he fly high or low probably not high for his wings were unused to flying at all and consequently not strong but they bore him over woods and fields over streets and people over hundreds of houses till at last his tired eyes beheld the tower and gables of his old dwelling-place rising from among the pleasant woods and then he knew he might rest in safety but how could he find the way supposing birds to have the means of communicating with each other by speech how would he have put his questions wishing to ask his way meeting a thrush or a sparrow or any other dainty feathered creature he might perhaps have hailed it with good morrow comrade but he couldn't have said can you tell me the way to jamaica plains or do you know where the little girl lives to whom i belong her name is may and she has golden hair can you tell me how to find her do you think he could yet he did find her and until last summer was still living in that pretty chamber among the green trees some time perhaps we shall understand those things but until then Willie's journey must remain one of the mysterious incidents in natural history. End of chapter 28 Recording by Sharon Kilmer, Rio Medina, Texas Chapter 29 of the Junior Classics, Volume 8 Animal and Nature Stories This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Junior Classics, Volume 8, 
Animal and Nature Stories, edited by William Patton. A Runaway Whale, by Captain O.G. Fosdick. Now, boys, said Captain Daniel, draw your skiff up beside the Greyhound, and I'll tell you a story of how I was once run away with by a whale. We boys did as we were bid, drawing the skiff well up clear of the tideway. We clambered on board the Greyhound, and seating ourselves on the transom, waited for Captain Daniel to begin. Taking a match from his waistcoat pocket, and lighting a long clay pipe, he spoke. Along in the fifties I was a cabin boy on the whaling ship Nimrod, our Larson coffin master. We were cruising on the coast of Brazil when, one day, the lookout stationed at the masthead reported a large school of sperm whales off our lee beam. Captain Coffin, who had taken his spyglass and gone aloft at the first cry from the masthead, ordered the boats lowered. As the men tumbled over one another to be the first to reach the monsters, my young heart danced within me, and our old black steward had to hold me back. I was so anxious to go. There was a gentle wind blowing, and the boat's crews, having hoisted the sails, were fast leaving the ship. Captain Coffin now ordered the men to get a spare boat from its cranes over the quarter-deck and fit it with whaling implements. There were only a few of us left on board for shipkeepers. We quickly had the boat down from its cranes and everything ready for launching. There were several other whalers off our station beam, and as soon as they noticed our boats in the water, they squared their yards and ran down across our stern. Captain Coffin had observed their maneuvers, and calling to the ship's cooper, he said, Bangs, you will have to take charge of the ship during my absence, for every one of our boats is fastened to a whale, and the rest of the school has become gallied, and I don't want those Nantucketers to get there before our boats secure two whales apiece, at least. Taking another look at the ships which had now crossed our wake, he added, Blast those Nantucketers! They can smell a sperm whale five miles to their leeward any time. He had come down from the rigging and ordered the head sails thrown back. The order was obeyed, and stepping to the ship's waist, he placed his powerful shoulders against the whaleboat and said, Now, boys, all shove together. As the ship rolled to the leeward, out through the gangway, shot our boat and landed safely in the water. And I was after her. For you must know, children... I was so anxious to see the boat launch properly, that as she struck the water I ran to the open gangway, and not noticing the boat's warp, which the steward had taken the precaution to fasten taut to the ship's rail, was struck by it and thrown overboard. They threw me a bite of rope from the ship, and I clambered back on deck. Captain Coffin told me to go below and change my dripping clothes, and then I could go into the boat with him and pull the after oar. You may lay to it that I flew down those cabin stairs, for if there was anything in the world I longed for, it was to get a chance to see the sperm whale killed. As Captain Coffin stepped to the bow of the boat, he ordered the black steward to his place in the steering oar. Don't be afraid to lay me right on them, Stuart, said he. Nothing but wood and black skin will suit me today. We soon caught up with the other boat. The first and second officers had each killed a whale and were engaged in buoying a tub with the Nimrod's name stamped upon it to their carcasses. The rest of the school had gone down, and the third and fourth officers' crews were resting on their oars, waiting for the attacked whales to break water again. The other ships now had their boats in the water, and as Captain Coffin saw them approach, he called to his officers, Don't let the Nantucketers beat us! They are regular sharks after sperm oil, but we have four whales the best of them now. Every man here must strike his fish today. He had hardly finished his speech when, right beside our boat, an old bull whale showed his nose out of the water and sent a blast of hot air out of his spout holes, which was blown back to us by the wind. As we felt the warm breath on our faces, each man checked his oar. And right here, children, I want to correct a mistaken idea. Whales don't spout water. It is their hot breath which, like the breath from a horse's nostril in winter, shows white against the sky and looks like water. The body of the whale which had broken water beside us bore many a scar, and his back was all covered with barnacles. Now, boys... Give way to your oars, and you, steward, lay me right on him, spoke Captain Coffin, and as each man gave a steady pull, steward, with a skillful turn of the steering oar, brought the head of the boat around, and the next instant her bow brought up against the body of the whale. Captain Coffin's wish was fulfilled, for, in whaleman's lore, we were wooden black skin. Instantly he lunged his harpoon into the monster's quivering blubber and with a dexterity that was wonderful in a man of his size, he seized another and thrust it to the hilt beside the first. "'Stern all! Stern all!' he cried. And as we backed away from the maddened whale, it turned, and with one sweep of its flukes sent a cataract of water over us, 
that almost filled the boat and drenched us to the skin. It dived then, and the whale line ran out of its tub so rapidly that the loggerhead in the stern, around which was a turn of the line, smoked like a chimney. Pour some water on that line, cried the steward to the tub oarsman, and as the man obeyed, the steward tightened the turn on the rope, and the boat shot ahead like a racehorse. Soon the whale slackened its speed and rode to the surface, and in a few moments broke water off our starboard bow. Then Captain Coffin ordered us to gather in the line and pull him up beside the whale, and at the same time he took a long lance from its socket, and having braced himself firmly against the bow thwart, stood ready. What a moment of awe it was to me as I looked at the monster angrily lashing the water with its fins and flukes. The next instant we were beside the whale, and as it rolled on its side, Captain Coffin transfixed him with a thrust of his lance that seemed to pierce its very vitals. The next moment the blood poured in gallons from his spout holes. Having slackened the line from the boat, we rested on our oars at a safe distance and watched the monster circling around in its dying fury. During this time, the rest of the boats had each secured another whale. The crew in the third officer's boat appeared to be making signals of distress, and Captain Coffin ordered us to cut loose from our whale and go quickly to their assistance. We saw, as we drew near them, that the gunwale and the two upper streaks of their boat had been stove by their last whale and the officer was about to throw all the whaling implements overboard in order to lighten her, for the crew were desperately bailing out the water, which was pouring through the broken seams. She was sinking fast. Captain Coffin at once ordered the men to get into our boat with their implements, and taking the smashed boat in tow, we returned to our own whale, which appeared to be fast dying. The captain, after securing the end of this severed whale line, attached it to the line in the third officer's boat, and then told me to get into the stoven boat and remain with the whale, while he carried the rescued crew to the ship. As he left me, he sang out, Don't let those Nantucketers steal the whale from you, boy, for I feel proud of my work today. This is the largest whale I ever saw. Turning to the third officer, he added, And I killed it in the good old-fashioned handland style, and didn't touch the new-fangled bomb gun that the owners put in all our boats. As the boat separated, I turned and watched the dying whale. It was slowly swimming around in a large circle, and the blood was just oozing from its spout holes as it came to the surface to breathe. The sun was about a handspike high from the horizon. There was considerable water left in the boat, which, empty of men, now floated high, so I took a bucket and busied myself in bailing it out. After bailing a while, I leaned back against the thwarts and took another look at the whale. The creature was not dead yet, and there did not seem to be any blood coming from its spout holes. In fact, it seemed to be spouting all right and was not circling around any more, but was swimming slowly ahead. What did it mean? Could Captain Coffin have fastened me to the wrong whale? I asked myself. I began to feel frightened, for all of a sudden the monster began to beat the water again with its flukes, and the boat was going at a faster rate of speed. The sun had now reached the water's edge, and I could not see any boat coming. What should I do if the whale turned on me? I looked around for a knife to cut the whale line, but could not find one. The crew had taken all the knives with them. The whale had disappeared, and the line was fast running out of its tub. Faster and faster it ran until, with a jerk, the end flew from the tub, and I thought I was free. But alas, no, for when the crew were being changed, one of them had fastened the small tub, which is used for a drag, in the end of the line, and it was yanked under the bow thwart and jammed there. The boat now shot ahead with a furious speed. It was growing darker, and I could scarcely make out the ship. In vain I looked for the boat. Would it never come? To add to my trouble, the rest of the whales had joined the old bull and were hoarsely spouting and leaping out of the water all around me. In fact, there were whales everywhere, on both sides of the boat and down beneath it. I could dimly see the greenish-white reflections as they swam just beneath the surface. One old cow whale and her calf were close beside me, and as they came up to spout I could feel the water from the splash of the little one's flukes. As a boy on shipboard, I had often longed for a little whale to play with, but the desire had all left me now, for I crouched down in the boat and covered my face with my hands. Oh, if the captain would only come and take me out of that boat, I would never go to sea again, I thought. Suddenly, the boat stopped with a jerk, and uncovering my face, I saw a sight that made me scream with fright. Right in front of me was a large sperm whale's head with its jaws wide open and its long row of glistening white teeth shining from the phosphorescent brightness of the water. With a snap, its mouth closed, and it sank out of sight, while I, falling on my knees, asked God to save me. After that, I felt better, and managed to crawl under the stern sheets for shelter, for I was chilled through. 
It was quite dark, although the stars shone brightly. The whale seemed to have got free, for the boat was idly rocking on the water. In changing my cramped form to an upright position, my hand came against a hard, round piece of iron. A feeling of security, of advantage, of longing for battle ran through me as my hand rested on the cold steel. It was one of the captain's bomb guns, which was so despised by him, but which might be the means of saving me from an awful death. I pulled it from its socket and fondled it in my excitement and relief at finding some means of defense. I found I was able to lift the gun to my shoulder, and my pulse beat with renewed vigor as I raised the hammer and found the gun was loaded. So great was my joy that I forgot for a moment the terrible uncertainty of my position, and almost wished the whale would come back. I did not feel so long, for the next instant the boat began to move. Again I heard the whale spouting, and right abreast was a monster swimming straight towards the boat. With an inward prayer to God, I raised the gun to my shoulder, and the next instant, as the monster thrust its head out of the water, I fired. The recoil threw me against the side of the boat, where I lay, partially stunned and unable to move. I was conscious enough, however, to remember that in silent and stupefied terror, I awaited a second onslaught from the enraged animal. I seemed to feel the crunching of the boat's timbers in those awful jaws, and I must have swooned in looking forward to my own terrible fate. When I regained my senses, all was quiet around me. Off the side of the boat, at some distance, a whale floated in the water. After waiting a few moments, I ventured to crawl forward on the thwarts, and found the whale line was still attached to the bow. I went back to the stern and sat on the after thwart, thinking of the gun. I felt in the bottom of the boat for it, but could not find it. It must have fallen overboard when I fell down. As I was groping, I felt an object in the bottom of the boat that I knew at once was the boat's lantern keg which is kept in all the whale boats. In it are flint, tinder, a lantern, candles, and packed all around them are ship's biscuits. Instantly, the memory of our officer's instructions in reference to their use came to me. Quickly, taking the keg to the stern of the boat, I struck its end against the loggerhead. It soon yielded to my pounding, and the head fell out. How sweet the hard pilot bread tasted! It brought to my remembrance the water keg, which is also kept in a whale boat. I went to the midship thwart and found the keg there, lashed firmly beneath it. I loosened it and drank heartily. Then I took the lantern and tinder from one keg, and striking a flint, I soon had one of the candles lighted. I sat down in the afterthwart and held the light aloft until my arm ached. Everything about me was made more weird by the gleam of the lantern. The swish of the water as it rippled beneath the boat and the screeching of sea fowls that had now gathered around the floating carcass set me to thinking of the ship, and I wondered if they could see the light and come to my rescue. I did not know what time it was, but judged it must be near midnight. I tried to call, but my own voice frightened me. It sounded so strange. So once more I relapsed into silence. Suddenly, something seemed to be the matter with the whale. I thought I heard a sound like someone falling overboard. What could it be? At that moment, a black body shot out of the water right beside the boat. It was followed by another and another. Soon I learned what it was, for I had seen them before. They were sharks, which, attracted by the dead whale, had come to feast on the carcass. It made me shiver to see them rush at the monster, and tear big mouthfuls of flesh from its side. I tied the lantern to the loggerhead and crawled under the stern sheets so as not to see them. Now I was well nigh exhausted, and I began to feel drowsy. Sleep soon overcame me, and testing my head against the boat's side I lost consciousness. When I awoke I heard voices and recognized Captain Coffin, who had me in his arms while the boat's crew were pulling us to the Nimrod. They had seen the lantern from the ship, and Captain Coffin had come himself in a boat to rescue me. My shot from the bomb gun had killed the bull whale, and it had also taught Captain Coffin two lessons. First, not to leave a whale merely because it is spouting blood, for it is liable, as in the present case, to clear its spouting as its ruptured blood vessel is drained, and like a wounded animal to fight with renewed vigor. Second, not to despise the bomb gun. Always use your bomb gun on a whale, children. We solemnly told Captain Daniel that we would do so, and then we bade him good night and went away from the Greyhound with sea pictures in our mind that can never go out of them as long as we live. End of chapter 29、Chapter、30 of the Junior Classics, Volume 8, Animal and Nature Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lucretia Bell. The Junior Classics, Volume 
Animal and Nature Stories, edited by William Patton. 30. Saved by a Seal, by Theodore A. Cutting. The liveliest seal that father and I ever caught, and the only one that ever got away from us after we had housed it, was Nab. Although father has been catching seals for zoological gardens and circuses almost as long as I can remember, and knows all their tricks both in water and on land, yet Nab was too sharp for him. It was my vain attempt to recapture him that terminated in the most exciting experience I ever had with a seal. Our seal shed, which stood at the edge of the rocks fifteen feet above the surf, held in Nab's day eight occupants, all nearly full-grown. The circus seals, which are caught and trained while young, had all been sold, and these were expected to place in the zoological gardens at Philadelphia and Cincinnati. Nab had not been in our possession long, however, before he demonstrated his exceptional abilities, and was straightaway singled out to be trained, since a clever circus seal is usually worth twice as much as a mere menagerie animal. Father generally takes the training into his own hands, and sends me out for the daily supply of fish, but I took such a liking to Nab that I spent every evening teaching him. He first drew attention to himself by his skill in stealing fish from the others. Although I always gave him the first mouthful to keep him quiet, he would swallow it and be ready for the next before I could get a second fish from the sack. He would eye a shad in my hand as closely as he had once watched the young salmon darting about in the waters of Monterey Bay. And the instant I let go of it, intending to drop it into the open mouth of the next seal, Nab would snap it as it fell. He learned quickly the trick that all trained seals know, that of balancing a ball on the nose. But for a seal that is not much of a feat, after the experience of keeping themselves constantly in poise amidst the rolling breakers and surging swells, I taught him to rise on his flippers and march, also to turn right or left at the word. But his education had not proceeded very far when he picked up of his own account the trick that none of his predecessors had been able to acquire, how to escape from the little shed, where all of a seal's splashing must be in a square tank, and to be free again in the boundless Pacific. There were two rooms in the seal house, one at the back for the animals, and one in front for the boat, fish lines, and crates. The seal quarters had no outside door, the only exit being into the front room. Father, unusually tired one night after we had both been out all day for fish, went down alone to feed the seals. It was nearly dark, and he closed the outside door without catching it. When he opened the inside door and began to distribute the bass, Nab took advantage of the dusk to steal every fish he could get his nose in reach of. It seemed impossible to get a mouthful to any other seal in the lot, and Father, at last quite out of patience, gave him a smart cut over his stubby little ears with a training whip. Nab gave a shrill yelp, dived between Father's legs, and slid out into the boat room, the door to which had been left ajar. A seal presents an awkward appearance, hobbling on his queer flippers, but he can make rapid progress. Before Father could get his balance and start after him, Nab was well out into the boat room. Father stopped only to close the door against the rest of the seals, and was again in pursuit, but Nab in the meantime had reached the far end, bumped against the unfastened door, and was scuttling across the outer threshold. Father ran after him, only to see his body floundering from one rock to another and to hear its happy splash in the water below. We both felt sorry to lose Nab, for the buyers will always pick out a lively fellow and pay a better price for him than for another, even though he be larger. "'Couldn't we trap him again?' I asked. "'I guess you'd have an interesting time catching as smart a seal as that after he's already been once landed,' said Father. One or two of them that have slipped out of the lasso I've got a hold of again, but if a seal gets away after he's had one full sniff of civilization, he doesn't very often get near enough for a second. "'Would you know him if you should see him?' I asked. "'I don't think we'll ever get that near, but we might come to within hearing distance, and I could tell his yap out of a hundred, replied Father. Without saying anything to Father about it, I made up my mind to get Nab back, if such a thing were possible. The main feeding ground of the band of seals from which we take our animals is just off Moss Beach, and I was almost certain that I could get a sight of Nab there. Whether I should be able to tell him, floating among the other seals with only a little shiny head out of water, I had doubts. But I thought I could make him recognize me. There was only one fact that made me hesitate about carrying out my plans, and that was the danger of swimming at Moss Beach. Father had warned me two or three times about the strength of the undertow there, but since my whole scheme depended upon getting out among the seals and I was a good swimmer, I decided to run the risk. Telling Father one night that I should go off in the morning to fish from the rocks, I went early to bed and was up next day by sunrise. With a hook and line and half the length of an old lasso, I was off for the rocks near Moss Beach. As it was nearly low tide, I soon had a piece of abalone on my hook and was fishing. No seals were in sight, but I kept a sharp lookout for them as I fished. 
I just caught a second shad, and it was something I had never done before to catch a shad off the rocks, when the heads of half a dozen seals appeared on the swells to my left. More heads came in sight as I grabbed up my fishes and hastened to the sandy part of the shore. I was in high spirits, for shad would tempt Nab as no other fish could. In less than two minutes I had my clothes off, the lariat knotted round my waist, and the short string that tied the fishes together between my teeth. The seals were still where I had first seen them, out less than two hundred yards from shore. I waded quickly into the water until the waves began to break over my head, and then swam. Before I had taken three strokes, one of the fishes I held by my teeth began to lend assistance, jumping and splashing about so under my nose that I thought best to beat a retreat. When I turned to gain shallow water again, however, I felt at once the strength of the undertow, which, in my excitement, I had entirely forgotten. I could make no headway against it until a couple of big waves came up from behind and sent me far enough in to get a firm footing. With confidence that my shad would give me no more trouble, I again turned to swim out. The water of the big waves that had boosted me in now began to draw me out in the undertow. I hesitated when I felt the strength of its sweep, and still more as I thought of the greater force it would have when the tide turned. Where I stood I could withstand it, but a little deeper in I well knew it would be impossible to do so without the help of incoming waves. They just washed me ashore once, I guess they will again, I thought, and threw myself into the current. As I approached the seals, most of them began to swim off, but two or three of the larger males stood their ground, letting me come within a couple of rods of them. Nearer, however, they would not let me draw, although their curiosity about me was great. From the way they went circling round me, stretching their long necks up out of the water to get a good view, I concluded I was of a different species of water animal from those with which they were familiar. Of Nab, however, I could see nothing. "'Fish, Nab! Fish! Fish!' I called, and held up for inspection one of the shad I had brought. At the sound of my voice, there was a sharp little bark from behind, such as Nab alone could give when I had an exceptionally delicate morsel for him. I turned quickly and saw at a distance his shining dog-shaped head. "'Fish, Nab! A fine shad for you! Fish!' I coaxed. He came a little nearer, and I was confident the bait would prove irresistible. But my assurance was ill-founded, for in spite of all my coaxing, Nab only circled round and round me until I was dizzy trying to keep track of him. Either he had fairly good luck fishing for himself that morning and was not suffering very keen pangs of hunger, or else he still associated my benevolence too closely with the little square splash tub of the seal house. When I had begun to grow weary from the incessant motion necessary to keep myself afloat, Nab suddenly made a dash so close that his flippers brushed my side. He snapped the fish out of my hand, and in the same instant he was again beyond reach. The fact that he had come up for one fish encouraged me to hope he would come also for the second, and I began to coax with renewed energy. Nab was seemingly as much on his guard as before, however, and again went through his complete list of maneuvers, first rearing high out of the water, turning one side of his head and then the other toward me, then ducking into the depths with a final flourish of his tail to reappear presently on the other side of me, as sportive as before. By this time I had begun to feel pretty well exhausted, and when I suddenly thought of the undertow, I decided to swim back. So intent had I been upon urging Nab near enough to get the lariat about his neck that I had not once looked toward shore. As I now did so, I was terrified to find that one of the unaccountably shifting currents along Moss Beach had swept me a long distance out to sea. Without more nonsense, I dropped my remaining shad and started back with long, even strokes. Nab snapped up the fish and disappeared in the deep green water. In spite of my efforts, I found that I was making small speed against the current. The rock and tree on the point of land to my right, by which I judged my progress, kept almost in the same straight line. Knowing it was useless to spend my strength directly against a current, I shifted my course in the direction of the point. From the sand hills to my left I could see that I now made more progress, but the distance I had to cover was greater than straight to Moss Beach. Before I had covered half the distance I was almost too fatigued to take another stroke. Then the feeling of weariness seemed to leave me, and I swam on as if turned into a machine. It was in a mechanical way, too, that my brain seemed to work. If the undertow's as strong as when I came out, I thought, I can never get through the breakers. I wished I had told my father my plans. He might have come out with a boat to get me. Then I wondered how it was that my arms and legs kept on moving when there was so little feeling in them. The roar of the breakers had suddenly grown louder, and I saw I was within twenty yards of shore. I swam on with the same steady strokes, but at a certain distance from the water line came to a standstill. I knew I was held back by the undertow, and that there was need of all my remaining strength to get ashore. I increased my efforts, but surged helplessly forward and backward with the rising and falling waves. When I thought I had given my last stroke, a big wave boosted me in, followed by a second and third, until it seemed I must be where I could reach bottom. 
I let my feet down, down, until my toes at last touched the sand. I dug them in with all my might and battled desperately to keep my footing. Then came a little swell that lifted me from my feet, and the terrible current swooped me back again. My strength was gone, and I turned on my back to float. Perhaps I can try again if I rest, I thought, and meanwhile drifted out until the roar of the breakers came but dully to my ears, out where the water was deep and green. Realizing that I paid for every minute of rest by drifting farther from shore, I rolled wearily over and with slow strokes started back. At this moment, Nab stuck his nose from the water not three feet away. When I spoke his name, he came up so that I could put my hand on his neck. For half a minute he was quiet, letting me bear my weight upon him. Then he showed by beginning to dive and circle that his motive in coming to me was purely for sport. Every other minute he would shake loose from my hand and then peer at me beneath the water as my head sank under. At last I got such a firm grip on the nape of his neck that I could hold on even when he dived. With my other hand I untied the piece of lasso from round me and tried to put the noose over Nab's head. To this he had objections, and ducked and backed and splashed until I nearly strangled. Forced to give up this scheme, I nevertheless succeeded in getting a cinch round one of his hind flippers close up to the body. "'March, Nab!' I then shouted. "'Forward! March!' He either had forgotten his lessons or exulted in the fact that he was now at liberty to disobey orders, for instead of heading for shore he started in the opposite direction. "'Haw!' I cried. "'Haw! Gee, then! Gee!' But Nab would turn neither to right nor left, and dragged me farther out to sea. Thinking I might steer him by his flipper, I gave a jerk on the lariat. What the seal thought I don't know, but when he felt the noose tighten he seemed filled with sudden fright and plunged into the depths. Instinctively I took a big breath when I saw him disappear and laid hold of the lasso with both hands. In another instant I was making the longest dive under water that I believe man ever took. It might have been pleasing to glide through the depths under other circumstances and at moderate speed, but following down after this uncertain guide at the rushing pace he set was the worst experience I ever had. I should have let go my hold but for the thought that there was no worse place than that from which I had started. I hung on and on, even after it seemed I should burst for want of air. Then came a shiver along the lariat and the sensation in my body of scraping against a rock. Although I still held on tightly, my speed suddenly slackened, and I knew the old lasso had been cut in two on the rock. Half strangled though I was, I began pawing my way to the surface. When at last my head broke through into the air, I hung to the rock, sputtering and gasping. I didn't attempt to do more than get my breath for, I think, a quarter of an hour. But at last I looked round to see where I was. At first I could not make it out, for Moss Beach was nowhere in sight. Then, when I saw a couple of huge pelicans perched on the rock above my head, the truth came to me. Nab had taken me out clear round the point and over to Seal Rocks, the island home of seals and pelicans. How I ever could have taken such a dive and come out alive is still a mystery to me, except when I remember how the water churned in my ears at our terrific speed. The rock upon which I hung had been Nab's birthplace, and the place where he had been captured by father and me. Here he used to lie to toast in the sun, and here also he had fled when he felt my line round his flipper. As soon as I could clear the salt water from my mouth and lungs, I began to work my way up on the rock. Exhausted as I was, and benumbed with cold, this was no easy matter, and once, when a fragment of rock gave way beneath my fingers, I nearly slipped back into the water. But at last I crawled up far enough to send off the pelicans in fright, and to get where the sun would strike me. I expected to blister my back, but I thought it would be a welcome change from the freezing process. After the blood had begun to warm up a little in my veins, I began to think of getting back to the mainland. It was a distance of only a hundred yards from the rock across, but when I looked down into that green water and recalled my recent experiences, I shrank from sliding in as from death itself. I measured the distance twenty times with my eyes, and the same number of times assured myself that there would be no undertow here with the tide coming in, but I could not bring myself to let go the rocks that felt so firm and good. When I observed, however, that it was nearly high tide, and that I should have to swim against the tide if I waited much longer, I climbed down without more fooling, and struck back for shore. Although a side current shifted me from my direct course so that I had to land upon another beach than I had intended, I got ashore without difficulty, and hastened across the point to Moss Beach, where I had left my clothes. I never again attempted to recapture Nab, nor have I had an opportunity to repay him for towing me to Seal Rocks. But I have seen him a number of times since, and have often heard his happy bark from the rocks along the coast. End of chapter 30
Chapter 31 of the Junior Classics, Volume 8, Animal and Nature Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Junior Classics, Volume 8, Animal and Nature Stories, edited by William Patton. Chapter 31 Old Musky the Rogue by Levi T. Pennington You must go, that's all. There'll be some way, you'll see. Carl Mills and Lee Henley were separating for the night. They were close friends, and although Carl's father was the most prosperous man in the community, and Lee was the son of a poor widow, they had always been together and had been leaders of the class that had been graduated from the local high school the month before. Tonight they had been discussing, for the hundredth time, their plans for the coming year. Carl was going to college in the autumn, that was a settled thing, and Lee longed to go as he had never longed for anything before in his life. There was nothing to prevent his going but the lack of funds, his mother was to spend the winter with a married daughter ten years his senior. He had a scholarship in the college and a chance to pay his way, in part, by working in the college library. But that would take all his spare time, and he was sure that he would still lack about one hundred dollars of having enough to carry him through the first year. Both boys dearly loved Lake Wanawaso, on the shore of which they lived, it was, indeed, one of the most beautiful of all the sheets of water which a half-century ago knew the dip of the Indian's paddle and the ripple of his birch-bark canoe. There may be other waters as clear and sweet as those of northern Michigan, but the native and the enthusiastic summer visitor find it hard to believe. Both Lee and Carl spent much of their time in the employ of the people at Forest Lodge, during the summer, when the Chicago fishermen, headed by the wealthy Camerons, were there for three months. Lee was in Mr. Cameron's special employ, and from him had learned the art of bait-casting. At the close of the previous season, Mr. Cameron had given him his longest and strongest masculange casting rod. It was too heavy now for Mr. Cameron, who found his casting arm seriously crippled by rheumatism. It was but a few days after Lee's last talk with Carl Mills that he heard Mr. Cameron and Mr. Gardner discussing the fine collection of mounted fish belonging to Mr. Cameron in Chicago. Mr. Gardner was speaking of it in glowing terms and was especially praising a masculange in the collection. "'Yes,' said Mr. Cameron, "'that certainly was a fine fish "'when Smithson took him out of this lake five years ago. "'But I had set my heart on a bigger one. "'I wanted one that would weigh over fifty pounds "'when he came out of the water, "'and that one weighed only forty-three. "'I'd gladly give one hundred dollars "'for a specimen caught with hook and line "'that would tip the scales at fifty pounds or better.' "'Do you think you'll ever find one?' asked Mr. Gardner. "'I hardly know,' said Mr. Cameron. Two years ago one was netted in the river near Detroit, which was over that weight. But I did not learn of it until too late. And anyway, I want one that is caught with hook and line, and the story of whose capture I can know.' Two weeks later, one morning, when Mr. Cameron had decided that he would not go out upon the lake, Lee Henley paddled a light canoe out across Forest Lodge Cove and practiced with his casting rod. In this cove there seemed to be no fish at all, although elsewhere in the lake fish were plentiful. At one point here three great elm trees with spreading tops had fallen into the lake years before. There they still lay, waterlogged, their hundreds of branches forming a miniature jungle under water, just off the bold shore. Merely for practice, Lee dropped his casting bait near these treetops and started to reel in. 
Then he almost fell from the boat, for there was a great swirl in the water where his minnow was spinning along. A broad tail came out and hit the water with a tremendous splash, and he struck, but did not hook the fish, which, however, he saw to be enormous. That night he said to Carl Mills, Carl, I believe I see a chance for college. What is it? asked his friend. Then Lee told of the conversation he had heard, and of the great fish that had given him a strike. And I believe that he weighs over fifty pounds, and that I can catch him if you will help me, he said. There was but one day in the week, however, that they could try for the big fish, for both were employed that year every weekday except Tuesday, when Mr. Cameron went to the town fifteen miles away, and on Tuesday they dared to fish only in the very early morning, for fear that some of the fishermen at Forest Lodge would learn that there was a great fish there and catch him. They did not want to be unsportsmanlike, but Lee was confident that none of the rich fishermen needed the fish as he did. The first Tuesday morning brought them not even encouragement. Although Carl paddled the boat all about the cove, and Lee did the best casting of which he was capable, no strike rewarded them, and when they saw the first stir about Forest Lodge, they hastened to another part of the lake, and left Old Muskie, as they had already named the big fish. When the next Tuesday morning came, again they were out. The boat was kept at as great a distance from shore as Lee could cover with his longest casts, and just as the casting minnow fell straight out from the middle treetop, there was a great swirl in the water. Lee struck, and the reel began to sing as the great fish started a tremendous run, but in an instant the line came back slack. The saber-like teeth of the mascalange had cut it off like a knife. And what can we do about that? said Carl, as Lee sadly reeled in the useless line. I don't know yet, but I have an idea, said Lee. The next Tuesday morning Lee was not ready to try for the big fish again, although it was almost torture to stay away from the old treetops. He promised to be ready the next week, and he was. What he had done had surprised his mother, who knew that he had been saving every cent in the hope of going to college. He had sent away to a fishing tackle house for their largest first-class silk line, and received one hundred yards of that line that was tested to fifty pounds. He had sent to an electric supply house for their smallest unwound copper wire, and had received a spool of it, almost hair-like in its fineness. Both purchases had been expensive for him. From old Injun Jake, Lee had learned the art of doing the fine splicing and braiding of many strands. He unbraided the silk line for a considerable length, and, weaving in one by one the copper wire lengths that he had cut from the spool, he joined the wire to the silk with a joint that would readily pass through a line guide, and continued to braid till he had a six-foot flexible copper leader that would sustain his own weight, united to his one hundred yards of line, with a joint as strong as the line itself. Thus did he provide against the teeth of old Musky. Tuesday morning the boys were again fishing in Forest Lodge Cove at daybreak. Again old Musky struck, and, unable to cut the line, rushed into the interlacing boughs of the submerged treetops. For a while the strain on the rod indicated that he was surging back and forth among the treetops, but soon the dead pull showed that the old warrior was no longer making a fight. Rowing in, the boys found the casting bait fast to one of the limbs. When they got it loose and pulled it in, they found that one of the treble hooks was gone. Old Muskie, in his rush, had caught one of the hooks upon a branch, and it had held, while the one that was in his mouth had pulled from the minnow, and the big savage of the lake was again at his liberty. Lee made a change in his minnow before the next Tuesday morning. 
Instead of using the treble hooks that were fastened with screws into the sides of the minnow, he bored a hole in the body of the wooden bait, and, using again his copper wire, passed it back and forth through the body of the minnow and through the eye of the treble hook on each side. He knew that no fish would break all these strands of copper wire, although he felt that old Muskie might break the hooks. The next Tuesday morning Lee again hooked old Muskie. Again the big fish got to the treetops, and again Lee felt the dead pull that meant that he had no longer a fighting fish to deal with. Reeling up as Carl paddled the boat toward shore, Lee found that old Muskie had entangled the line among the branches, and getting a chance to use his great weight, had broken the heavy silk line. Lee was delighted to see that it had been broken above the point where he had spliced it to the copper leader. "'What can you do about that?' asked Carl. "'I'm not sure,' said Lee. "'But every time thus far the old fellow has run straight away from the direction in which I was reeling my minnow. I believe that if we come at him from near the shore, he will take a run toward the open lake and will have a chance at him.' During the week that followed, Lee again spliced a copper leader to his line. Again he made over a big casting minnow, and when Tuesday morning brought its opportunity, Carl put the canoe along the shore, but as far out as the end of the submerged treetops. Three casts were made, each farther and farther forward, without result. The fourth, however, a perfect cast of over one hundred feet, which fell just beyond the farthest treetop, was rewarded. The water broke in a great eddy as old Muskie took the bait. Lee struck with all his might and pulled with all the force he dared to use, although he was pulling almost straight back toward the treetops. As he had hoped, old Muskie pulled the other way and with a tremendous rush left the treetops and started toward the channel into the open lake. Halfway across he gave an astonishing leap into the air, showing the boys for the first time just what a monster they had succeeded in hooking. Hope more lively than any they had felt before filled the hearts of the young fishermen as the monster mascalunge rushed across the cove, but instead of hitting the narrow open channel into the main lake, he rushed across the wide bar through a veritable forest of bulrushes. Then the fight was quickly over. The fish had been hooked only on the treble hook in the rear of the casting minnow. The hooks on the side dragged through the rushes and caught upon so many of them that the hook was torn from the mouth of old Muskie, and again Lee reeled in his line without the big fish at the end of it. Both boys sat in the canoe for several minutes as blue as boys could be. It certainly was discouraging. But presently Lee raised his head, and with a flash of the eye said, I'll catch that fellow yet. And Carl Mills, with admiration and determination both on his face, said, Right, and I'll help you do it. A big mascalonge lives a life much like that of a rogue elephant in its isolation. He selects some spot, a cove filled with lily pads, a bend of a river, or a sunken treetop like the home of old Muskie, and there he will stay month after month, if not year after year. So there was little danger of old Muskie's leaving Forest Lodge Cove that summer, unless he was caught or killed or died the mysterious death that comes to the great fish of the streams and lakes. Lee Henley and Carl Mills knew this, and they had been learning more and more of the habits of this particular mascalunge. In every new thing that they learned, they felt that they had one more aid toward the final capture of old Muskie and the realization of Lee's ambition for college that year. Lee had learned that hooking the big fish was the easiest part of the work of capturing him. He decided that he must provide by every possible means against the entanglement of his casting bait. With this in view, he made a wooden casting minnow himself. 
he took a spinner and the glass eyes from an old one he had used, and from a bit of red cedar he whittled out the shape for the body. He had bought a very heavy, although not very large, hand-forged treble hook. He took a heavy spring steel wire and had the old blacksmith at Kessler's Corners weld an eye in it through the eye of the treble hook. He put on the back spinner and passed the wire through the wooden minnow. He used no front spinner as it might catch in the rushes. The front eye he made in the wire himself by bending and twisting till he was sure beyond all question that it was safe. Then he fastened his copper leader into this eye, put the glass eyes into the head of the minnow, and with careful painting his bait was complete. The season was now growing late. College was to begin September 23rd. On Tuesday, September 9th, Carl and Lee set out at daybreak on their quest. They fished long and carefully, but got no strike. They left the cove for half an hour, then tried again. This time the great fish struck, but was not hooked. Soon Forest Lodge was astir, and fishing for old Muskie ended for that day. Then came the last day. Carl was to leave for college the following Monday. We just must get him this morning, he said, as they pushed out from the landing with the first glow of daylight. They knew a little later in the day would be better, but they felt that they must lose no time. Carl worked the canoe down the shore, the little craft slipping through the water as quietly as a floating swan. Lee outdid himself in length of cast, for he did not wish old Muskie to take fright because they were too near. At the fifth cast, the big fish hit the bait. He rushed savagely at it and closed his jaws down squarely upon it. Lee struck as if for his life and drove the hooks deep into the fish's jaw. And with click and drag both on the reel and his thumb adding to the pressure, he pulled all he thought his tackle would bear, pulled straight back toward the treetops, which he was most anxious to avoid. Stubbornly, the big fish pulled in the opposite direction and with a rush started across the cove. So fast did the line rush out that Lee's thumb was almost blistered, but he held it hard against the spinning reel and the fish rushed on across the cove. Straight through the forest of rushes he dashed and Lee and Carl held their breath as the line cut through the water. Lee held the rod high. Carl sent the canoe along the track taken by the fish, and in a few dizzy seconds old Muskie was through the rushes and out into the open lake. And now Lee made no effort to check him, but let him run as far as possible from the shore, although he continued his mad rush till less than thirty feet of line remained on his reel. Horace Lodge was quickly awake and astir. Mr. Gardner was just at the landing for a trip across the lake, when out in front of him came the canoe as if being towed by the great fish, which leaped high into the air. He rushed into Forest Lodge and roused Mr. Cameron and all the rest by beating upon his door and crying, Get up! Get up! Your fifty-pound muscalange is hooked and by a boy! No further call was needed and the beach was soon lined with a score of fishermen and their wives, hastily, and some of them grotesquely dressed. Meanwhile, Lee and Carl had begun working together to regain the line that had been run out. The victory could never have come to the young fishermen, but for the masterly way in which Carl handled the canoe. He made it almost a part of Lee. It moved with his motion, always responsive, always steady. When the fish went out toward the open lake, the boat went with him, that he might go as far as he would. When he made a wild rush for the shore, the paddle sent the boat off at an angle to his course, that the steel rod might exert a pole sidewise, and thus turn him from his course and back toward the open lake. And all this time Lee was putting on his tackle all the strain that he dared, holding the line so taut that his arm ached before the fight had been on ten minutes, 
and it lasted fifty-five. When old Muskie would leap frantically into the air, fiercely shaking himself, down would go the tip of the rod, clear below the surface of the water, and when he would sound, the tip of the rod pulled upward relentlessly. Whatever the direction of the rushes of the big fish, always the skilled hand and wiry arm of Lee Henley were ready to baffle and turn aside, to hold back and to weary. Pretty fight, said Herbert Gerrish to Mr. Cameron, who was watching in silence, but with keen admiration. Fine, said Mr. Cameron. Never saw a better. Think he'll land the fish? asked John Newby. If he does not now, he is bound to do it some day, replied Mr. Cameron. That fish might just as well give it up now as any time. I know Lee Henley. Indeed, it began to look as if victory was near. Slowly the rushes of the mascalunge were becoming less fierce. Carl had the gaff at hand for Lee when he was ready for it. Lee, fearful of a rush under the boat, dared not work the fish round for Carl to gaff, but kept him at the end of the boat where he himself might use the big hook. But what he had feared came to pass. The big mascalange did make a run under the boat. He was straight in front, when with a lightning-like dash he made a half-circle and went under the boat from the side. With a quick motion of arm and wrist, Lee threw the end of the rod over the prow of the canoe. It was all there was to do, but the rod would surely have struck the end of the boat, and something would probably have broken and the fish escaped, had not Carl, with a mighty stroke of the paddle, backed the canoe so quickly that Lee was almost thrown overboard. But the fish was saved. The fight was nearly over. Gradually they forced the mascalunge toward the sandy beach. Mr. Cameron had got a big, long-handled gaff hook, and now, forgetful of his rheumatism, waded out waist-deep into the water. There was a brief but decisive struggle that went hopelessly against the fish, and Mr. Cameron gaffed old Muskie and dragged him ashore. Lee and Carl stepped out onto the beach, both of them on the verge of collapse. There was a great fish supper at Forest Lodge that night. The skin, head, tail, and fins of old Muskie were carefully preserved, and sent to the best taxidermist in Chicago, but there was enough left of his fifty-three-pound body for the company gathered about the big oak hall dining table. On the right of Mr. Cameron sat Lee Henley, and on the left Carl Mills. Mr. Cameron and the Forest Lodge people were jubilant. Carl found a fifty-dollar bill under his plate, and Lee found a check for one hundred dollars and as the meal progressed, the story of the capture of old Muskie was told substantially as I have told it to you. There is little more to tell. I might tell you about how Lee Henley worked his way through college after the catching of old Muskie had given him his start. I could tell you of his work as general manager of the business house of Cameron, Page, and Company of Chicago. But that would be the story of Lee Henley, and I started out to tell you nothing but the story of old Muskie, whose mounted body is now in the private office of Mr. Cameron himself, where Lee Henley sees it every day. End of chapter 31 Recording by Arnold Banner, Thurmond, North Carolina Chapter 32 of The Junior Classics, Volume 8 Animal and Nature Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Chessie Joy. The Junior Classics, Volume 8, Animal and Nature Stories, edited by William Patton. Teaching Fish to Ring Bells by C. F. Holder. A certain pond in the country was once peopled with a number of turtles, frogs and fishes which i came to consider my pets and which at last grew so tame that i fed them from my hands among them however were four or five little sticklebacks that lived under the shade of a big willow and these were so quarrelsome that i generally fed them apart from the rest but sometimes all met 
and then the feast usually was ended by the death of a minnow. For, shocking to say, whenever there was a dispute for the food, some one of the little fishes was almost sure to be devoured by the hungry sticklebacks. These stickleback and minnow combats, after a while, came to be of daily occurrence, and the reason for this was a singular one, which I must explain. Under the willow's shade, and from one of the branches, I had hung a miniature belfry, containing a tiny brass bell, and had led the string into the water, letting it go down to a considerable depth. At first I tied a bait at intervals upon the line, and then the sticklebacks, of course, seized upon it, and thus rang the bell. Generally the ringing was done in a very grave and proper way, although sometimes, when the bait was too tightly tied, the quick peal sounded like a call to a fire. I kept up this system of baiting the string for about a week, until I thought they understood it, and then replaced the worms by bits of stone. As I expected the next morning, as I looked through the grass and down into the water, tinkle tinkle rang the bell, and I knew my little friends were saying good morning, and expected a breakfast. You may be sure they got it. I put my hand down, and up they came, and got one worm apiece, and as I raised my hand, down they rushed, and away went the bell, in an uproarious peal, that must have startled the whole neighborhood. I was quick to respond, and they soon learned to ring the bell before coming to the surface. In fact, if they saw me pass, I always heard their welcome greeting. But to return to the minnows. I generally fed them first, about twenty feet up the bank, but one morning I found one or two had followed me down to the residence of the stickleback family. They met with a rude reception, however, and to avoid making trouble, the next day I went to the willow first. But no sooner had the bell begun to ring than I saw a lot of ripples coming down, and in a second the two factions were in mortal combat. The sticklebacks were fighting not only for breakfast, but for their nest, which was nearby and they made sad work of the poor minnows, who, though smart in some things, did not know when they were whipped, and so they kept up the fight, though losing one of their number nearly every morning. The bell now and then rang violently, but I fear it was only sounding an appeal from a voracious stickleback whose appetite had got the better of his rage. So it went on every morning. The minnows had learned what the bell meant, and though usually defeated in the fight, they in reality had their betters as servants to ring the bell and call them to meals. Finally they succeeded, by force of great numbers, in driving away their pugnacious little rivals, and the bell hung silent, for, strange to say, they knew what the sound meant, but I could never teach them to ring it, when they could rise and steal the worm from my hand without. But I am inclined to think it was more laziness than inability to learn, as they afterward picked up readily some much more difficult tricks. I taught them to leap from the water into my hand, and lie as if dead, and having arranged a slide of polished wood upon the bank, by placing worms upon it I soon had them leaping out and sliding down, like so many boys coasting in the winter. That they afterward did it for amusement I know, as I often watched them unobserved when there was nothing to attract but the fun of sliding. This kind of amusement is not uncommon with many other animals, particularly seals which delight in making slides on the icy shores. End of chapter 32。Chapter The Junior Classics, Volume Eight, Animal and Nature Stories, edited by William Patton. Marcus Aurelius, by Octave Thanet. The ship was nearing the Irish coast. It was a delightful June day, and most of the passengers were on deck. The two ladies sat a little apart from the crowd of ship chairs under the cabin awning. One was fair, plump, pretty, and dressed in black. The cabin passengers called her the Lovely Widow. She was a Mrs. Norris on her way to Europe to join her brother, accompanied by her two nephews, sons of two brothers, her sister Nora and her maid. The other lady was Miss Nora. She was much younger than her sister, whom she did not resemble in the least, being a tall, straight, slim, handsome young woman with black hair and dark gray eyes in which sparkled a suspicious gleam of mirth. Mrs. Norris was speaking. 
He is a perfect young savage. Such manners and such grammar, I am sure no one would dream that his father was a bishop. Do you suppose all Western boys are that way? And such a temper, too. I assure you, Nora, he was fighting the whole time we were in New York. And look at the way he treats Edmund. I wonder the boy stands it. Poor nice fellow. Edmund is nice, answered Nora. But Oscar has his good points. What are they all crowding aft for? With an exclamation of those dreadful children, the elder lady extricated herself from her rug and hurried aft. Nora followed. Evidently there had been a quarrel of some sort. The purser and the deck steward were each holding a boy. The steward's captain, a handsome, flushed, black-haired lad of thirteen, was kicking and pushing and making violent efforts to wiggle out between the steward's legs. The other lad stood perfectly quiet. He was taller than the dark boy and might have been two years older, but he was of much slighter build. His fair hair was disordered, his nose bleeding, and his collar torn. Looking up into the purser's face, he said in a low tone, Please, let us fight it out. He'll bully me again if you don't. At this, the dark boy stopped in his violent attacks on the steward's legs and said, breathlessly, Well, you ain't such a milksop after all, Ned. No, no, said the purser, no fighting on the gallia. You two young gentlemen must promise to let each other alone while you are on shipboard, or... No promise, Ned, the dark boy interrupted. We can have it out on shore, you know. Say I promise. Let me go. I promise too, then, said the fair boy. Mind you both remember, said the purser, releasing his captive and turning to Mrs. Norris. No harm done yet, ma'am. Both boys recognized their aunt, and they had been too busy with each other before to look about. They stood silently by, Oscar grinning and Edmund frowning while she apologized for their conduct. Then she turned to them and led them to an impromptu court of justice behind the wheelhouse. The proceedings were brief. Oscar told his story. As usual, he related a perfectly plain, uncolored tale, making no excuse for himself. We were up on deck, Aunt Nellie and Aunt Nora, and, and Ned was reading, and us boys wanted him to play shovelboard, and he wouldn't. So, just for fun, I tried to show the boys. While well, he was reading, you know. How near I could come to hitting his cap and not hit it. I made a mistake and hit it, and just then the wind blowed it, and it went overboard. And, and the boys laughed, and he jumped in and said, Who knocked my hat off? And I said it was me, and... He said he wasn't going to take any more bullying from me, and up and hit me in the face, and then I hit him back. I told him I was only fooling, and he didn't mind, and kept on getting madder and hitting until I got mad too, and that's how it happened. But I didn't mean to knock his hat off, and I'll fight him all he wants on shore. I didn't know he was fooling, said Edmund, and Aunt Nellie. It isn't just this time. I don't mind once, but it's all the time, and I truly can't bear it. The boy's pale face flushed as he spoke his voice trembling over the last words, and he turned his head away, winking his eyes hard. Oscar's own eyes grew round with amazement. It was all he could do to keep from whistling. He listened to his aunt's reproaches in silence, abstractedly sliding up and down a freshly tarred rope, and at their close, when sentence was pronounced, keeping his high spirits below deck the rest of the day, he merely nodded his head and walked off, saying, All right, Aunt Nellie, that's fair enough, I'm sure. I'll stay all right. Well, said Mrs. Norris in a puzzled way. Did everyone see such a boy? I don't believe he cares a particle. Mercy! The last ejaculation was caused by her seeing Oscar's back. Let him go, said Nora, who was shrewder than her sister. Don't say anything about that today. I'm not sure about his not caring. Oscar went directly to the cabin. His young head was fully occupied trying to make out his cousin's behavior. The boys had never seen each other until they met in New York about a week previous to sailing. It was Oscar's first visit east. The New York boys were amused by his western way of speaking and showed their amusement openly. They made fun of his dress, too, which, to be sure, was rather queer, for his mother had been dead many years and the bishop, good man, was only anxious to encourage the tradespeople in his own town and took whatever they were pleased to offer. Mrs. Morris soon reformed his wardrobe, and Oscar went to work, himself, reforming his tormentor's manners with his fists. He was in the full career of his missionary work, and well covered with bruises when it came time to sail. Edmund was the only New York boy now left him. It happened that Edmund had taken little notice of Oscar, thinking him a rude, quarrelsome, noisy fellow, while Oscar had a slight opinion of Edmund, a boy who did not fight or play games and always afraid of soiling his clothes. He said to himself that he would give Ned a pretty lively voyage. At first, Edmund was simply scornful. Then he became irritated, at last, angry in good earnest. The quarrel was the sequel of a series of petty annoyances. Nevertheless, it bewildered Oscar. 
Ned had not acted in the least as expected. He could fight, and though he had fought in an ignorant, unskilled fashion that aroused Oscar's pity, he could fight vigorously and take hard knocks without whimpering. Most marvelous of all, Ned, whom he had pictured wrapped in self-admiration because he lived in New York and his father was so rich, Ned had been hurt by the teasing. While he thought, the boy sat with his feet curled up under him on the long cabin seat that looks out onto the sea, and his cheek was pressed against his little grimy hand. He could see the steel-blue waves moving towards the ship in wide scallops and the white seagulls flying between the ocean and the sky. Yet he hardly noticed them. So deeply was he thinking that he started when a hand was laid on his shoulder. Then he saw and pulled Aunt Nora down beside him. "'What were you thinking of?' said she. "'Of Ned,' he answered. "'He ain't so mean as I thought he was. At any rate, he ain't a coward.' "'I could have told you better than that.' said Nora. Why, Oscar, once I saw him hold a mad dog so that some little girls could run away. He held it until a man came running and knocked the poor beast over the head. It was Ned's favorite dog, too. And when it had drawn its last breath, he sat down and cried over it. Hm, <laughs> said Oscar. He was pretty brave. What did you do? I was in the house. I ran down to him, but when I got there, the dog was dying. I heard Ned say, Oh, please, kill him quick. Poor Louis. Guess he felt bad said Oscar. He is fond of animals, even those most people dislike. Didn't you hear of his collection of snakes? He has tamed them so that he can do anything with them. Once, most unluckily, they got out of the box and came down the stairs into the drawing room, which was filled with ladies. And they, every one, jumped on the chairs and hollered, said Oscar. They did precisely that, Oscar, every one except your Aunt Lizzie. She stood still and told us how harmless the snakes were until, knowing her, I suppose, they all glided up to her when she climbed a chair, too, very quickly. Luckily, Ned happened to be in the house and heard the commotion and ran in. He whipped the snakes up and wound them on his arm as coolly as though they had been pieces of rope. Oscar was evidently impressed, but his prejudice made a last rally. He muttered something about Ned's being a nice boy if he were not so airy, always fussing about his clothes and talking in a mincing way, just like a New York boy. "'Do you remember?' said Nora. How the boys plagued you in New York merely because you didn't talk and dress quite as they do? Didn't you think it mean of them? Mean as dirt, Oscar said promptly, and I made him sick of it, too. I guess they won't try it to another Western feller. But, my dear boy, don't you see you're doing the same thing? You tease Ned and make him unhappy because he doesn't dress and talk like the boys you know at home. Oscar shrugged his shoulders, and then he laughed. Maybe you're right, Aunt Nora. Anyhow, I didn't mean to be mean, and I'm willing to make up if Ned is. Nora squeezed a little grimy hand so affectionately that he shrank back lest she should kiss him. Before everybody, the erratic and inconsiderate conduct of women kissing boys was one of his trials. However, she was more judicious. She went on. I know I could trust you to be just, Oscar. Only you must remember that Ned isn't impulsive like you. It takes him a long time to get over things. You have made him unhappy, and he may not be ready to forgive you at a minute's notice. But if you persevere, I'm sure he will understand you, and you will be the best friends possible. She resolved to try to soften Edmund's resentment before Oscar should speak to him. But the unfortunate Oscar did not let a moment slip. No sooner was his aunt's back turned to speak to an acquaintance when he darted away to find Ned. Ned was easily found. He was lying in his berth, so bundled in a rug that only a patch of his hair was visible. The poor boy had been crying, but of course Oscar could not know that. He began in a loud, cheerful voice that grated on Edmund's nerves. I say, Ned, suppose we make up? We'd have lots more fun being friends, and I'd learn you how to box and everything. No answer. Say, Ned, are you asleep? No, I'm not, came in a fierce, smothered voice from the heap on the berth, and I'd wish you'd leave me alone. Then you don't want to make up and be friends? said Oscar, in a changed voice. No, I don't. All right for you, then, said Oscar, and with which withering sarcasm and a vast deal of dignity he marched out of the room. Catch me trying that again, thought he. Nevertheless, his pride was soon conquered by his new admiration of Edmund and his longing for society. In a day or two he brought his best cap to his cousin, saying with assumed carelessness, You can have it, if you want it, for the one I knocked overboard. Thanks, answered Edmund stiffly. I don't want it. I have plenty of caps. He met all Oscar's rough yet timid advances in the same spirit. He was always civil, but an iceberg would have been as companionable. To Nora, who remonstrated with him, he said, I can't help it. I don't like him, and I never shall. 
He's bullied me all this voyage, and now he thinks he has only to ask me, and I'll make up. I wish he'd let me alone. How unforgiving you are, Ned, said Nora. Don't you ever do wrong things yourself? I never do mean things, and it's no use talking. I shall always despise him. She said no more, thinking, I will leave it to time. They will be so much together that they will have to like each other to be comfortable. If only Oscar didn't lose his temper and take to tormenting him again. Happily, Oscar kept his temper. He had a great notion of fairness, and once convinced that he had done wrong, he took his punishment unflinchingly, angry for the moment sometimes, but bearing no malice. By this time the voyage had ended, and they were in Warwickshire, visiting an English friend of Mrs. Morris. It was while there that they went one afternoon to drink tea with Lady Margaret Vincent. Lady Margaret was a Scotchwoman. She had married an Englishman, long since dead, and for many years had lived in England. But she travelled far and often, having even been to America which is considered a prodigious journey in England. Edmund was charmed with Lady Margaret's home. He could not look enough at the quaint old garden with its former flower beds and primly cut yew trees or the wonderful old house, the front of which had not been changed since Henry and Elizabeth. As they went through the hall, he gazed in an awestruck way at the great carved staircase and the walls where armor was hanging and strangely fashioned weapons. He felt as though he were stepping into the Middle Ages. Meanwhile, Oscar, oblivious of the Middle Ages and every other improving subject, was getting acquainted with the page. Oscar had seen pages for the first time in New York. He pitied them. They, they couldn't like it, rigged out in those ridiculous clothes and never able to laugh or play. Always willing to talk, he did his best to amuse them. Now he was busy questioning James. Did his high collar hurt him? Did he have to rub up his buttons to keep them bright? Did... Here his aunt saw him and he jerked away. From the hall they passed into a room as odd as delightful. All the woodwork was of oak, age darkened to a brown black and most curiously carved. The mantelpieces had high pillars decorated with ribbons and scrolls and shields and griffins' heads cut out of the wood, and deep shelves on which there were arranged queerly shaped and colored china vases, teapots, and teacups. Oscar thought them ugly, wondering at the lady's admiration. Before the windows and doors hung tapestry curtains in which pictures of hunting seasons were woven. The stuff was darned in so many places that Oscar quite pitied Lady Margaret, who must have such old curtains. But Mrs. Morris gave a little scream of delight and cried, Oh, and how priceless! And something that sounded like goblets. But though Oscar looked hard at the curtains to find the goblins, he saw none. Then his eyes strayed over the polished floor and the dull-hued rugs over ebony and ivory cabinets and stiff back chairs to be fixed finally by a huge Wardian case. There were rocks in the case, coated with moss, ferns, and strange seaweeds grew on the edge of the water. Crabs clung below, lizards crept above, innumerable slimy things swam about midway. The case stood on a long table. Near it, on another box, half a dozen snakes lay coiled in one indistinguishable mass. Under the table, three monkey-like creatures were dancing and chattering. A wee Scottish terrier ran about sniffing at the guests' clothing. Before the fire of coals, for the day was chilly in June, was stretched a great white staghound. The room and all the animals made Oscar think of Alice's adventures in Wonderland. Lady Margaret was standing close to the staghound. Her tall, large figure was clad in black satin. Her fair old face was framed by an abundant white hair which had a gloss like silver, and her dark eyes were bright as her diamonds. She greeted them cordially at once, taking a fancy to Edmund, because of his evident delight in animals. Perhaps she might have thought better of Oscar, had she not caught him in the act of winking at the page. Very soon she began to speak of the creatures about her. Marmosets, my dears, clutching one of the little chatterers under the table, they make a deal of noise, but like most noisy people's talk, it doesn't mean much. This is my aquarium. The seahorses are most odd, don't you think? And here, coolly pushing back her sleeve and plunging a plump white arm into the water. This, you know, just a frog. See how tame, and people call them ugly. That's all they know about it. Look at his beautiful skin and his honest eye. Isn't he handsome now? Here are some lizards, but they are not so interesting. Quite pleasant, you know, but not fascinating like frogs and snakes. Yes, my lad, I dare say you will be wanting to see the snakes. Here they are. They are as tame as they are beautiful. She isn't going to take them out in her hands, is she? Mrs. Morris whispered to her English friend. She always does, was the placid answer. See? Lady Margaret had made a bracelet of a snake and was holding out her arm. One by one, she added the others while Mrs. Morris, having interposed her friend between her and the spectacle, controlled her nerves as best she could. 
They are quite harmless. Quite, I assure you, said Lady Margaret, making a reassuring gesture with her arm, and on which happened two snakes were coiled. Now look, my lads, I'll put this one back. He is a well-meaning snake, but rather stupid. This one I'll lay on the table. Mrs. Morris rapidly retreated towards the fire, stepping on the hound's tail by the way, and naturally bringing out a deep growl, which sent her back again. Unconscious of her guest's alarm, Lady Margaret continued, His name is Marcus Aurelius. I call him that after the great Roman emperor, because he is so sweet-tempered and intelligent. See what a humorous expression he has? And, in fact, the snake's tiny eyes and wide mouth had something the look of an ironical grin about them. Look! See him follow me about the table? He knows his friend. Don't you, my pet? Now, Marcus, I'll put up my arm for a pole. Make a monkey of yourself. Climb down again, now. Tapping the table. Be a dead snake. Very good. Now show them what you think of strangers. She motioned to Oscar. But he edged back behind Nora, muttering, No, they are nasty. Then Nora stepped forward. Instantly, the snake coiled itself up, hissing. Now you said Lady Margaret to Edmund. Oh, he won't be afraid of me, laughed Edmund, stretching forth his hand. Come, pet. And to Lady Margaret's surprise, the snake came, twining about the boy's wrist as it was used to twine about hers. Ah, now you have my gift, my dear, she cried, delighted. She put the snake back in the box and excused herself for a moment. The page brought in the tea tray. In a moment, Lady Margaret returned and made the tea. Mrs. Morris, who had been looking on all this while in a kind of trance of horror recovered enough at these refreshing signs to sink into a chair by a low table. She clutched her sister's arm. Nora sat next to her and murmured, Was there ever such an awful menagerie of a house? Be quiet, whispered Nora. I can't be quiet. Those dreadful little monkey things are under the table nibbling at my ankles. I shall have to scream. You can't scream. Don't disgrace your country. Lady Margaret will hear us, I much fear. She's making tea at the other table. Besides, Mrs. Darrell and Eddie are talking to her, Nora. Are you sure that big dog is safe? Did you hear him growl? It was an awfully fierce sounding growl, and Nora, I think one of the snakes is loose. There were six in the box, and I count only five. Yes, Lady Margaret, the tea is quite right. It is delicious. But though, in truth, it was delicious, and though equally to be praised were the thin bread and butter, the Scotch shortbread from Edinburgh, and the English plum cake, Mrs. Norris never enjoyed a repast less. She spent her time making little sorties with her feet at the marmosets, which took it for play and returned to the attack with new zest. And she whispered to Nora that she was morally sure that the sixth snake was crawling up her chair. Nora herself was not at ease. Nevertheless, her patriotic politeness conquered, and she ate everything, looked at everything, praised everything. Lady Margaret found her most agreeable. Mrs. Darrell had seen the snakes too often to be disturbed, and Edmund was in his element. As for Oscar, he fell into a sad disgrace. He kicked the marmosets. Lady Margaret was too kind to say anything, but Mrs. Morris did the subject justice all the way home. At least you might have kicked them quietly under the table, said she, but no, you'd do it sideways in full view of everyone. The next day the party journeyed on towards London. The sun shone brightly in the weather which had been so abnormally cold as to require overcoats, or as the English term them, top coats, grew warmer, so that there was nothing to mar enjoyment unless it were the lack of harmony between the two boys. This still continued. If there were times when Edmund felt his dislike yielding ever so slightly to Oscar's good humor and gay spirits, his pride and his contempt for his cousin stiffened it at once. It was two days after their arrival in a quiet town near London, where they were to stay a few days for a rest at a picturesque old inn, that Mrs. Morris received a letter from Mrs. Darrell. She read it at the breakfast table. Before she was half down the first page, she turned to Nora. There! Didn't I tell you one of those snakes was gone? Listen to this. Poor Lady Margaret is in such distress over losing her pet snake, the one she called Marcus Aurelius. She thinks she didn't replace the cover of the box securely the day you were there, for she hasn't seen it since. She fears it crawled away and wandered into the village and was killed. Isn't she a dear old goose? Was it the little trick snake, said Oscar? What a shame. Edmund said nothing. He was sorry for Lady Margaret, and he was sorry for himself. The little Marcus Aurelius had made a deep impression on him. Ever since, he had been meditating the bold venture of writing to Lady Margaret, asking her if she would sell or exchange that snake. He kept thinking of the matter all morning, wondering what had become of Marcus. In the afternoon, he was to drive with his Aunt Nora. While he was dressing, Celeste, the maid, brought him his overcoat. Madame desired him to wear it, as he had a cold. Very well, said Edmund, obliging as usual. 
approaching to put the coat on. A little later he stopped short. Surely the wind didn't cause that singular flutter in the cloth. Then the flap moved. Come out, cried Edmund. As though in response to his invitation, a small head erected itself from the pocket. A small green head with glittering eyes. A head which had an indescribably droll and waggish air. The head, in short, of the lost Marcus Aurelius. The intelligent reptile immediately crawled out. He wound himself about the hand Edmund held to him, curled under the boy's sleeve, nestled under his sleeve with the manifest pleasure at renewing the acquaintance. It was plain enough to Edmund how it had happened. The intelligent Marcus, crawling into the hall, had spied the pocket of Edmund's coat and coolly entered. Once there he had gone to sleep, and the unsuspecting Celeste had rolled the coat up in a strap, not to undo it until now. "'So here you are, you beauty,' said Edmund. "'And I'll take good care of you while you are mine. I only wish you could be mine forever.' There was a candy box on the table with a glass cover. Of this he hastily made a prison, then sallied out to find his captive some mice. They were not the easiest thing in the world to get, requiring considerable seeking and talking. He did not venture to tell why he wanted mice, and he overheard the housekeeper grumble. Most extraordinary boys, those Americans. Do you expect he wants to cat them? By this time Nora was ready. He had hardly replaced the snake in the box before he heard her knock at the door. It was a charming day and drive, yet I fear he saw little of the scenery. At last, that it must be confessed, a wicked thought had crept into his brain. He coveted Lady Margaret's snake. He coveted it so ardently that he began to imagine how easy it would be for him to keep it. There was a man in London who sold snakes. Edmund had been up buying some snakes from him, which the man was to keep until he would want them. What more easy than to send Marcus Aurelius to this sorry in boarding house? Ah, what an ugly temptation for Edmund, who had been called a good boy from his cradle. He would have no more of it. But it came back again, and finally... When he reached the inn, he had almost decided to keep the snake. Anyhow, I'll take it to Tomlin's. Tomlin was the snake man. He said to himself, there's no hurry. Yet, in his secret soul, he knew that once taken to Tomlin's, Marcus Aurelius would never return to Lady Margaret. Thus thinking, he went towards the box. The snake was gone. Yes, gone, vanished, absolutely leaving no trace either in the box or in the room. Vainly and long, Edmund searched. Either the cover had not fitted exactly, or Marcus, the intelligent Marcus, had managed to remove it. In either case, he had evidently set off anew on his travels. Edmund began to feel he had been a wicked boy. He stood in the center of the room, trying to collect his wits. Oscar's room adjoined his. He could hear Oscar moving about, whistling out a tune. Should he go in and search there? Standing irresolute, he heard a loud cry from his cousin. Sloped! Gone! Then he followed a muffled sound, which Edmund rightly interpreted to be Oscar poking under the bed with an umbrella, and then came a thundering rap on the door. "'Say, Ned,' called Oscar, entering immediately. "'I'm in an awful scrape. Your snake's gone.' "'My snake,' repeated Edmund, feebly. "'Yes, the one you bought today. I saw it in the glass box on your table.' Edmund remembered that he had left the box in full view when he went for mice. His face grew red. "'Did you let it out?' said he. Of course I didn't, Oscar answered. Did you think I'd do such a thing? I opened the door to speak to you, and I saw it on the table, and I remembered you'd been talking of buying some snakes, so I knew it was yours. I didn't go into the room at all, but this afternoon when I came into my own room, Ned, this little green head was sticking out of my overcoat pocket. Ugh! I pretty near put my hand on it. I'd have called you, but you'd gone, and it wasn't any use calling Aunt Nellie. She'd just jump on the bed and scream, so I didn't know what to do, for I can't handle those things like you, Ned. So I pushed its head down with my toothbrush and pinned up the pocket with my scarf pin. Then I waited a while for you, and I thought it had gone into a torpid condition like you read of, and, and Jack Dale came in for me to go see Punch and Judy, and when I got back, the little deceitful beggar had cleared out. I'm sorry, Ned. Edmund, from red, had turned pale. He did not lift his eyes from the floor. He was feeling more ashamed of himself than he had ever thought to feel in his life. Poor blundering Oscar, whom he had despised, had conquered his horror of snakes to do a service to a boy who had never given him a pleasant word. Well, he, he had tried to steal Lady Margaret's pet. Now Oscar was avowing his carelessness without a thought of concealment, while he could not summon the courage to tell the truth. It may be in the room somewhere, he managed to say finally, and never mind, Oscar, you did your best to keep him. I'm awfully sorry. I am, for a fact, said Oscar. But of course it's my fault. You're good not to row with me, Ned. Don't, said Edmund quickly. 
Why? began Oscar, but his words were drowned by a tumult that suddenly arose outside. Shrieks, voices, a great trampling of feet. They found Marcus. They're killing him, cried Oscar. Both boys flew out of the room. Don't kill him, called Edmund. He is our snake, shouted Oscar. People opened doors in all directions as the boys raced past. One timid woman put her hand out of her window, screaming, Police! until quite a small army of blue-coated fellows had assembled. Another of bolder stamp thought the hotel was on fire and rushed to the rescue with her water jug. Don't kill him! Oscar and Edmund kept crying, a cry not calculated to reassure the nervous. Down the hall dashed the boys. At the far end, an agitated group, variously armed with canes, brooms, and umbrellas, was gathered about a fainting chambermaid, supported in the arms of a waiter and fanned by another chambermaid with a brush broom. Just behind her stood the head waiter in his immaculate dress suit, disgust painted on his countenance, and a dustpan held aloft in his hand. Something very like a groan burst from Edmund's lips, for there, on the dustpan, his gleaming length trailing limply over the edges, bruised, battered, crushed, lay poor little dead Marcus Aurelius. Thus, tragically, had all his travels ended. "'It's our snake!' cried Oscar, making a spring and snatching the dustpan from the man's hand. Without another word, he darted off at full speed. He did not hear the head waiter's dignified reproof. Young gentlemen, as keeps snakes for pets, better keep em safe home, in my opinion. Or one of the women's speeches. I expect he have got a baby tiger hid somewhere. Them American children will do anything. But Edmund heard. Too dejected to retort, he crawled back to his room. This was the end of it, then. The poor pet must die because of his wicked wishes. He knew only too well that it was his haste to hide the snake lest his aunt should see it that had displaced the cover. Had he spoken up like an honest boy, he could have taken time to be careful, and poor Marcus would still be rejoicing in the sun. He did not dare to lift his eyes as he entered the room. He was afraid to look again at the pitiful spectacle of his making. Oscar had laid a newspaper on the bed and placed a dustpan on it, and now was looking mournfully down at Marcus. "'Tain't no use,' he muttered. "'Head smashed. It's an awful shame.' Don't see how it got out of the room. I shut the door tight. Wish I'd locked it. Guess Aunt Nellie'll be vexed when she finds I've lost Ned's snake. Well, she's vexed about something most of the time, so it can't be helped. Then, for the first time, seeing Edmund's miserable face, he tried to comfort him. It's lucky you didn't have him long, Ned. So you hadn't got fond of him. I'll buy you another. Edmund lifted his head. Though Oscar did not guess it, in those last few moments he had fought a bitter fight with himself. He interrupted his cousin. The snake isn't mine. I didn't buy it. It's Lady Margaret Vincent's. He went on to tell of his finding the snake. Phew! whistled Oscar. You're bright to guess all that. Probably tis hers, and you didn't tell Aunt Nora or Aunt Nilly? They'll know fast enough now, replied Edmund gloomily. After all this racket, they're running about yet. Well, we had to told them anyhow, said candid Oscar, and I guess I'll catch it. It's truly my fault. You didn't do nothing. But I ought to have stayed and watched, and I declare I'd forgotten it until this very minute. Aunt Nellie told me I mustn't run out in the streets, ever, without Celeste. She tells me so many things I can't keep track of all. And there's Lady Margaret, too. M must we tell her? stammered Edmund. Why, it's her snake, said Oscar, opening his honest eyes. How can we help it? I suppose we can't help it, said Oscar. But we might telegraph, said Oscar. It's a heap easier than writing, and you can get lots of words for a shilling. No, we'll have to write, said Edmund. I'll do it. But Oscar shook his head. No, Ned, that ain't fair. It's, I'm the most to blame, and I ought to do it. Besides, you wouldn't say it was my fault. Then the last barrier of Edmund's pride broke down. Don't, he cried again. I tell you, it's I'm to blame, and not you, and, and Oscar, I've been very mean to you all along. No, you haven't, said Oscar promptly. It was me bullying you in the first place made all the trouble. Aunt Nora told me maybe you wouldn't want to be friends for a while, and she told me all about the mad dog, and I thought you were a pretty nice boy, and I wished you would like me, but you wouldn't, so I pretended I didn't care. But I did. It's lonesome traveling about with a feller that's mad with you all the time. Edmund swallowed a little lump in his throat. If you'll make up with me now, I'll never be mad with you again, he said, holding out his hand. Oscar clasped it across the bed over the mangled remains of the too adventurous Marcus Aurelius, whose adventures thus were not quite in vain. Edmund kept his word. Indeed, he was surprised to find how easy it was to like Oscar, and Nora's prediction was fulfilled. The two boys were very happy in Europe, but Edmund never forgot Marcus. He told the truth to Nora, and she persuaded Mrs. Norris to deal gently with Oscar. 
He went to the races, after all. Previously, Edmund had written the whole story to Lady Margaret in a letter that, which she read with smiles and tears. The postcard was by Oscar. It ran as follows. Dear Lady Margaret, Ned won't let me see his letter, but I'm sure he took all the blame on himself, because he always does. But it was me to blame, and not him, because I pinned the snake in my coat pocket, because I was afraid to handle it, and ran off to the Punch and Judy show, and it got out, and the head waiter killed it. I didn't give him any tip when he went away. I'm very sorry, and I'm sorry I kicked the marmosets, but they bit my legs. No more at present. From your obedient servant to command, Oscar T.W. It only remains to say that Marcus Aurelius is back home, at Lady Margaret's, but she never makes a bracelet of him. Now, most ingeniously mended and stuffed, he abides perpetually in a glass case, and she describes his perfections and his lamentable end with tears in her eyes. End of chapter 33「Chapter 34 of the Junior Classics, Volume 8, Animal and Nature Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James McAndrew. The Junior Classics, Volume 8, Animal and Nature Stories. Edited by William Patton, Chapter 34 Anna and the Rattler by Mrs. Cornell A voice rose wrathfully in the backyard. Willie, what is this? You fell in the pig trough. Come here that I beat you. Come here, I say. Willie did not accept the invitation. A shrill whimpering was his sole response. Twelve-year-old Anna stepped to the kitchen door, peering round the sash. Pa scolding Willie, she announced to her mother. The storm continued to rage in the backyard. Shushed, look at your clothes. Go now, to the creek with you. Come not in the house until you are cleaned. Ah! Ex Sea Captain Schultz, now prune grower in the mountain boundary west of Santa Clara Valley, turned in at the kitchen door. I don't know what to do with the boy. Go, mine Anna. Get the lad a clean shirt and take it down to the creek. On Anna's return from the bathing pool, she said softly to her mother. Willie isn't at the creek. Perhaps he's run off. Oh, child, don't bother me about Willie. He'll run back again fast enough. He's that scared of the mountains and the trees. Anna was conscious of an undercurrent of sympathy with the forlorn waif her father had brought from the city some months before. The very love and awe with which the mountains filled her imaginative soul gave her a comprehension of the fear with which they imbued the dull-witted offspring of the San Francisco gutters. Willie did not return all that long August day. The captain and his American wife spread and dipped prunes busily on the hot south slope. The box-laden wagon rolled by at intervals. Household duties went helter-skelter under Anna's management. At six o'clock, Mrs. Schultz, hot and tired, wakened her lazy little daughter, outstretched beneath the hollyhocks and poppies in the small front garden. For gracious sake, Anna, hurry! You've not done the dinner dishes. Have the cows come? Anna asked resourcefully. Land, if I hadn't forgotten about Willie. Come, hurry, you'll have to go for the cows. I'll wash the dishes. Anna felt quite in the mood to go for the cows. It meant 
an hour or so of patting barefooted and bareheaded along the soft dust of the road or over the slippery brown grass of the mountain pastures with tall pines on every hand and a gold-blue sky above. She mused about the missing Willie. Had he carried out his occasional threat to run away? The road is open. Go when you like, was her father's one reply to such futile outbursts. But they well knew the road was not open to Willie. The six mountain miles intervening between their ranch and the station formed an impassable barrier to his timorous soul. I guess he's afraid of the bigness of things, Anna concluded, and he's got no call to run away. Papa threatens him, but he's never laid hand on him yet. I suppose it's on account of the bath he ran away. There was no Willie at the bathing pool. The checked gingham shirt fluttered lonesomely where she had that morning placed it. Some minutes later, shuffling deliciously among the dappled leaves of a hill trail, she sprang aside in quick dismay. Goodness! What had seemed to be a bunch of dry leaves and grass coiled swiftly with the rattling whir that goes straight to the fear center of the human heart. In a flash, Anna's hands were full of rocks. The first article in every California mountain child's education is to destroy every rattlesnake that comes in sight. Anna dodged the first strike of the snake, and before he could get nearer, she began a fusillade of such efficiency that the reptile enemy sought retreat. Then Anna was privileged to witness a strange thing, a very strange thing, so unusual in fact that when reported to the head of the zoological department of the state university, that conservative gentleman would have given the story little credence had it not been for the unimpeachable authority of a celebrated naturalist who had reported it as occasionally occurring among the large, much to be dreaded species of the eastern states, the Crotalus horrible or banded rattler. To Anna's unutterable surprise, the snake turned for refuge to a nearby oak tree. Perhaps he came against it unintentionally, as the rattlesnake sees badly by daylight. At any rate, he reared his head against it, much as he would have done in ascending the side of a sunny boulder in the early days of his chilled awakening from his winter sleep. He writhed spirally but slowly up its rough trunk, which seemed from eighteen to twenty inches in circumference. When the rocks ceased flying, he would halt, evidently not half liking his task, to wave his bluntly triangular head in the direction where the moving shadow indicated to his blurred vision the position of his enemy. But on the resumption of hostile activities, he would begin again his painful ascent. Ouch! sounded a howl from above. Looking up at the cry, Anna discerned among the clustering leaves of the black oak a huddled figure with raccoon-like eyes peering down at the mountain snake, to escape from which he had, in fact, climbed the tree. Willie! she shouted. Jump! The snake's coming! Jump! Ouch! he continued to wail. The snake stopped confused, craning its head upwards at the new complication, then downward at its known adversary. Its hesitation would make Willie's escape practicable if he could conquer his crazy fear. Willie, break off a limb! Beat it back! I can't run! The snake undulated a few inches farther. The reiterated cry was Willie's only response. Anna's quick eye saw another chance. 
There's that big limb on the redwood. You can reach it. Swing across. It's easy. You must. Stamping. Oh, Willie, do it. Do it. Her sailor father had often reproved Anna for her delight in climbing and swinging from tree to tree by means of her long arms and practiced hands. It is not good for you to be a monkey, mine Anna, he would say. Little girls need never to go to the masthead. Thou hast no call to be a sailor. Be only a brave kinchin and help our good mother with the dishes. His admonition would dissolve in an unrestrained roar of laughter as she wickedly shinned up the porch post to a coin of vantage on the vine-covered roof. But she could not climb the tree where the snake still clung. There was the neighboring redwood, huge girthed, smooth bold, with limbs out of reach. Yet with the lowest bough almost touching the limb on which Willie crouched, mechanically clutching the body of the tree, but dumb and stupefied with the horror of his situation. Anna hurriedly piled large rocks under a thick, broken branch stump of the redwood, which was at least eight feet from the ground. Four times she leaped upward and fell back, wounding her tough little feet. She noticed blood stains on the rocks as she heaped them with a broader base for her fifth attempt. The snake rested, waving his head downward as if in query. Fortunately, he was full and sluggish. Once more, Anna crouched and shot upward. Her right hand caught the projecting stump. Her left easily followed clasping the decreasing trunk of the tree with her slim, muscular legs, hanging also by her hands. She dropped her head backward to take observation. The snake hung out also to ord her from his tree, then resumed his deliberate climbing. Evidently, the task was neither easy nor to his liking. Anna hitched breathlessly up toward the coveted limb. Reaching it, she took out her jackknife, inseparable companion, scientifically cut a wedge from a short limb above her, and broke off the weakened branch. Recovering her balance, she reached out with this flexible club, but could not touch the snake, now roused to accelerated activity. Holding her weapon between her teeth, Anna worked her way nearly to the end of her tough support. Throwing out her right hand, she was able to catch the big limb at the base of which Willie, almost insensible, still huddled. Then she swung, pendulum-like by the hands, increasing her momentum. At the right moment, she released the redwood bough and flung her light body full upon the young oak. Grasping the limb with both hands, she hauled herself up beside the terrified boy. The snake, shaken by the tumult above, wavered and stopped. As a rule, a rattlesnake, conscious of his defense, makes a good fight, but here the conditions were unusual and confusing. On level ground, where he could have coiled, and where his sensitive undersurface could have slid comfortably over smooth earth, he would not have shirked combat when cornered. Now, with his enemy mysteriously above, his one idea seemed to be escape. Willie jabbered an idiotic welcome. He can't strike until he gets clear here, Anna reassured him. He can't coil. Her rapid blows still further dismayed her antagonist. He bit viciously at the stick, touching it more than once, for the rattler's strike is deadly swift, despite his languid locomotion. At last, Anna, settling herself firmly on the limb, raised her club with both hands and delivered a slashing blow on the neck of her foe, 
breaking as they afterward found his vertebral column. The darting head hung limp. A progressive loosening ran through the mottled coils. There was a slight rasping sound, a thud, and then a whitish heap on the ground, which Anna cleared when, swinging down by her hands to a safe distance, she leapt lightly to the ground. Willie followed, dazed and fearful. He helped round up the cows, casting furtive glances ahead and on each side at every footstep. Before entering the house, he slunk, although still agonized with fear through the golden twilight to the abhorred bathing pool and the languidly fluttering crossbars of the repudiated gingham shirt. But Anna, too ill for supper, crept into her father's arms, where he sat on the vine-darkened veranda and fell asleep on his shoulder. Ach, mein Anna, the captain said tenderly, it is sometimes good for little girls to make themselves to be sailors. End of chapter 34 Recording by James McAndrew, San Francisco